Maybe she'd be here. Uh, if she's here, she's upstairs. Mm. She won't. She won't say that. We can go upstairs later. You can say that. Did I? I'd like to say hey. She's had a lot of changes. Yeah, her husband died <laughs> this year. Yeah. Yeah. So her father and her husband died. She's she's slowly getting over. So her, yeah. her husband did sit, what was yeah. the issue? Yeah. No, he had a bunch of issues that just finally caught up. Oh, really? You know, this age, it's only a map, so my, my best friend, you know, 57 years ago, I just died. Healthiest guy in the restaurant, too, and that's why I'm saying about it. Hey, Matt, did you, you let him in? Not intentionally. Okay. No, you know what? I showed them his badge. They said he'll leave it out and sign. I didn't realize it was a contract. Yeah, it's yeah. 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 great. Just go right in. They're, uh, they're better than the ones in our old building. The ones in our old building didn't even look at it. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then they yelled at me because they had my stuff in the same. Uh, but then they were right ahead of me and they put my stuff on the. Thing, which is, uh, oh, yeah. he, he went crazy. No, no, one person is on screen. I said, I know Brian Hancock. He's not stop that shit. Did he scream more after that? Yeah. yeah. Very, very discouraging. Yeah. You, you got to say you know the chair. That's what you have to say. No, he's running my campaign. You know, I think it's Tom. How's, really that, working? How's that working so Not far? well. Not well. <laughs> this is the time, man.
Yeah, Ryan and I both have the slides for that. <laughs> Yes, there is. Yes, there is. I'm hoping it's public, but if it's not, we can get you the code. Do you know what it is? I just. Do you know which network it is? That'd be great. zero alpha oh you're right next to the awesome. misdirector Neil
All right. All right. Good morning. Uh, I will uh, open this meeting of the uh, EAC's Technical Guidelines Development Committee. Uh, I want to welcome uh, all of you uh, both here in the room. I, I feel comfortable saying this is already the most popular TGDC meeting we've ever had, uh, given a full room. Uh, also, those joining us by uh, video uh, online. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, I remind everyone to please silence your cell phones, uh, quiet everything so that uh, we can move forward un uninterrupted. Uh, as is tradition, we will uh, start this morning with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you all uh, stand with me and uh, pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Quickly, uh, because I'm, I think, required to go over logistics very, very quickly. Uh, for those in the room with us here today, if you exit out uh, the back doors and head to the left, uh, there are bathrooms available uh, to you should you need them. Uh, as well as uh, emergency exits along the back uh, there. Uh, additionally, uh, just after 9.30 today, uh, we'll observe a moment of silence uh, because today is September 11th uh, in memory of those who lost their lives on September 11th. So I'll, I'll stop the meeting and we can observe uh, that moment of silence. Uh, at this point, uh, it's my pleasure, uh, my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Kent Rockford, uh, the Acting Undersecretary of Commerce for Standards and Technology and the Acting Director of NIST, quite a title, uh, who many of you uh, met at the previous TGDC meeting. Uh, Dr. Rockford, one, I want to thank you for coming to Silver Spring, participating in the meeting, and being with us here this morning. Thank you, Matt. And, and I'm very glad to be with, with you here today. Uh, in accordance with the Help America Vote Act and as Acting Director of NIST, I'm honored to continue to serve as Chairman of this committee. Now, over the course of the last year, we've seen a lot of press surrounding elections from early concerns over compromised voter registration systems uh, to the designation of election systems as critical infrastructure and follow-up activities. You know, the cybersecurity of election systems is of paramount importance to the integrity of the election process. And, and I hope this will be at the forefront of our thoughts while we consider revisions to the voluntary voting system guidelines. Indeed, the, the task of this committee is to serve as the technical advisor to the Election Assistance Committee and by extension to the states that administer elections, and that's never been more complex or more essential to our democracy. And the specific charge to this committee to assist the EAC in developing voting standards and guidelines for voting equipment and technologies, it's a critical requirement for making accessible, accurate, and secure elections possible. So I want to thank all of you for serving on this committee and uh, for bringing your unique expertise to this effort. Each of you is an ess essential subject matter expert as we engage in the deliberations over the proposed new version of the Voting Systems Guidelines, the VVSG 2.0. And as you know, this version of the VVSG uses a new structure, going to have a high-level, unified set of principles and guidelines for voting systems. The draft has been developed by NIST through an open and transparent process that included bi-weekly meetings with experts from the NIST EAC public working groups. Now, as part of this development process, the principles and guidelines have been distributed to the EAC Standards Board, the EAC Board of Advisors, and the National Association of State Election Directors for comment and feedback. My goal for the group at this meeting is to carefully discuss the current draft and reach agreement, if possible, that it can be forwarded on to the EAC. The EAC and will turn will further comment, will seek further comment from their advisory boards and the public at large. So after uh, introductory remarks this morning, we'll have presentations from Cliff Tatum from EAC, who will provide a review of the TGDC charter, uh, NIST Mary Brady, who will provide an overview of the VVSG structure, development activities, and progress towards requirements and testing. The EAC with the expectations for the review and adoption process for moving to VVSG 2.0. And from David Wagner and Diane Golden, who will give us an update on an EAC-sponsored meeting held in June to better address security and accessibility issues and how we can better harmonize those. 
After lunch, we'll then devote the rem remainder of the day to discussing the principles and guidelines, highlighting new areas for consideration. And during the afternoon, we'll hear from a number of NIST staff covering human factors, security interoperability, and implementation related topics. On Tuesday, we'll hopefully continue the VVSG 2.0 discussions as necessary. And hopefully by this time, we'll reach consensus on the next steps. Afterwards, uh, John Wack from NIST and John Jurley from Democracy Fund will provide updates on the common data format. Finally, our last two sessions will focus on cybersecurity. Josh Franklin from NIST will provide background information on how threat mod the threat model for voting, and more broadly, election systems, has changed over time and provide some considerations for moving forward. And then our colleagues from the Department of Homeland Security will present progress with respect to the designation of voting systems as critical infrastructure. Uh, I do need to apologize in advance for schedule conflicts that will present my participation in the full meeting. However, you'll be in good hands in keeping with the TGDC charter, Commissioner Masterson, the designated federal official will take over as chair. And in addition, Mary Brady uh, will be here to provide assistance as needed. So thank you, Commissioner uh, Masterson and Mary. So on behalf of the commissioners in NIST, please know that we do appreciate your continued commitment to serving on this committee. And I look forward to your deliberations that help the nation improve the security, usability, and accessibility of our voting systems. So thank you. Thank you, and I, I appreciate uh, you being here to open and chair the meeting. Uh, and uh, while you're here, I want to thank you uh, and your staff for the incredible work that they've done on VBSG 2.0 and their leadership. Uh, they've done great work, and so I think it's important to recognize that while you're here. Uh, they've been fantastic. Thank you. Uh, well, good morning to all of you. Uh, welcome to the Election Assistance Commission uh, here in sunny Silver Spring. Uh, I want to thank uh, not only uh, Dr. Rockford and the NIST staff, uh, but also the EAC staff that helped make this meeting possible, who put in uh, yeoman's work on the development of VVSG 2.0, helping uh, to run the public working groups. I want to thank you as TGDC members uh, and the incredible work that you've done in the development process. And I want to thank the hundreds of people that have participated in the public working group. I think uh, when the public working groups were established uh, and we, you know, kind of chartered off on this effort, we weren't sure uh, the level of engagement. And uh, we have been thrilled uh, by the amount of participation by folks in all of the working groups, the amount of input people have provided, and the consistency. Uh, it hasn't uh, dwindled, uh, but in fact picked up as we've moved forward. Uh, this effort to develop VVSG 2.0 began uh, with a reconstituted TGDC in July of 2015. Uh, since that time, uh, the effort uh, has been done both in a public working group and the TGDC function. Uh, that TGDC meeting represented the first meeting of the TGDC in four years. Uh, that, the effort, though, on TGDC or VVSG 2.0 really began uh, before that July meeting with the work of the EAC VVSG working group, the work that the NASED VVSG working group put together, uh, and the recommendations of the Presidential Commission on Election Administration, who recognized the need for updated standards that allowed for innovation and ensured accessibility and security of voting systems. Since that time, all of us in this room, hundreds of election officials, experts in cybersecurity, accessibility and usability, and citizens have dug into this work in order to contribute and develop the next set of voting system standards. Having guidelines that ensure accessible, accurate, and auditable elections is critical to the integrity of the election process moving forward. Given all that's gone on since July of 2015 in that initial meeting, and I don't have to remind particularly the election officials in the room of everything that's happened since that meeting, I think it's clear that this work has never been more important. As we discuss today and tomorrow and drive towards consensus on VVSG 2.0 in the next two days, I hope we all can appreciate what we've done as a group, what we're doing here today and over the next two days, and how incredibly important this work is. I want to thank all of you in advance for your time, for your incredible thoughtfulness and dedication to this effort. VVSG 2.0 represents a truly open, transparent, and collaborative effort to improve the overall accessibility, security, and functionality of voting systems. And I hope we can reach consensus and move forward 
to approve this important work. I want to thank you all, and we can begin the meeting uh, with Mary, if you're ready, <laughs> uh, uh, to brief us uh, on a NIST update. Oh, are we doing Cliff first? I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I could read an agenda. We're going to start with the uh, federally manda mandated FACA briefing uh, from the EAC uh, General Council. This is where real news is made uh, on this FACA briefing. So, Cliff, the floor is yours. Thank you. Commissioner Mashton, thank you very much. And Mr. Chair, Mr. Rockford, thank you for the introductions. Uh, I just want a point of clarification. Are we going to establish a quorum before I present my part, or should we? Sure we are, <laughs> Counselor. <laughs> yes, we are. What, uh, the question from the Council was, uh, are we going to establish a quorum? And we are. So we can uh, go through uh, and do uh, a roll call uh, of uh, those participating, if that's all right. Okay, so uh, EAC Board of Advisors Rep Linda Lamone, Here. EAC Standards Board Rep Greg Riddlemoser, Here. EAC Access Board Member Mark Guthrie, Here. Uh, EAC uh, slash NIST tech Technical Appointee McDermott Coots, EAC tech, uh, slash NIST Technical Rep David Wagner, Here. welcome. Uh, EAC Board of Advisors member Neil Kelly. Here. Uh, Here. <laughs> <laughs> the NIST director is present. Uh, technical expert, EAC NIST technical expert Diane Golden. Here. Uh, NASAD representative Judd Choate. Here. NASAD representative Lori Agino. Uh, EAC Standards Board representative Robert Giles. Here. Uh, representative uh, techn EAC NIST technical representative Jeremy Gray. Here. Awesome, the voice of God from above. Uh, we are missing uh, and, and not assigned uh, an ANSI and IEEE rep, so they uh, won't be reflected in the quorum uh, here today. You're on. Commissioner, we have a quorum. All right, thank you. You may proceed with the FACA briefing. Pursuant to the uh, Help America Vote Act, pursuant to the Help America Vote Act, uh, Section uh, USC 52 USC Section 2961, the the Election Assistance Commission has chartered the TGDC as an advisory committee, uh, according to the. Federal Advisory Committee Act itself, we have submitted uh, to the Register and to the Secretariat a charter on April the 13th, 2017. That charter specifically provides that there shall be the Director of NIST as the Chair and 14 other members of uh, uh, select members from uh, the, the boards and the bodies that you just named. Uh, those individuals uh, will be confirmed to serve on the committee, and the committee will uh, conduct its business uh, starting today. The role of the committee is to is strictly advisory. It provides the Election Assistance Commission with support for developing the voluntary voting system guidelines. Each of the members who serve on the committee serves in a, either a representative capacity or as a special government employee. The representative capacity members uh, are not subject to the ethics code or the conflict of interest statutes. However, they are admonished to adhere to uh, sound business practices and to avoid the appearances of impropriety in any of their actions and conduct in conducting themselves and, con and representing the, the Board of uh, the Technical Guidelines Development Committee. The special government employees who have, of course, been notified as to who they are, are subjected to the ethics code and the financial conflicts of interest statutes and, of course, are, are required to adhere to those rules and regulations specifically. Uh, as indicated, meetings that are conducted by uh, the TGDC uh, are in a public forum. Uh, they require a quorum. We have the quorum today. Uh, so unless there's other questions, uh, Mr. Chair, I will uh, close with uh, that update. Thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Tatum. 
I appreciate it. You all, you all have been brief now. Uh, we've fulfilled that obligation. Uh, so now we get down to the business of work, uh, and we're going to start uh, with a general update from Mary Brady and NIST, uh, generally on the work that's been done uh, since the last meeting, uh, the process moving forward, all with a goal towards driving towards consensus on VVSG uh, 2.0 uh, at this meeting. Uh, the goal of this meeting uh, and our hope uh, is that you all can reach consensus on the recommendations to be sent uh, to the AAC Executive Director per HAVA. Uh, and so, uh, Mary, we'll start with a general update and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of uh, what VVSG 2.0 says. So, uh, with that, Mary, we'll turn it over to you uh, for the update. Thank you, Commissioner Masterson. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> it's a little further back. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Mary Brady. I'm the uh, voting program manager from NIST. And I'm going to uh, give you a bit of an update this morning on what's been happening. Maybe. That doesn't seem to work. Here, I'll just use this. We'll give that a shot. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Okay, uh, so a number of these topics, a number of uh, folks in the room have seen some of these slides before, and I apologize in advance for those of you who have, but some of you haven't. So I, I wanted to make sure that uh, that we were all uh, up to date. I'll start with. Uh, an overview of the development process, talk a little bit about scope and structure and, and how we came to it, uh, the, tell you a, a bit about principles and di guidelines, where we are with respect to the requirements and the test assertions, and leave you with some uh, parting thoughts. So as you all know, the uh, development process for the VVSG this time around has been a little bit different that uh, in, in, in uh, past versions of the TGDC, NIST, uh, provided technical support uh, to the TGDC. We uh, would bring that input into this meeting when we got to the point that the TGDC was happy with a, a draft they forwarded on to the EAC, who would then send it to the Standards Board and Board of Advisors uh, and uh, out for public comment. This time around, uh, we created these public working groups, and the idea was that we, uh, we would try to tap into as many experts as possible and keep people advised of the process as we were going, rather than waiting until uh, after the fact to engage the broader community. So the, these uh, public working groups were spawned from a variety of efforts that were going uh, ongoing prior to uh, 2015, and we uh, started with three election groups, the pre-election, election and post-election, and four constituency groups, uh, usability and accessibility, sometimes we use the term human factors, cybersecurity, interoperability, and testing. Now the truth of the matter is the three of those four constituency groups have been very, very active. We've yet to launch the testing group, but I think that's going to change here shortly. The public working groups, as Matt mentioned in his opening uh, remarks, have been very active. Uh, initially, the, the election groups went through and uh, developed the process models, and the constituency groups had, have been uh, very active with the principles and guidelines. Here you can see some numbers, you know, pre-election 103, election 107, post-election 96, and the constituency groups with 105 in uh, UNA, cybersecurity 121, interoperability 158. And even though there's nothing going on in the testing uh, group, we still have 84 members that, that are uh, ready and waiting to, uh, to get to work. We had an entire process uh, working on uh, reaching consensus on the VVSG scope, and that's been played out in previous TGDC meetings. The election groups, uh, developed uh, process models that were aired with the TGDC, uh, with the Standards Board, the Board of Advisors, and with NASED. We developed use case scenarios, and ultimately the EAC put forth 17 core functions that uh, define what a voting system is and, and provide us uh, with scope. That's been agreed, uh, uh, agreed to by the Standards Board, the Board of Advisors, and NASED. We've also, at the same time while we're looking at scope, we, we were looking at structure, and we had this trade-off between high-level principles that we could all participate 
in, in defining and, and agreed to, and the low-level test assertions that are necessary for uh, testing uh, voting systems. So we've come up with uh, a four-pronged approach, if you will, where you, you have the principles and guidelines at the very high level. You have requirements that uh, serve as uh, a basis for the manufacturers to build to, and then the lower-level test assertions that uh, that can be used by the voting system test laboratories to uh, to test uh, voting systems. Just as a reminder, here are the pretty process models. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, the election groups worked very hard on. What we did is we took the VVSG, and this is actually a word cloud from the VVSG, uh, you know, one one, and uh, we overlaid the process models on the VVSG, and we we questioned everything. We we wanted to know if it was there, should it stay? Where were the gaps, uh, and uh, how could we make uh, use of the the best research to date? In, in a variety of areas, and we, and we brought those experts uh, to the table to to discuss all aspects of, of voting systems. We came out with this 50,000 foot view, and a number of the principles and guidelines were actually encapsulated in this 50,000 foot view. It all starts with the the, the voter, the, uh, the the folks who are actually placing their votes. So you need to have uh, uh, all the information available in whatever mode that is um, is useful for the voter and uh, it, it needs to be available you know both from a usability perspective and an accessibility perspective accessibility is uh, is the law and we need to abide by uh, what's in Hobbin and, and the other federal laws there throughout the voting process we have to be sure that we keep the integrity of the ballot secret that, that, that we maintain the integrity of the ballot and we honor the secret ballot we have to provide for auditing at, at the back end. And while we, while we put together these voting systems, uh, they have to interact in, in well-known ways. And the entire process has to be transparent. So with that, we put together the principles and guidelines. Initially, uh, we had uh, 18 principles and 53 guidelines. We started with the early versions had over 200 pages of the VVSG. In early presentations, we got it down to 38 just for usability and accessibility. Another version, we got down to 20, then to 10, and finally to five. So every word has been well vetted uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the public working groups, and the public working groups have been uh, you know, just a, a great asset for us to, uh, to call upon and, and to work with. We, uh, Sent the, we presented the principles and guidelines at a variety of uh, venues at NASA, at standards board meetings, board of advisors. We sought feedback. We discussed within the, the particular uh, working group, whether it was cybersecurity or usability and accessibility or interoperability, and also between the public working groups. We simplified the text. We removed duplicates, and we merged categories. So today we, we have before you, I think in your packets, the current version of the principles and guidelines. There's 15 principles and 52 guidelines. And we froze this version a, a couple of weeks ago prior to the uh, NASA meeting uh, that was out in Anaheim. But uh, the truth of the matter is there are some comments that are continuing to come in that we'll deal with as, as part of the, uh, uh, the public comment uh, process. So work continues. I would, I would note also those are available both at EAC.gov and vote.nist.gov. Uh, for folks uh, to check out as well. And it's only five pages, so it's a quick read. It's a quick read, yes. So that's, uh, that's the majority of what we'll be discussing today is the principles and guidelines. And let me just give you a quick shot at them. These, uh, it's uh, starting with design and implementation, high quality design and implementation, transparency, interoperability, equivalent and consistent voter access, voter privacy, marked, verified, and cast as intended, robust, safe, usable, and accessible, auditable, valid secrecy, access control, physical security, data protection, system integrity, detection and monitoring. As part of these sessions this afternoon, though, there are folks here from, uh, from the NIST staff, uh, from the NIST uh, voting program, who will go over these in, in detail, will highlight changes from uh, VVSG 1.1, and uh, will engage you in, in quite lively discussions, I'm sure. 
One thing to note is, you know, initially we had these principles and guidelines broken down by category. So we had human factors, usability and accessibility, we had security, uh, we had interoperability. In the end, as, as we uh, removed duplicates and did some merging, the, the current thinking or the, the thinking was that they really all need to work together, that it's an integrated set, set of guidelines and they shouldn't be separated by category. Mary, if I may, this is actually a good point to stop so that we can do a moment of silence uh, at 9.37 a.m. Uh, for uh, those who lost their lives uh, or, or were impacted uh, on the terrorist attacks on 9-11. So if we could all just take uh, a moment of silence uh, of remembrance. Okay, thank you all. I appreciate it, and it helps put in perspective uh, all of this in this work. So, Mary, thank you. I appreciate it. So, as we go through the principles and guidelines this afternoon, we actually won't go through them in this order. We've reordered them a, a little bit just to make sure that you're awake and paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> the working groups didn't stop with the principles and guidelines. As they were continually discussing the principles and guidelines and updating them, they were also working on uh, requirements. So I, I'll talk a little bit about the work that's been done on requirements first by the human factors group. They've uh, been working on turning these abbreviated requirements into detailed requirements. And you all remember the, the tabular description of the, uh, the abbreviated requirements and they've, uh, they're turning out white papers at, uh, at an incredible pace on, on various aspects of the uh, research that's been done in the usability and accessibility areas. Now here are the uh, abbreviated requirements. They were based on a gap analysis performed by the working group and they highlight the changes and, and provide further insight. One of the uh, aspects of the abbreviated requirements which will carry through into the detailed requirements is they're all now tagged with uh, update, new, review, combine, move, uh, and, and, and remove the, the abbreviated requirements. But what we'll re retain as we move into uh, the actual requirements is the legal accessibility requirement, that this will be highlighted you know, throughout uh, the requirements and the test assertions. Right now it's identified by a, a wheelchair icon and this indicates that it's either required by HAVA, Section 508, the uh, Web Content uh, Accessibility Guidelines, or the Voting Rights Act. This is all backed by a, a set of uh, uh, a, a whole body of research, which has been encapsulated in a variety of white papers that, uh, that have been put together. The initial topics were in text size, contrast, navigation from the review screen, scrolling on the ballot, and assistive technology in, in the polling place. More recently, the, uh, the group has taken a look at election materials, including bilingual ballots, and at, uh, looking at the combination of uh, universal design, user-centered design, usability, accessibility, and ISO standards. There's a, it's an active area with uh, a number of bodies that are participating. Looking at all of those and bringing to bear what, uh, bring to bear on, on the voting system guidelines what's necessary. Their current status is they've completed the analysis for updating the requirements and uh, they're in, in the process of reordering them according to the order that we'll present later today and to uh, continue uh, the development of the detailed requirements. In uh, the cybersecurity area, we uh, went back to you know some of the aspects of cybersecurity were in the 2007 TGDC recommendations, and we don't want to throw the baby out uh, with the bathwater. So we want to retain you know good work that uh, that has been done in the past. So there's been a review of uh, the uh, 2007 TGDC recommendations, as well as some comments on remote ballot marking. Let me just I don't know if there's an internet connection here, but let me just try. Uh, but uh, to pop out to the uh, website. Nothing like just trying, Mary. Hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I like to live life on the edge. If the lights go out, we're blaming you. <laughs> <laughs> so here are their uh, working documents. 
Are the lights going out? <laughs> no, <it's, laughs> we got split screen. I can go back and forth. It's okay. Okay. It, uh, <laughs> it was okay. I'm not sure what you've done here now. Well, didn't, <laughs> didn't you want the website up? Yeah, but I wanted it to to be on this screen so I could click. It, uh, Now you've done it. Let the record note that yeah. it's Ryan that's uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah, that's right. There's that's only right. two. I'll just look over there. Uh -huh. It's an excellent try. Okay, but it's still not showing over there. It, uh, so um, anyway, the, uh, if you go out to the website, you know, what you're seeing on, on this screen here is uh, a list of working documents. And what they've done is they've gone through uh, over the, uh, the course of the summer, from June in, until the, the present uh, time, and they've issued a gap analysis for each of these areas, audibility, ballot secrecy, system event logs, um, communication security, physical security, cryptography, setup. And I think if we, and then there's a couple other categories uh, beyond that, uh, uh, software installation, access control, and system integrity management. And it was a cross check against the, the current uh, principles and guidelines, but they've also been able to map all of those requirements uh, that, uh, that were pertinent uh, to moving forward and uh, have identified gaps. So they're, they're well on their way uh, to uh, creating requirements that, uh, that will map to the principles and guidelines. In the interoperability area, also known as the common data format, uh, there's, we have uh, near final uh, versions on cast vote records, event logging and updates uh, to the election results, progress on the voter registration interchange, voting models and voting variations. John Wack uh, is with us and will provide a more in-depth review of, uh, of the progress to date tomorrow at, uh, during the uh, common data format session. And again, here, we've set up a GitHub repository and there are some early requirements, uh, or draft requirements for cash vote records and for event logging. In addition, we've uh, had some help from Democracy Fund. They've, uh, we, in, particularly in the initial uh, development focus on the election process models, I, uh, you all remember, you know, some of the uh, very complex diagrams that Kenneth Bennett uh, had uh, provided uh, to us in the past. That work continues. Sean July has been uh, working on it. And also in the deployment area, uh, Katie Owens uh, Hubler is the primary lead there, so we're thankful to have that uh, the help from those folks as well. In some of the other areas uh, that sort of come under the high quality uh, design and high quality implementation, we've done a review of the software, hardware, telecom, quality assurance, configuration management, uh, configuration management, the, uh, the uh, uh, testing and the TDB packages. And we're about ready to, to embark on that effort as well. On the test assertion front, uh, work, uh, although uh, we haven't really kicked off the testing group and NIST has uh, continued to develop test assertions, they've uh, been developed for 1.0 uh, and more recently for 1.1. They articulate the requirements as testable logical statements. And if you all remember, that there was a process that was set out to do this, that we uh, started with NIST uh, drafting the uh, test assertion, sharing them with the labs, the voting system test laboratories and the EAC, coming to consensus there and when uh, consensus was reached, providing them to the manufacturers as a, um, you know, for uh, comment and feedback. So as I've said many times uh, among, uh, you know, before this group and, and others that we're not actually giving them the answers to the test, but we are giving the manufacturers the questions that, that are going to be on the test. These are necessary for identifying the, uh, the uh, breadth and depth for testing voting systems and it provides consistency across the voting system test laboratories. 
So for it, right now, the status in, uh, for VVSG 1.1, there's nearly 1,200 uh, uh, assertions developed to date, covering six sessions, uh, uh, six uh, sections, and addressing the functional requirements and general usability requirements. And here's just sort of uh, between the overall system. Here's a breakdown of the various categories. So in summary, the principles and guidelines, the draft is ready for the review, and we'll, we'll see that review this, uh, this afternoon. We'll, we'll uh, step you through highlighting uh, various changes from previous versions. It's been developed through an open and transparent process, the working group process. We've had a phenomenal uh, access to a, ph a phenomenal set of experts uh, during this uh, entire process. The public working groups are busy, and they've already started on the requirements. In the human factors area, the research is com complete. They have abbreviated core requirements that they're translating into, uh, you know, the, the longer version of the requirements. Cybersecurity, a gap analysis has been done. They've mapped the 2007 recommendations to the principles and guidelines. Interoperability, there's uh, much progress on the common data format. And in testing, uh, particularly uh, <laughs> looking at McDermott here, <laughs> It's, uh, I'd, I'd like to propose that we expand the focus to implementation and testing and, and have the, uh, the group not just looking at, at testing, but to draft requirements for high quality design, implementation, and the transparency um, principles. And you'll, you'll see what they look like uh, this afternoon, as well as developing best, best practices for testing. This is uh, these areas for the vast majority of the principles and guidelines. We've had uh, great feedback from the public working groups, but in the area of the high quality design and implementation, it's it's a set of principles that are without a working group. And I, I think that the uh, testing working group uh, would would be a great place to uh, to carry out uh, that work. And uh, as we move forward, I, I just want to point out that the requirements and the test methods will continue to be developed using an open and transparent process. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Mary. Uh, appreciate the update. Uh, if uh, any of the members of the uh, committee have questions for Mary, now's the time. Or comments. Doesn't just have to be questions. Okay. Uh, I am sure when we get into the the principles and guidelines, we'll have more of that. Uh, and I appreciate uh, your overview because it helps encapsulate. Uh, not only the work that's been done on the, the principles and guidelines that, that we're here to talk about today, but that follow through down all the way down to the test assertion level uh, to ensure that the testing is consistent uh, across the laboratories and covers uh, adequately the principles and guidelines at that higher level. So I, I appreciate all the work that's gone into that. Mr. Hancock, the floor is yours, I think. Mary, if you want to stay there uh, and if we get additional questions as we go through this, I think that's fine. It's a little early for break, I think, so we'll, uh, we'll play it by ear. So next up is uh, Brian Hancock. He's the Director of Testing and Certification at the EAC. Uh, joining uh, him uh, at the table is uh, Ryan Macias, uh, who uh, works in the Testing and Certification Program with Brian. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is to walk through uh, if or when you, you all uh, agree on VVSG 2.0. We'll call it uh, when, and hopefully it's soon. Uh, like really soon. Uh, <laughs> what, is, what are the next steps? What does the process look like? How will the process proceed? And what are the timelines uh, for that? So to give that perspective. So, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, uh, TGDC members, uh, Chair, Chair Masterson. Appreciate it. And I also wanted to thank you for remembering 9-11 as, as someone that was here in Washington, D.C. Uh, on that day uh, and those folks that were in New York City uh, I think it changed all of our lives uh, very profoundly, and, and as you mentioned, it, it puts into perspective even the, the very important work uh, that we're doing here today. So I wanted to thank you for, for that. Uh, I will go over for the, for the committee. Uh, we're assuming that, that the guidelines will get adopted today or, or at some point in the very near future, so I think we need to talk a little bit about uh, the review and adoption process after the draft guidelines are, are approved by this committee.
Ryan also playing the role of IT help desk today. <laughs> oh, that's, that's changing here. I just want to know what's going on. Here's what we're going to do. We are going to take a 15-minute break, and we're going to get this laptop where we need it to be so that we're not doing this the rest of the day. Uh, are you good? We're good. All right. We're, we're going to get through this, and then we're going to get that laptop where it needs to be so we're not doing this the rest of the day. All right. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, again, for the review and adoption process, we, we need to, to remind ourselves what the requirements of the Help America Vote Act are. Right. Um, so very, in general, um, the Help America Vote Act requires the, the publication of the proposed guidelines in the Federal Register, an opportunity for public comment, uh, an opportunity for a public hearing on the record, um, and publication of the final guidelines in the Federal Register. Uh, in a little bit more detail, um, it st states that the Executive Director of the Commission shall take into consideration the recommendations put forward by this committee, that will be the draft uh, VVSG 2.0, uh, that the executive director of the commission shall submit those guidelines uh, that we propose to be adopted um, to the Board of Advisors uh, and also to the EAC Standards Board. Uh, those boards then uh, will review the proposed guidelines and submit their comments and recommendations on the guidelines uh, to the Election Assistance Commission. Uh, the Commission will at some point then vote on the final adoption of the guidelines, um, uh, but there also needs to be a 90-day, a minimum 90-day public comment period um, for the guidelines uh, before any of that, of that happens. So let's, let's remind ourselves uh, how we worked this process in the past, and then we'll talk about how we've changed the process and what we're going to be doing uh, to, to somewhat streamline that process moving forward. Uh, so looking back at the original VVSG 1.0, um, uh, the, the, there was a 90-day public comment period. We had three public hearings at various places across the country. We had one in New York City, uh, one in Pasadena, and one in Denver, Colorado. We had a two-day meeting of the EAC Standards Board and EAC Board of Advisors to discuss, to discuss the VVSG and to receive comments. And, and for those of you that were, were part of that, uh, and I know there are probably some in, in the room that were, uh, it, it was not the smoothest process. If you remember, um, the initial guidelines were about 260 pages without the appendix. Right? So that's a very large draft document for the boards to go over in a two-day period and have reasonable comments and reasonable discussion on. It was very intensive. We, we kind of broke um, the boards up into small working group sessions uh, and, and essentially staff worked all night uh, working on comments and resolutions and, and that certainly was not a, a, an efficient way to do things. I, I think hopefully we'll have a, a better way this time. Um, uh, in any case, the public comment period and the, the Standards Board Board of Advisors review resulted in over 6,500 public comments. Um, the EAC and this staff reviewed and considered every single one of those comments. Uh, and finally, on December 13th, uh, the Commission voted to adopt the VVSG uh, 1.0 with a 24-month implementation time frame. And I think that's something important to, to remember as well. There will be an implementation time frame of some sort that goes along with these guidelines. Um, as I said, 24 months for 1.0. I believe we had 18 months for VVSG 1.1, and, and there will be a reasonable time frame considered here, too. We need to remember that after these guidelines are adopted, our voting system test laboratories need to be accredited to test to these guidelines. The voting system manufacturers have to have some reasonable 
um, time to develop systems to these guidelines, although hopefully they're, they're looking at them now and, and sort of seeing where we're headed into the future so, so that time frame isn't, isn't too extensive. But all of those things play into what that implementation time frame uh, will be eventually. So uh, here is our general VVSG 2.0 review timeline. Uh, we will assume that uh, sometime this month the executive director will receive the draft VVSG 2.0 from TGC and NIST. Uh, hopefully by October we'll provide uh, VVSG 2.0 to the standards board and board of advisors. Um, by January we are planning to have a meeting of both the Standards Board and Board of Advisors to consider uh, VVSG 2.0. After that, we will begin the required 90-day public comment period. And so by around the end of April or early May, we'll have all the comments in, hopefully, and EAC and this staff will be able to uh, respond to changes from the public comments, uh, comments from the boards, uh, and, and get our, all our final formatting done, and, and our goal is as a commission to be able to present VVSG 2.0 to the commissioners for a vote sometime in May of 2018. Um, I think it's aggressive, but it's not too aggressive, uh, and I, I think it's where we need to go um, given the current state of affairs and some of the things we've seen over, over the past year, year and a half. Uh, this is the timeline in just a, a little bit more of a graphic format. Uh, I think one important thing to point out uh, here, too, and as I mentioned under the HAVA discussion, there is a requirement for a public hearing, at least one public hearing during this time frame, and so we will have to work that in, although we haven't, haven't necessarily determined uh, what month or, or when those public hearings will be. But it is a requirement, uh, and just to note that it does have to be included in there at, at, at some point. Um, we also will have some significant programmatic changes uh, that are taking place uh, along with the uh, VVSG 2.0 review and adoption process, and, and Ryan Macias is going to talk about that um, in the next presentation. Um, but at this point, uh, I'm open for some discussion or comments. Thank you. So we'll open the floor uh, to the committee for discussion of timeframes, uh, process moving forward. Uh, and then Ryan will give a presentation on uh, the programmatic changes uh, that the EAC will have to make to the testing and certification program, uh, given the new scope and structure uh, of the VBSG. So any questions uh, for Brian on process? Bob? Um, yeah, just where do the requirements fall in that? You know, we had talked about we're going to adopt the standards and then develop the requirements. Where does that fall into the timeline? Uh, well, as, as Mary mentioned, the requirements are being worked on now and actually have been being worked on for, for quite some time. They will continue to be worked on, um, and I believe those documents will be publicly available for comment as well once they are completed. Um, this committee will have a chance, the Standards Board, the Board of Advisors will have a chance to look at those, um, and I believe the thought was they would also go out for some sort of public comment period. Yeah. Are they going to follow the same timeline? Like, are they going to be finished at the same time? Like, where do, where do they fall in relation to adopting the principles? I guess is the question. Do you want to? So, let me see if I can give a primer on that, and then and then Mary can can weigh in. So the requirements, uh, as Mary outlined, are already in development and available through the public working groups right now, uh, as part of the work that's going on there. Uh, that will continue. Uh, part of what needs to happen in order for the requirements to be completed is the principles and guidelines to get done so you know the, the rest of the scope. So there's some assumptions that uh, NIST and the public working groups are making on scope uh, and whatnot, uh, but have to wait for the finalization to, to really understand. And so uh, they won't be done, I don't think, you know, immediately uh, upon adoption of EVSG 2.0, but they're not far behind. And, and perhaps most importantly, they're, they're available. You can go look at them right now as they're being worked on uh, to understand the, the nature of them, the, the work, uh, the scope of them, uh, and what they look like. And they don't have to follow the same HAVA prescribed adoption process, which is the key, right? And so they're, that part of the reason I think we all uh, supported uh, the structure of this 
VVSG is to allow the flexibility for the requirements development that not only when they're done, but if there's a need to continuously evaluate them public and they'll continue to be publicly vetted in that way, that that flexibility is within this, this structure that previously they would have had to go through, you know, this entire HAVA mandated process every single time you want to change one thing. Uh, and so that was part of the, the thought and pur purpose, as you know, uh, behind this. I don't know, Mary and Ryan. Go ahead, Mary. I don't really have much to add. I mean, we're certainly working on them as, as quickly as we possibly can. And I, I think, you know, part of it really sort of depends on, on the scope of, uh, you know, I, I think I'd, I'd mentioned this at the, um, you know, previously is, for instance, if you look at auditability, we can write requirements for auditability. If auditability is, uh, or, or uh, if we look at uh, some of the security issues, um, you know, we can write requirements for paper. But uh, you know, if we have to write requirements for EDE systems, which I, is, it would be quite a ways out, then there's research that needs to be done there. So there's going to be a timeline <laughs> from you know what's what's the minimum we we can get done to how how far down the spectrum do we have to go and uh, hopefully the minimum won't be too far you know beyond uh, you know we'll, we'll keep it as 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 near to in step as we possibly can but, uh, mm -hmm. and just to add to that um, actually the uh, next presentation is that is one of the major changes within the program um, that we'll be going through and how we transition um, because as commissioner had stated is it's not going to be a one and done um, since it doesn't have to be adopted under the old formal process is um, you know we will be getting into some of the processes that are going to be developed for being able to roll out um, new uh, requirements and test assertions beyond the initial set to be able to stand up the testing and certification program to the VPSG 2.0. Um, if I could just add to that I mean when we get the requirements and we actually we'll have to put them through putting together test assertions and then make sure that the things are implementable and testable and don't conflict with anything else. The last thing we want is a test assertion in one group conflicting with the test assertion in another. So there's going to have to be a whole lot of work in there to make sure that we have a testable and verifiable set of requirements that can be implemented and actually do what we want them to do. And the good news is, McDermott, your testing group is going to be the one tasked with with looking at and making that consistent, right? We're, we're at that point now to hand that information, still working with the, the other working groups to, to ensure that consistency uh, and, and uh, you know covering everything that we need to. As soon as my test plan is done, I'm all for all yours. David Wagner. Uh, David Wagner. Could we get a little more specificity about the plan with the requirement development? Will those be drafted by this committee? Will there be a vote by the committee on the proposed requirements? What is the committee's role um, on, like, are we developing recommended requirements that we transmit to the EAC? Can you talk us through that a little more? Sure. Uh, the goal is to engage you all uh, in the requirements, at least review process. Again, it doesn't have to, you all uh, under HAVA won't need to do a formal vote, although you, you could. Uh, that's up to you all as a as a, a advisory committee. Uh, but the, the uh, work would continue under the public working groups. Uh, and then the communication via NIST and the AC to you of the requirements will continue. Uh, we can continue to have TGDC meetings to go through the requirements, to review them, uh, but there isn't a requirement for a formal vote per se by you all, but absolutely the plan is to continue to engage from public working groups all the way on up to you all in the requirements development process to make sure that we're uh, consistent with your principles and guidelines and, and the principles and guidelines that the AC ends up adopting uh, at the end. So your work continues, I, I guess, is the answer. Mr. Chairman, I move that we adopt the milestone calendar for VBSG 2.0 as presented. Wow. <laughs> well, there's a motion on the uh, on the table, and so uh, is there a second? Okay. Second, second by. Uh, 
Bob Giles, and so now we'll open for discussion on the motion to to adopt this timeline. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. And this is probably an unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, you talked a little bit about the things that have to go into the timeline, obviously, the requirements, spooling up the test labs. There's a lot that needs to be done. As a local election official, and, and I'm sure my colleagues are wondering the same thing, do we have any idea, and this, this could be a guess, when there might be product on the street under VVSG 2.0 that we could actually implement? So let me let me clarify one part if I can, and then sure. and then they can they can answer. Uh, none of that impacts this timeline. To be clear, right? Uh, yeah. And so th this timeline, so the motion on on this timeline, which would serve as guidance to the EAC and NIST to, to get this done in this timeline, uh, isn't impacted by that. But I, I, perhaps McDermott's the the maybe the best person to answer. Uh, generally speaking, uh, timeframes as far as build and design. Uh, to, to the uh, guidelines and requirements? I'm guessing. Um, it's a somewhat educated guess, but it's still just a guess. Uh, once the, so once we have the standards in front of us, and more importantly, the test assertions, so we know what it needs to do, though we do have to talk about what the process will be for adding test assertions or changing test assertions and what sort of process that has to go through and what the impacts are if we're changing something that's current people are currently working on but the scope of this kind of it impacts all systems across the board there's not going to be a whole lot of systems that can be updated to this which means you're kind of starting from scratch so you're probably looking on really closely probably a 24 month development cycle plus then testing and as you saw on the list, for the 1.1, we already have 1,200 test assertions. That's a lot of testing. And the process um, can go anywhere from three months to over a year. Uh, so you're probably looking at about three months or three years between and, and adoption I, and, yep. and on the street. Right, and it's going to depend on the implementation time frame because what we've seen in the past is that the implementation time frame oftentimes drives the vendor's product, right? So uh, for 1.0, it was, it was 24 months. So automatically, let's just use that as an assumption, that would be 2020 uh, and then testing on top of that. So reasonably mid 2021, something like that. I mean, even optimistically. I would just add, though, optimistically, uh, that the two two things: the requirements and test assertions that exist now are are currently public and available, and so uh, at least there is more of a lead. So, two, 2005 VVSG, the vendors had to take from square one and go right from the time that it was adopted. Here, uh, there is the information's already available largely on in, on big chunks and. Uh, a great deal of it is stuff they're already familiar with. And, and although the, the requirements may change a bit, they know generally how it would be tested and evaluated. And so uh, I like to believe that uh, public in industry is, or pub private industry is enterprising uh, and sees an opportunity here and that perhaps those time frames will be more aggressive uh, because of the opportunity, but that perhaps I'm, I'm overly optimistic on that. Well, the other thing we have to think about is, is election officials, right, Neil? So there are a lot of folks that have either very recently are, or perhaps in the next six months or so, going to change over to new equipment, right? I, I don't think those folks are going to want to then turn around and buy new equipment again two years from now or two and a half years from now, right? <laughs> right. So, so, uh, so we have a motion on the table about uh, the schedule. Diane Golden. Uh, I think I'm going to ask if perhaps we could table that motion until we actually vote on the. Yeah. the it, yeah. it just seems odd to me to seems vote on a timeline for something we haven't adopted yet. 
and not that I'm anticipating something going horribly wrong with the adoption. Thank process. you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, yeah, it just seems like it, the timeline should come after the um, standard. The yeah, the principles and guidelines are are adopted. And since I have the microphone, I will say I I will bow down and and praise someone if we actually have something certified to 2.0 in 2020 because yeah. I've been waiting for accessibility right. now bow for down. over yeah, yeah. <laughs> to the commission yeah. or somebody yeah. I that would be delightful if we have something by 2020 I'm hoping there's something before I'm dead quite no. frankly so <laughs> anyway so just uh, to, just to follow up uh, and and uh, as part of that discussion but if, if that has to change, that was my concern. If we Are we locking ourselves into an absolute timeline if no. we adopt this? Or are we just using this as a guide once we, and I agree well, with what I want to so, take? So every, anything you all would uh, adopt or vote on uh, is a recommendation in the end, right? Uh, and so in theory, the EAC and NIST could choose to ignore it or do the best they can or, or anything in between. Uh, it, it doesn't lock you all into anything. It, it would... Uh, be a strong encouragement to us to meet our own time frames, right? Uh, and so that I, I will ask before we get to you, Mark, uh, the maker of the motion, are you willing to either withdraw the motion until such time as there's, a, you know, a vote on the or, or table the motion until such time per Diane's request? You just have to ask Bob if you withdraw the second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I withdraw my second. Uh, yeah. Then there is no second. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah right, uh, but but uh, I, I think we'll all note the importance of the timeline, and we can revisit it as we uh, visit uh, a vote on the the principles and guidelines and and other, and we can even draft a resolution to it. Um, thanks, Matt. I, I was going to second Diane's motion to table, but since we don't have yeah, to that. do that, I I, I was uh, I just wanted to mention, and I know there's not a specific timeline given but i just wanted to ask that you consider avoiding a conflict in january with the access board meeting because you know it might be handy for you to use our offices um, uh, at that time but uh, that and those dates are january 8th through the 10th just as an fyi thank you david wagner i wanted to follow up a little more about the requirements I think the requirements are very important, and one of the discussions we've been hearing multiple times in the cybersecurity working group is, what does this principle mean? What does that guideline mean? Well, what it really means is going to be determined by what the text of the requirements are, because those are what is actually going to have to, the equipment's going to have to comply with. So that's going to determine how those are interpreted, which... Or proved. Mm-hmm, exactly. Which... Um, then influences how we evaluate those principles and guidelines. So I guess I want to probe a little further to understand how that plays into this. Will the requirements be part of the recommended VVSG that the TGDC is recommending be adopted or be part of the final VVSG that's adopted by the AC? Will they be available for public comment? Will there be a public comment period on the requirements? Can we commit that the TGDC will have a chance to comment on the requirements? So how will they play into this? And, and if they won't be available, then, then how will members of the public comment on the proposed standard without knowing what the implementation is, the requirements that implement these guidelines? And yeah, thank you, David. I, I think we already mentioned that, yes, they, they will be all of those things, essentially. They will be available for a public comment period. Uh, standards Board, Board of Advisors, TGDC will get those to comment on. Um, the only thing is they will not be a technically part of the VVSG 2.0. They will be an adjunct, a documents that are always with VVSG 2.0, but as we've talked about actually for the past year and a half or so, we want to be a little bit more nimble when requirements need to be changed or, or slightly modified or new technology comes in, uh, and that's sort of the, the whole concept behind the new scope and structure. And I, I think Ryan's presentation will speak to some yeah. of this, yeah. and so maybe we yes. do Ryan's, and then if you have follow-up and need more detail on that, we can dig into that. Uh, Ryan, are you also going to discuss about the process for changing and who ultimately signs off on these requirements? 
So it, it'll be getting into all of that. The process is yet to be developed, but it, that is a major part of the discussion, um, is all the steps that need to take place and a timeline for what our program has to do to be able to implement requirements, test assertions, to be able to test to the VVSG 2.0 and the process for getting a transition time frame um, and, and the steps that we are already taking and where we are in that process right now. Go for it. Well, good morning, everybody. Ryan Macias here, and um, as we have been talking about, um, this is transitioning to VVSG 2.0, and, and um, Brian hit on some of the steps uh, along the way, but um, we're going to dig into them a little bit more, because as we know, um, with the VVSG 1.1, with VVSG 1.0, um, through the learning curves uh, of the adoption of those, um, we've realized all the things that need to be put in place internally um, at the EAC to go along with being able to test um, to those requirements and to those test assertions. And so we're going to start here um, where we are with the standards right now. Um, as we know, the VVSG 1.0, uh, most EAC certified systems are certified to the standard. Um, new systems can no longer be submitted to the standard, but modifications can continue um, to be tested to the 1.0. So if there is a system that is certified to the 1.0, then it may remain um, and have modifications made to that system moving forward. Um, and we've also worked out um, a process uh, with the manufacturers and had a, a request for interpretation um, and an interpretation that was made um, on the determination of what is a new system and when they would have to be upgraded to VVSG 1.1. With that stated, uh, currently, uh, as of July 6, 2017, all new systems must be tested to the VVSG 1.1. Um, at this current time, we do not have any applications submitted to the VVSG 1.1. And um, internally, with the VVSG 2.0, we are um, developing uh, the implementation plan um, and obviously, hopefully, adopting it here uh, today. So here's another picture of kind of the process um, that uh, Brian had laid out. And um, as, you can, <clears throat> as you can see, we're sitting in the green box. And what this discussion uh, is, is how do we get to the red box? Um, and there's a whole bunch in between that was already described um, from an external uh, source and um, how it works with the VVSG 2.0 in and of itself. Um, but really, we're going to focus here on the program programmatic side of things. So implementation plan, the time frame um, and considerations. Uh, we have to develop testing and certification program policies, processes, and procedures. Uh, most of you know that as the testing and certification and the voting system testing lab manuals. Um, these expire in 2018 um, based on the way that they were adopted in the past. Um, but in order to move them forward and make them look more like the VVSG, they will probably be broken out um, into policies that would be adopted, process and procedures that would be uh, impl more implementable um, internally. Um, as we've been talking about here, we have to have uh, manufacturers research and development to the new standards. Uh, we have to make sure that the labs can implement and test to the VVSG 2.0. So they need to know what the requirements and the test assertions are. And then we need to know what the impact is on the states and locals, um, both from a purchasing standpoint um, from uh, an equipment standpoint, from a technology standpoint, um, and what we've already been discussing in this implementation plan at a few of the conferences that we've gone to um, is the glossary of terms, um, things that the states and locals uh, should be considering and looking at. What we know is that there may be terms that are in the requirements and test assertions um, that fit a majority of the states but some states um, have direct conflicts with. Um, and so they have to start thinking about their interpretations um, at a state level um, for what, what that means um, and, and how to be able to implement these systems or what those interpretations may be um, at the local level. 
So what are the required documents that have to be uh, developed? Well, we have to have the document called the requirements and test assertions that we've been talking about this morning. Um, we have to have the commission's policy uh, for the testing and certification program. Well, basically, as we know now, what is called the manuals. Um, and the manuals are adopted by the commission. Um, and uh, currently, they have a three-year lifespan that, that ends in uh, 2018. Um, and then, as I was stating, breaking it down from a policies and procedure standpoint, we have to have a bunch of procedural manuals. And the ones that we've been talking about internally is implementing the requirements and test assertions. So uh, to your point, McDermott, this would be, um, you know, what that process would be for implementing that document that's up at the top, the requirements and test assertions, whether there would be modifications or whether there would just be additions um, based on technologies that come out and interfaces that come out on new technologies. Um, so this is a procedural document um, that, that will be worked on. Um, the manufacturer's registration process, if there's gonna be any changes to that um, voting system testing laboratory accreditation process. We know there'll be changes to that because they have to be accredited to the specific VVSG. Um, currently, they're uh, both accredited to VVSG 1.0 and VVSG 1.1, but there's gonna be a process um, for bringing them up to speed to 2.0. Um, and then there's gonna be the voting system testing and certification just uh, you know, what, it, what we call now the testing and certification manual. Uh, what are the steps and the processes for testing and certifying um, voting equipment, particularly to this new realm of requirements and test assertions. Um, uh, you know, right now it says that every voting system has to be tested to all requirements. Um, is that gonna continue to be the case when we have these sets of requirements and test assertions that may not be applicable to the system? Um, we've had to work on that through a request for interpretation process and a notice of clarification process um, internally right now. Is that gonna be the same or with this uh, more agile approach as we're developing the implementation for requirements and test assertions, um, would it be something through that process? Uh, we have the common data formats that we're going to hear about um, a lot more later today. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that is part of the, the interoperability is developing these common data formats and how do we implement those uh, into the requirements and test assertions. So those will have to continue to be adopted. Um, and then the glossary of terms. Um, it's something we've talked about a lot, both through a CDF work, uh, but also internally um, is developing a glossary uh, that will hopefully be able to be um, create synonyms um, and, uh, you know, grabbing glossaries that are already developed um, and, and being able to associate it to all the different terms that are uh, in use across the nation, uh, both by the states and, lo and locals, um, but also by um, others in the elections realm and, uh, and trying to develop that glossary. So that's also uh, currently under work. So what are the steps? Um, as stated, the commissioners will have to adopt those policies for the testing and certification program. The testing and certification program is going to have to form, formalize and distribute all of those procedures that were just talked about on the last page. Um, testing and certification program is going to have to, after formalizing the process for implementing uh, the requirements and test assertion, is going to have to have a process for publishing. And as we have stated here, it's going to involve you guys, it's going to involve uh, the other advisory boards. Um, and then uh, some way of doing a formal um, formal adoption or, or a formal publication um, by, the, um, by the EAC and the testing and certification program once they've been developed. We're going to have to go through the accreditation process um, after the uh, test labs, um, the pr process for accrediting them has been developed um, to make sure that they understand not just the procedures but the requirements and test assertions that they're going to be testing to and make sure that they have um, all their test cases developed to those. We're going to have to train the manufacturers on the testing certification process, procedures, requirements, and test assertions. Um, and right now, um, we actually have a tentative um, October meeting scheduled to go through some of these. And so um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put myself on the spot and, and probably uh, Brian and everybody else, but it, it's my hope to uh, have those uh, procedure documents, at least in draft form, um, along with presentations to the manufacturers to start uh, discussing um, what those uh, procedures are for the manufacturing um, registration accreditation process and um, testing and certification process since they have to be adopted by um, 
2018 and to start those discussions and potentially even start uh, public working groups with the uh, manufacturers and the uh, uh, VSTLs, uh, the voting system test laboratories, um, for the uh, for the, the continued improvement um, on those process and procedures document. And then informing the state and locals um, on these updates. Um, again, uh, you know, there's going to be that gap analysis and, and the uh, transition from 1.1 to 2.0 on each of the um, or the uh, principles and guidelines this afternoon. Um, and this uh, transition discussion um, has already taken place a few times uh, with the states and locals um, between NASED and IGO um, and a few other conferences that we've uh, spoke with um, about the new um, process uh, for getting there. Oop. So where are we? Uh, with the requirements and test assertions, they're under development, um, as we've been talking about, and they're going to continue their development. Um, I don't have anything more at this time on, on a date for that, um, but they're, um, they, are, they are still under development um, and, and continuing to be worked on. Um, hopefully, us as the testing group will begin to look at the gap analysis between the requirements that have been developed and the test assertions um, that are already out there. Um, as well as uh, if there's any test assertions that were out there from 1.0 or 1.1 that could then uh, help feed back into the requirements or at least back to the public working groups um, for developing those requirements, um, the specific groups. Uh, the common data format models, um, we're going to get into that more later, um, just as the requirements and test assertions, so I'm going to um, breeze past those. Uh, the glossary, um, we're currently doing work on that. I'm not sure uh, if the presentation around the common data format models will be um, discussing the glossary or not, but that is in development um, currently, and, and we're looking at methods and, and modes of putting together that glossary. Uh, the Commission's Policy for Testing and Certification Program um, and the Testing and Certification Program Procedural Manuals. Um, again, these were one document in the past. Um, or two documents, in essence, the testing and certification program manual and the VSTL manual. Uh, but to make it look more like um, the VVSG, um, having more of a high-level policy document similar to the principles and guidelines that would be adopted by uh, the commission, and then uh, the program procedure manuals. Um, and so far, these are the four um, broken out there uh, that um, we have identified internally that need to be developed. Um, as stated, at least the last three um, are in draft mode and will hopefully be uh, shared internally with the uh, um, manufacturers and the VISTALs um, to get them to a place where uh, they could be shared uh, more publicly, uh, hopefully at this uh, January advisory board meeting that we are talking about, um, and back with you guys as well um, uh, for full implementation. Um, again, I'm going to put this um, the, as a hope. Um, a hope is that this would both the policy would already have been voted on or uh, voted on uh, alongside uh, the VVSG 2.0 by the commissioners, um, as well as having the testing and certification manuals ready to roll out um, at the same time frame. Um, so if nothing else, whether or not the requirements and test assertions will be rolled out at that same time, the process for rolling them out will be um, clear. Um, by the time that there is an adoption of the VVSG 2.0. Um, so that is, uh, that's where we are. Um, the process is continuing forward, moving quickly, um, but there's a whole lot of work being done. Um, as I stated when, we, when I opened the presentation, um, we don't want to have you guys vote on the VVSG 2.0 and say, now what do we do as a testing and certification program to make sure that we can begin testing to this. Um, the, the hope is, um, you know, requirements and test assertions aside that at least the process and procedures um, and the accreditation um, that are necessary, all the steps that must be taken uh, when the EAC commissioners vote on the VVSG 2.0, we as the testing and certification program say we can now, you know, th that day or the very next day can begin taking those steps that are necessary um, to move forward. Um, but all of that will be wrapped into what we will call the implementation plan because we know that the um, manufacturers are going to need time for R&D and the like, but um, at, least, at least everything will be laid out and clear for what those steps are. And that's it. Okay, open uh, for questions, and I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to start 
uh, and that is that the program manuals, like the requirements and like the test assertions, also go out for public comment as well as going through our boards and, and everything else, correct? That is correct. And so, yeah, that's that's the hope for why um, for October we will have um, the draft with the uh, manufacturers and the labs um, and then hopefully getting them into a more formalized where we could roll them out for the January meeting as well um, to the Board of Advisors and, and Standards Board and um, how we will stand those up or when the next meeting will be uh, here with this group or whether it be um, submission via you know email, we will definitely take uh, comment on those um, and be able to um, – make any changes to them as necessary. Okay. Lori Gina. Uh, I would encourage you <coughs> can you hear me? I would encourage you to not lose sight of the process that we have developed up to this point that's been successful. Can you guys hear me in the back now? Better? No? I know it's working. Um, I would like to encourage you not to lose sight of the process that's worked pretty successfully up to this point in garnering this body and the public working groups on those test assertions and uh, requirements documents. Um, I personally would like to have an opportunity to review and provide um, comment through a working group methodology, and I think it ties into David Wagner's comments earlier, um, that this body might be the most appropriate body to be working with first before you're rolling out to the Standards Board or Board of Advisors. Um, we're a smaller working group that can provide, uh, or a committee that can provide, um, you know, good feedback. And this is where the rubber meets the road. Um, and so not losing sight of continuing to use us and follow that process that's been successful up to this point. Yeah, and so just, just to be clear to a answer that, from the requirements and test assertion standpoint from, you know, I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but from my personal perspective is that process will continue. The public working groups will be the ones that will be working on um, the requirements and test assertions and, and continue that process forward. Um, when I was talking about the the document is the implementing those process and procedures, and that would definitely go to you guys as a uh, board as well. Um, it, it just is not ready for today. So, um, you know, again, I would be more than willing to email it out to you guys in advance um, or, or around the same time um, as the Standards Board and Board of Advisors. But the, the hope from a progression standpoint is that it would be at least public for the, the boards by the January meeting. David Wagner. Uh, I also wanted to follow up on the requirements since, Commissioner, you invited me to yep. <laughs> continue after, re and I'm sure you'll regret that. Um, <laughs> um, so I guess I just want to put in a word of encouragement um, to um, think about how to make clear what the process for the requirements and the testable assertions is. I find it murky in my head. For um, the rest of the work we've done on the standards, I, I found the process and the ownership very clear. Uh, the TGDC is an advisory body only, um, but we um, are the ultimately responsible for developing the TGDC recommended proposal, which we have the control and the responsibility for producing. We vote on. Um, we have the assistance of NIST, um, but we have the final responsibility, and then we transmit that on DAC, and it's merely an advisory document. Um, I'm not clear on how the requirements and test assertions will be developed. I think you might want to consider, for instance, a role like that. I would find it helpful to know what, where we stand in that. Are we, are we engaged? Are we providing comment? Are, is this, do we have ownership over our recommended requirements? Um, is it NIST that is in control of those? Is it the TGDC's product? One, I, I take that encouragement seriously and, and absolutely hear it. Let me let me see if I can put this more clearly uh, than we have. Uh, the requirements and test assertion process will mirror the VVSG development process, except for there is no legal mandate for you all to have to make those recommendations. Is that a clear? Because I understand what you're saying, uh, but yes, it will go through the exact same process it's in the working groups right now they're working through them you can go look at them now but they will we will put them through you all the boards and the general public to comment on as we do the vvsg uh in the same way but but i hear you and so the need to uh put that out in a clearer document 
so that everyone understands the process. I, I hear you on that. Hopefully to clarify a little bit more, the, the concept that uh, Mark and I have been working on on this is that now that the requirements are coming out, our group is going to start taking those piece by piece and working on the, uh, the assertions, uh, you, working off what we've already got, and then returning those back to the working groups, highlighting any inconsistencies, any gaps, any, any issues, for, so that they can then put them into their own discussions and it'll kind of go back and forth on that until we finally come up with something that is a solid recommendation. Um, I have a, a follow-up question on this. Um, despite the infallibility of Robert Giles and others, um, it is entirely possible that when we put together the requirements that we will find things in conflict in this document. Um, I've seen a couple of places already that on the surface the the VVSG looks good but if you dig down into practical requirements depending on how those are defined we could actually wind up in conflict and in fact shutting down some very promising advances in technology I am wondering what is our process assuming that we do move forward with a vote today for amending these conflicts if we find them when we dig down into the requirements because as David said these the requirements are going to impact the principles and guidelines significantly uh, Neil Kelly Ryan I just have a process question I'm a little unclear on is it the cart before the horse a little bit on the manuals coming before the requirements are fully flushed out or help me understand that yeah so the the manuals are already out right now um and they have an expiration date and this this is really about how to submit an application what is goes into a test plan what goes into um the testing process um and then and same with the the registering manufacturers how you become a registered manufacturer how you become a uh, voting system test lab um and then the process for accreditation then takes that the requirements and test assertions to it's it's basically an auditing process that also works with the NVLAP um, the NIST uh, NVLAP process to run through auditing to make sure that they can accumulate everything together and be able to test to it but from a from a process standpoint um, and so two things one is um, now doing the the structured tier the way that we did with the vvsg if there does need to be modifications then we would be able to to make those um, but more so from the process standpoint there's not going to be much different than what we have seen um coming out of the manuals the structure is going to look different but it's it's really how a manufacturer submits their um, application what the steps are before getting to um, a certification decision what happens with a certification decision um rolling out those types of things so um i i don't think that there would be um uh, I, I don't think it's putting the cart before the horse Ryan, would you mind uh, to reiterate my question? What is our process for changing this VVSG if the requirements wind up in conflict? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to answer it. One is, I mean, there's a formal process in HAVA that requires you all to approve changes to the VVSG. So we'd have to go back through the TGDC process like we've been doing since 2015. Uh, which is exactly why we're moving the requirements where we are, right? This is why we chose the stru structure we chose, so that in order to change each and every requirement, it doesn't involve a two to three year process, right? right? And so the, the process is going to be evaluating the requirements. If there's a conflict that would necessitate a change in the VVSG, we would have to come back to this table and go through the VVSG process. I would hope we could resolve that through the requirements vetting process. And I know NIST has this experience in other areas. I don't know. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, uh, so, so, thank you. So in, in our mind, this is not dissimilar from our cybersecurity framework uh, that's been pretty successful. And the way that works is we do have a high-level framework 
that provides guidelines and principles and, and are actually easily understandable so that people at the highest levels of decision making can, can understand what the goals are. But underneath these are the very detailed technical specifications. And then those can change as they do, uh, as technology changes, as markets change. And those can change actually fairly dynamically without these being in conflict typically. Now, if things do change so dramatically, as Matt said, then yes, you, you would have to revisit. But in the meantime, what this is doing is, is also setting an expectation, right? Because you've said these are the principles that we're looking for the underlying regulations and standards to meet. So th if the conflict issue that, that you pointed out arose, ideally, yes, that would be dealt with at the working group level, uh, perhaps by making sure that they are aligning with principles appropriately, or perhaps by making sure that any redundant working groups uh, start to merge, or that you know you, you parse the, uh, the 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 specific technical uh, goal within one. So there is going to be management in in that, those lower levels, definitely. But ideally, much of it can be con much of the high level thinking can be contained here and be somewhat static, at least on the year's time frame. Mary, do you have anything? To no, add and I, I think that's that's correct. It's uh, you know, I, I as much as we would love to say, you know, we're going to vote on this and we're going to accept it and we're done. Standards don't work that way. Yeah. You know, nothing that involves technology works that way. And you know, I, I think the processes are in place that if if you know, as we're going down the requirements path, it, you know, if it can't be solved in the requirements or the the manuals or processes and procedures that we we have the opportunity to come back and uh you know and, and modify as as we go along i mean that's the, the you know all the processes are in place the groups are in place the uh, procedures that were set out in haba you know still apply that uh, diane yeah i was just gonna say i, I would hope that the requirements, you can resolve that at the requirements level rather than coming back to the principles and guidelines. To me, the principle and guidelines are sort of like motherhood apple pie. And I, I you know, I mean, how, how could you disagree <laughs> pretty much? It's the requirements where, you know, reality and, and those specific conflicts and how you resolve them, I would hope that's resolved at that level. But I would, I would echo the fact that there will be issues there and i'm hoping this group can resolve those because otherwise they're daunting and may not be resolvable or they'll be resolved in the court of public opinion which is not necessarily the best resolution in a lot of cases so okay uh just so just one more thing I'm yeah sorry. i had yeah. to throw something in jersey yeah, yeah i did <laughs> So, so how does the, I guess, the balance between requirements and test assertions and the potential conflicts there, um, like as we're moving forward, are you going to develop a requirement, then the test assertion before we adopt the requirement that we can make sure it is testable, or are we going to do, the, do them on separate paths? How is that going to work? That's a great question. And then let me just uh, you use a, a phrase from from Commissioner Masterson. It depends. <laughs> that uh, it uh, you know certainly if they're ready to be presented at the same time, that that makes a, a great deal of sense. But if if in fact they're offset, you know we certainly don't want a situation where we have test assertions and no requirements, right? right. <laughs> that uh, that I mean there's a certain path that has to be followed, and uh, if. In some cases, you know, some of the, the groups will be ready to present, you know, a, a set of them at the same time. And I would expect that we'll follow a, a process similar to what we've already done. That, you know, we're, you know, the idea is to present the information to you as we go along in, in smaller chunks so they can be reasonably reviewed and, you know, and, uh, and we can receive comment back and, and go through this iterative process till we get to, to where we want to be. That, uh, you know, as a community. And Diane, there's always someone that doesn't like apple pie, so I'm sure we'll get to that <laughs> that point. But um, okay, we're due for a break. Uh, we're going to break for about 15 minutes uh, to 11 o'clock or so. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to get the laptop more functional for us, I hope, uh, and then readjourn around 11 o'clock. Uh, and again, bathrooms uh, out the doors there. And if you are not a government employee and you're here, you do get re-scanned by security if you come back through. So just be aware. 
Uh, so we'll readjourn at 11.
said. <laughs> All right, two minutes, two minutes. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Woo. McDermott Coots to your seat, please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, he is trouble. All right, uh, we're going to uh, start back up again, and we. Uh, 
Next on the agenda is a discussion, so I, I will tee up the kind of general information and then turn it over uh, to Ms. Golden first and then David Wagner uh, to weigh in as well. Uh, as part of uh, your all's recommendations or encouragement to us at a prior meeting, uh, and I think as a result of my own uh, on-the-spot idea making, uh, the EAC hosted a meeting of uh, accessibility, so uh, voters with disabilities and accessibility experts, including uh, Diane uh, and others, uh, security experts, uh, including, uh, I think, David, you participated uh, via phone, uh, but was a part of the, the meeting, as well as some other computer scientists from across the country, uh, and election officials. Uh, and the purpose of the meeting, uh, as we talked about at the last TGDC meeting, was to tackle this idea uh, and challenges uh, of um, the need and requirements for accessibility that, that voters can not only cast their votes freely and independently, but verify and, and uh, have the auditing process done in an accessible manner, uh, and the uh, desire and goals of the security community to have uh, fully uh, transparent, uh, verifiable, and auditable uh, systems. And so the purpose, uh, and it was uh, moderated uh, and facilitated by David Becker, who did a very good job uh, feeding the conversation in a direction to uh, where are we, how can we ensure uh, both goals, because they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, a, a voting system needs to be both accessible uh, and verifiable and audible or, or secure. Uh, and so the goal of the conversation was to uh, have that, that uh, and see where there's agreement. And so uh, I, I guess I'll turn it over to Diane for her takeaways and then David and then uh, others can weigh in and I'm happy to share my experience. But I wanted to share the results of that conversation because I think it speaks directly to where we are currently uh, in the principles and guidelines and some of the tougher issues or the toughest issues. So, Diane. Sure, um, and I just jotted down a few notes. I. I yeah, much of the conversation, quite frankly, was um, repeat of conversations we've been having for over a decade now um, with the return to um, what I'll just refer to as a core paper ballot as the determinative vote record rather than a digital ballot, quote unquote. Um, it's very clear that it, it, paper's inaccessible in and of itself, and so making it accessible is a challenge, and um, we, We've done a reasonably sort of good job uh, providing a, a digital interface for people who need access features so that they can mark a paper ballot, actually generate the print on a ballot, but where we have fallen down over and over and over again is allowing a voter to verify that printed marked paper ballot accessibly and then casting that print printed paper ballot accessibly and providing access for verification and casting is very difficult and expensive and complex and just hasn't been done quite frankly because there's not a market demand and anyway a variety of factors so that's been the historic challenge um, and as we discussed um, from the security side and I will certainly let um, David Wagner speak to that you know, one of the, I think, classic statements from the security audibility side was, well, if you assume a core paper ballot, then all these other things fall into place. And, and I said, excuse me, but if you assume a digital ballot, all of my accessibility issues fall into place. <laughs> so this is the inherent tug here. Um, quite frankly, in order to be accessible, it has to be digital. You can't make paper accessible Otherwise, it has to be digital at some point <laughs> to be accessible. So we just have this um, balancing act, tug of war going back and forth. Um, and, you know, there's a, a resolution we'll discuss later at some time. But, um, and I wasn't joking about, you know, uh, my comment about I'd like to see this before I die. Um, I really would like to see an actually deployed system that works and works efficiently and, and is cost effective from an election official's perspective. I mean, my gut fear is we, we can do this. We have the technology, we can do it, but can we do it in a way that any of you guys can implement and make it work efficiently and effectively? That I don't know because I haven't seen it happen. So anyway, um, we had a good discussion and I mean, um, our working group has, uh, you know, 
that we can put the standards together whether or not we actually get a system deployed that meets them that works efficiently and effectively in an actual voting environment is kind of the unknown um, of this equation. So, David, anything you want to add? Sure, David Wagner. Um, uh, yeah, that was a that was a good summary. I'll I'll um, add a little more. I was there for most, but not all of it. I had to step out for an hour or two to teach. So, uh, I hope <laughs> folks here will correct me if I uh, misrepresent anything that happened at the meeting. Um, uh, I believe the goal of the meeting was to try to figure out how to handle the, the tension between accessibility and, and security or auditability, how to, how to find a way forward that could, um, that could uh, you know, meet the needs of both of those, th those communities and, uh, and goals. And I think the, the workshop was successful at that um, in identifying a path forward that looked plausible that it could sounded like meet accessibility concerns and that looked like from the security and auditability perspective could meet the security and auditability perspective. So I thought that was very encouraging. Um, the challenge that we continually have faced, as Diane mentioned, we've had this conversation over and over, is, um, is, uh, is around paper um, that, the, um, that what the security folks have, um, what we've heard from that community and from the research there is that if it's not auditable, it's not secure. Um, and to make it auditable, that requires um, some way to check the system. Uh, there's been a proposed concept called software independence. And um, the challenge with that is that um, right now, if you look at the systems that are on the market that are, that are currently available, the only current way of achieving that involves some kind of a paper trail, paper ballot, paper trail, which then introduces all of the accessibility challenges that, that Diane raised, including especially transport of the paper ballot. Um, we heard from some of the cryptographers and computer security folks um, there speaking um, in favor of software independence. Some of them spoke in favor of a paper trail. Others um, advocated for a different angle towards software independence. They proposed um, cryptographic end-to-end -end voting systems, which are an alternative means of meeting software independence and providing auditability that may or may not involve paper. I think the advocates imagine at least the initial implementations might possibly involve paper, but that don't need to, and that it could provide a path forward to a, a system that doesn't, doesn't involve paper and is instead relying on some fairly sophisticated uh, mathematics and cryptography. And there was a debate among the security community about you know, which of those is the better angle, what's achievable, are the cryptographic end-to-end -end systems uh, plausibly implementable, could they reach the market? There's currently no systems, I think, that, uh, that are of that form. Are they FIPS certified? Yeah, this <laughs> cryptography is, um, is uh, specialized for the voting environment, so we would need to develop our own standards to support that. Um, FIPS wasn't really um, developed with voting in mind, it was developed for some, yeah, rather different algorithms, so you're getting out an apps, a challenge there. Um, so I think what the security community uh, take away from that was, let's not try to push one or the other of these angles. Uh, the proposal was to require auditability in the form of software independence, which could then be um, met either by paper or by cryptographic end-to-end -end systems. Um, and um, from on the accessibility side, uh, require that whatever a system is, that it must uh, be accessible. So I th think the outcome of that meeting, the path forward was a dual requirement for accessibility no matter what and for software independence with two possible ways towards achieving software independence. So the implications for us in the cybersecurity working group, um, I think that we have a pretty good idea how to write requirements for um, paper-based systems for the cryptographic end-to-end -end systems. That's going to be a bunch more work for us, and we're not there yet. And um, that's going to be particularly challenging because we don't have existing systems on the market. So we're writing requirements um, for envisioned future systems rather than for systems that are currently deployed or available on the market. 
I think both of those are uh, perfect summaries of, of how, where the discussion uh, ended uh, and is reflected in the current principles and guidelines that, that you have in your folders. Uh, there was a recognition that uh, there was a commitment in the principles and guidelines to be technologically neutral uh, and therefore that the software independence requirement had to be viewed as such, that it could not be a dictate of a certain specific type of technology, but instead a, a, a principle uh, to be followed with the requirements to follow uh, in kind, uh, and that any form of software independence uh, had to offer full, uh, independent, uh, not only ballot casting, as we said, but um, verification and uh, auditability as such. And Diane, I think, made a very cogent point about why verification uh, from a, a paper standpoint for voters with disabilities is such a challenge. And there was a recognition that the technology does exist uh, to provide that level of accessibility and that, in fact, it's incumbent now on the marketplace uh, to utilize that technology and that we've uh, come a long way since the discussions of the 2007 VVSG technologically uh, to tackle these. Uh, and there was an absolute unanimous agreement uh, that full accessibility must be present, that 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 was not something to be capitulated on uh, from all, I think, in the room. So are, are there any questions about that meeting, uh, the reflection in the in the uh, draft principles and guidelines? Uh, but we wanted to make sure we discussed it because it was something we uh, committed to doing at the prior meeting and, and fulfilled. Awesome. You guys, both of you, David and, and Diane, I want to thank you both for your participation, uh, for sharing uh, the comments, I will say. Uh, uh, Diane probably didn't feel as optimistic. I, I felt really good about where we walked out of that meeting at, that there was a recognition on both sides of the importance of their points uh, and that it wasn't uh, w one has to give for another, but in fact, both have to be present. And I think both sides really shared that. And the election officials in the room certainly appreciated that because uh, they're the ones that have to deploy this and would face uh, lawsuits, I think, in both directions uh, and otherwise. So I, I think, generally speaking, in the room, there was absolute recognition of it. Neil. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't mean to go back on, but I do have a question, oh. actually. I'm wondering out of the meeting if there was any discussion or where it fit into the meeting, uh, an online marking device uh, for accessibility with a paper printout. How did that, was there a discussion on that? Yeah, so to my recollection, there was, and, and one of the conversations that was had was for voters with disabilities, uh, that if there's this software independence uh, uh, principle present, that it increased the, the flexibility for the types of technologies folks could use uh, to mark their ballot, right? And so uh, there was a conversation around it, uh, that, that additional flexibility for voters with, tech, uh, voters with disabilities, particularly to use their own technology in a variety of ways, which may include uh, ballot, online ballot marking, but that as long as you, in the end, had this verifiable, auditable record, that uh, it created that flexibility. And please correct me if, if I'm misstating uh, the conversation, but. Yeah, the, the challenge with um, online ballot marking devices is in order to provide accessible verification and you know, casting is really a challenge, but I'll kind of set that aside. The person really almost has to have their own AT. I mean, because you're talking about an OCR scanning. I mean, that's the only way you can really, you know, if you're asking a voter remotely to print, um, then somehow they got to scan that print back in, and that means they're going to probably have to have their own assistive tech, sorry, um, to do that. Um, and that creates kind of another set of issues, concerns for people about folks using their own technology. And anyway, I, you know, so there's potentially a, a number of issues. But, you know, for me, I, you know, remote voting, letting somebody use their own assistive technology is kind of the, the um, best option um, because you eliminate all kinds of issues, uh, training and experience and knowledge and expertise of using your own, you know, assistive technology makes things so much easier. So anyway, um, yeah, it's not a, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. Uh, well, the good news is uh, we're a little ahead of schedule. Uh, and I appreciate you all indulging that conversation, but we wanted to make sure we were responsive uh, to the prior meeting. Uh, so I think we can tee up uh, the uh, discussion, the beginnings of the discussions on the overview of the uh, draft principles and guidelines, and at least begin that. Is that all right? I think 
there's an awful lot to tee up. We were just going to go right into the discussion of the draft principles and guidelines. Yeah, perfect. Let's do it. Okay. Well, we do you need to get your folks? I do. We kicked them out of the room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll grab the, the NIST folks. Uh, who's first? Sharon. Sharon. All right. So the, this next portion of the meeting, uh, what we'll do is, in theory, they're watching, so they'll know uh, in, the, in the breakout room. Uh, the next portion of the discussion is uh, that the NIST staff uh, will walk through what the principles and guidelines say, what the motivations uh, behind each one of the principles and guidelines were, uh, answer questions, concerns, uh, comments on them uh, with the goal of uh, working through whatever concerns you may have heading into uh, tomorrow uh, and possible approval of the principles and guidelines. So now's a good time uh, to have an open discussion about any concerns you've had as you've looked through them, to ask questions uh, of the NIST staff uh, that have worked with the working groups and EAC staff that have worked with the working groups uh, to be able to fully vet uh, the principles and guidelines with you all uh, heading into to, tomorrow. So uh, with that, uh, I will turn it over uh, to Dr. Sharon Liskowski uh, to tee up the first set of principles and guidelines, which will be on uh, accessibility and usability. Sharon, the table's yours. Well, I, I believe Matt just did the intro, so, <laughs> so, you're, so, off. so you're off. <laughs> and again, th this is meant to be interactive for you all. So as she goes, as you have questions, or if you want to wait till the end, the idea is for you all to be able to cover questions, uh, concerns, whatnot, as we walk through uh, the human factors, principles, and guidelines. There, there we go. Thank you very much. So I'm going to be talking primarily about the human factors principles and guidelines. Uh, put it in slide mode. Well, no, te technical uh, detail. Mm -hmm. There we go. Oh. Thank you. Okay, um, there's basically four principles. Um, equivalent and consistent voter access, mark verified and cast as intended, robust, safe, usable and accessible, and voter privacy. Um, I'm gonna be going over in detail each of these with their associated guidelines. And there's also, um, let me take this opportunity to talk about when we, um, the NIST team, took our stovepipe principles from security, interoperability, um, high quality design and implementation and put them together into the, the 15 that you see now, we saw there were overlaps and um, we realized we needed to um, um, kind of look at the whole because all 15 principles stand together and work together. Um, so this final version is a result of, of that uh, collaboration across the team. So first let me quickly go over the changes from the VVSG 1.1. So what's new with this approach to high level principles and guidelines is that we can clearly state high-level goals of accessibility and usability for all voters. Um, we envision this uh, in a way that these can be applied to any interactive system or function that's in the voting system scope. And we um, hope and believe that um, as technology emerges um, that we're generic enough that you don't really have to change at this level. It's the underlying requirements um, that change if there's some specific implementation details relevant uh, um, that's relevant to that technology. And the way we developed our principles and guidelines is an extensive gap analysis and review of the research and sort of how do these group together and then we drilled back down to identify where there were 
gaps in requirements. Um, so as a result of this process, we actually do have um, a skeleton set of requirements underneath them. Um, we also felt it was important to reference uh, federal accessibility standards to make sure that, um, that systems meet accessibility requirements as required by law. So we wanted to say that generically because versions of, st of standards underneath uh, change, they get updated. Um, but this ensures that we always refer to commonly acceptable standards. We also wanted to be sure to include accessible processes for verification, including ver verifiable paper records, as you just heard earlier from Diane and David. Um, and um, we organized also according to what are called the poor principles, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. That comes out of the accessibility community and standards such as the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which are now part of the updated Section 508. We also wanted to make sure we support universal design and usability. That is trying to identify the largest range of voters while balancing um, minimizing the voter interface complexity, especially at the polling place. And we added, and I'll talk about this in a little more detail later, um, making sure our user-centered design methodology is applied up front in the development process, and also kind of a higher level transparency principle that John Wack is going to talk about uh, later in the day, um, that the systems and processes are easy to understand. Uh, that creates trust. That's kind of a meta usability, accessible human factors thing um, um, that, that looks at the higher level processes. So it's not a direct, here's very specific user interface requirements kind of thing. I'm not going to go over in detail this slide, but for those of you that remember, say, seeing an earlier version from February 2017, we did some shuffling. Um, but everything that was in the February 2017 is still in here. It's just shuffled and reworded for clarity. Um, what was new is calling out a voter privacy and ballot secrecy um, explicitly and developing a working definition for that. Um, and I also mentioned the user-centered design methods added to the high-quality implementation and the transparency. So the first principle is equivalent and consi consistent voter access. The wording is all voters can access and use the voting system regardless of their abilities without discrimination. So what are the two guidelines associated with that? Well, that voters have a consistent experience throughout the voting process in all modes of voting. So there's two levels of which this can be in interpreted. Uh, at one level, the if the voter is, needs to use audio, that that audio experience is consistent throughout the process of voting, um, and including, for example, the verification of the ballot, and ballot choices, that is. But also, you want voters to have a consistent experience in their voting process um, at the meta level, that is, if they're going and using their own assistive technology to mark their ballot at home, uh, as opposed to the polling place, that experience should be as similar as possible and, co and consistent across the board. And the second guideline is voters receive equivalent information and options in all modes of voting. That's a basic accessibility requirement. That is, you want um, the same information, the same kind of options. We use the word equivalent here, not the same, because, um, for example, to use audio again, there may be instructions for navigation that are slightly different, but equivalent. Um, and the voting information is audio, so um, it's equivalent information, and that's a term of art in the accessibility community as well. The next principle is marked, verified, and cast as intended. That is, ballots and vote selections are presented in a clear, understandable way and can be marked and verif verified and cast by all voters. Here's where we see the perceivable, operable, and understandable guidelines. The, the robust, the R part of poor is in the next uh, um, uh, principle. 
Um, so uh, for uh, perceivable, you want displays working, a display for working for the widest range of voters, and voters can adjust the settings to meet their needs. So for example, requirements about font and contrast fall into play, and we, we know from research that voters, all voters, want large enough font, for example. Operable, voters and poll workers can use all controls accurately, and voters have direct control of all ballot changes. Uh, here's where we talk about um, preventing overvotes, good, you know, um, being able to navigate easily through the ballot, and not having the system say if you um, change something, um, let's say in particular, um, if you're doing, say, um, um, uh, voting by party, um, you, the, the things don't get changed unexpectedly in other parts of the ballot. You always, as a voter, have direct control. And understandable, can voters, voters can understand all information as it's presented, including instructions, messages from the system, and error messages. Um, so here we're talking about clear feedback, plain language in the error messages and in the navigation. And there's a lot of research that's gone on since VVSG 1.1 that we've pulled together to update uh, requirements to capture this. Sharon, before you go on. Yes. Yep. Questions? Of the 15 higher level principles that are included in Greg, can you use your mic? I'm sorry. I was. I just wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's on. Um, of the 15 um, principles and guidelines that are in here, this is the only one of the 15 where we've put something in bold all caps in front of the operable sentence. Um, is that necessary? It was obviously purposeful, but is well, it necessary? We, we had a discussion. So we knew this was very important to call these out for the accessibility community, but it is not consistent. Uh, and we've, we've gone both directions. Um, I'd certainly like the input from this committee as to whether we um, need to change the format uh, or not. We certainly um, uh, can put in something about, you know, the, um, uh, we can work that into a sentence and wordsmith it to, to eliminate that. I, I maybe look to Diane to, to, to comment on that. Yeah, I, I was just sitting here thinking about um, it, it. Yeah, poor is a, a term of art within the accessibility community, and so I understand. But then again, we've got perceivable, operable, and understandable, and we don't have robust capitalized anywhere, so we've kind of done poo. <laughs> yeah. Something yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is in the next. It is so. There it is on the next. Yeah, slide, it's it's yeah, in the next one, bold. but it's yeah. not capitalized yeah. in yeah. bold. So we've kind of lost the poor anyway. So yeah, I don't. I, I, mean, I think we could probably put something in parens or something if, if it's really a big deal to make the, the formatting uh, the same yeah. across all of them. Yeah, I mean, certainly I think the, the verbiage associated with each one does capture the notion of perceivable, operable, and understandable. Um, maybe the, yeah, the solution is to just call it, call it out in parentheses at the end of the sentence. Is that... Uh, well, I wouldn't even or do that. We're going to have, have this 700-page glossary at the end, and it would certainly uh, behoove us to not not have to define them explicitly. Yep. Yeah, inside the document itself. Yep, we can do that. I, uh, I'll add just for purposes of discussion. Uh, the reason, I, part of the reason I think that this was included in this way, or or it was important to have those words in particular, was uh, Matt McCullen, who's not here today, at a very early meeting in 2015 stress the importance of having these concepts within the document. And so the reason it's called out specifically in this way in this document is because Matt had spoken to, and I think both Diane and Mark uh, agreed in, in what, to call these out because these are known terms within that community to see that those were being addressed directly in the guidelines and principles. So for whatever perspective that's worth, I recall that being part of the discussion in a, in a prior meeting that we, we had. And I think mm -hmm. what drove this kind of layout. Um, Mark, perhaps you have a, a comment? Uh, yeah. Too bad Matt's not here, but I think you know why he's not here, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'd rather not speak for him, but, but I think you capsulized it pretty well. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
N Neil, did you? So I, I admit I'm coming to this in the ninth inning because Jed and I are both brand new members of the TGDC. So I feel a little guilty about asking these kinds of questions, but I'm over it now. Not, a, so, yeah, not uh, at all. <laughs> yeah, not, not a problem. Uh, under understandable in, in that 7.3, I really like the, the document in, in whole because it really talks about being easy for voters and individuals to understand um, these items and then this is the only area where we're not using the word easily so that's that's my question because we talk about it in transparency that it should be easy to understand and then we come down here and we say voters can understand as opposed to continuing that theme and maybe it's it's minor but I just thought that it's not consistent through the document mm -hmm. so that's what I was wondering So you're, I'm yeah. sorry, just for clarity, you, you would like it to read voters can easily understand all information? Okay. This keeps it consistent. I guess we were trying, I think just one of the reasons we didn't use the word easy is we were trying to be very specific about, about what is to be measured in requirements underneath it. You know, because easy is kind of, oh, you know, what, is, what does that mean? But, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so as as we'll move on, we certainly want things to be tested f with real users to make sure they can understand and can use the controls. Um, so, I think that's why we didn't have it in there to make that point. Um, kind of gets overused and then loses meaning. So. Uh, Diane, I, you know, I'm gonna look to you for. Yeah, that, that, that's honestly it. It's, you know, easily, efficiently is another one. And when you're talking about access features, sometimes they just aren't very efficient. Even if they're the best designed access feature in the world, they're still slow and cumbersome. But that's, you know, so I think all of those kind of qualitative words are a little challenging to to quantify and measure and look when you're looking at requirements and test assertions and verifying conformance so yeah even even efficiently you can actually if you've got us a, a standard uh, protocol for testing a standard ballot which we've done in the past for for testing you can actually measure time um, on average with specific sets of users and get some uh, which is particularly important for the accessible system because if you've got say designed it so there's 300 button presses if you're using a switch, uh, probably not something you can expect voters to, with those kinds of disabilities that need that assistance to, to use, so. Well, and I wasn't thinking of that in that context, so I appreciate the discussion, it's helpful. Okay. And, uh, just one thing to bring up on that, as they've been stating, easy can't be measured. And what we do at that point is we start moving the judgment of what is easy to the lab because we can't write a test assertion to measure it. Well, then you start getting inconsistencies in the lab because depending on who's testing and what their test protocol are, is, then suddenly every lab's doing it different and they're giving judgment, which we are trying to do because the labs are doing conformance and we must give them something to conform to. So the word, it's, it actually should go the other way where we say it is easy, it's a can. So we're easily is used elsewhere in the document. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not, not, not my uh, uh, area of expertise. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to look through for that. <laughs> it, it, one is we're, we're tracking each one of your comments that so we can revisit them uh, once we get through each one of the sections so we can say, you know, is mm -hmm. this something you all would like to see changed or not? Two is that the, the, obviously the principles and guidelines are not what's going to be taken and actually tested too, right? We talked about that this morning. The requirements and test assertions will be developed off of this. And so to the extent that easily is used somewhere else, we can make a decision whether it's appropriate to use it here or not use it in those other places this afternoon, recognizing that requirements will be following along with these. So other, other questions for Sharon before we move forward? Go ahead, Sharon. Okay, the next one is robust, safe, usable, and accessible. The voting system and voting processes provide a robust, safe, usable, and accessible experience for all users. 
So the guidelines under that are first the voting system hardware and accessories protect voters from harmful conditions. Uh, for example, you don't want the polling booth falling over <laughs> or uh, plugs, you know, getting loose in electrocution or um, the flicker rate being such that uh, it causes a seizure in some sensitive individuals. And so we have a lot of, by the way, we have a lot of these requirements in 1.1 already. Um, second, the voting system meets currently accepted federal standards for accessibility. I already talked about that. We generalized it at this level, so rather than reference, say, WCAG 2.0, specifically that would go in the requirements underneath where we have more flexibility to change them as, as uh, standards get updated. And thirdly, the voting system is measured with a wide range of representative voters and poll workers, including those with and without disabilities for effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction. Um, this is based on an ISO definition, and uh, as I mentioned before, this, uh, these, uh, this particular set of requirements are already in VVSG 1.1. We have a lot of guidance that we're, we want to revisit in terms of how um, you test this. This is geared at the sort of near or end final product um, where you're testing with sets of users each mode of voting. Um, so if it's the audio mode, you test with people that need to use the audio mode in order to vote. Um, and effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction are uh, part of the standard ISO definition for how to measure this. This is called a summative usability test if you want to get into, you know, the um, um, usability, uh, user experience lingo. Um, and as I said, we had guidance in terms of a test protocol, what those sets of users should look like, what a test report should look like. Um, uh, we've got standard medium complexity ballot in, in which to test, so you could actually uh, look at error rates, look at efficiency, um, and voter satisfaction. Um, so there's lots of materials there. We'd like to revisit them and package them up better, maybe with a short background to make it easier for the um, developers to use. So uh, look, go ahead, you first. Well, I was just going to add to this, and we've had quite a bit of discussion about um, it, when you, when you try to gather up a representative group of voters with disabilities, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, it, and I'm, yeah, I'm saying that with all, you know, and, and that's been part of the problem. A, there are a whole lot of different kinds of functional limitations that you need to have represented. So having like one blind person isn't going to cut it, you know, and one blind person does not equal a second blind person. If you happen to pick the one blind person who's really technologically savvy, you're going to get a whole different user feedback than you are, you know, someone elderly with macular degeneration who doesn't use any technology, you know, and, and is still blind. So it's just um, trying to provide guidance, as Sharon said, and, and at the same time acknowledging that it is really difficult to find the kinds of user groups that really is going to give you a good um, set of, of information about what's, you know, what's working, what's not, effectiveness, efficiency, satisfaction. And I can say this from, from experience for the work we did with one of the EAC funded grants, trying to find representative samples of people who use switch input, you're talking about gathering up a whole lot of different kinds of people with different kinds of disabilities and constituency groups and even if you go pull a group of people with cerebral palsy, you get completely different kinds of cerebral palsy and functional limitations. It's just, it is not, it's not as easy as, you know, opening a storefront someplace and saying, okay, a whole bunch of users come in. That's great usability testing in one sense, but it doesn't give you a really good set of feedback about access features. It's much more challenging than that. So anyway, that's part of trying to provide a little bit more guidance and help and suggestion for, for vendors. And I've talked to Matt about this a lot. Somehow we got to bridge the gap between the voting vendor community and the assistive technology vendor community and <laughs> just in general trying to merge this um, a little bit better. So anyway, we're, hopefully we'll have some good things come out of it. 
it, it sounds impossible, but it's not. Pe people in the user experience accessibility community do it all the time, but um, I think we're also um, need to keep, so, but certainly a need for guidance to make, to make it clear how to, to do that easily. But also, we're thinking about in the polling place, which kind of users are actually going to be there. If you take this broader view where you have different modes of voting, so if they can mark their ballot at home using their assistive technology, you don't need to worry about all the requirements in the in polling place to get at these very specific kind of individuals. Um, so, so, so if you give them different paths for voting, or if they can bring their ballot in with a barcode, they've already pre-marked it, they just submit it, um, you can then address, so we're trying to make the umbrella of, of voters that we can cover as, as big as possible um, with the universal design in the polling place and some minimal assistive technology that covers the, enough folks that will use that technology plus some alternative modes. Um, so I think that's how to approach the problem and I think that uh, some guidance will help. Yeah, two, two things real quick on that. One is, and I, I think Diane uh, said it well, and that is because we've seen this challenge in our current testing program. This is not a new challenge to us. It's something we've talked with Diane a lot. So one of our commitments uh, when we looked at the uh, charter uh, and the uh, EAC VVSG working group is some sort of uh, education uh, effort behind the VVSG, that, that once the VVSG is approved, the EAC is going to uh, endeavor with others to, to help educate on what it means and impact. Th this is where bridging that gap between the vendors and some of your folks uh, would come in. Uh, so that, and the test labs, by the way, and the test labs, so that we can begin to uh, tackle the, the complex nature of this challenge and, and make the testing better uh, and improve the systems because the manufacturers want to do this better. I don't think it's a lack of desire. Uh, it's just a, uh, it's a real challenge, as you said. So I think that'll be part of the, the VVSG education push on our end. The other, I want to highlight the middle bullet, the voting system meets currently accepted federal standards uh, for accessibility, only to make the point, as we talked about, the, the principles and guidelines versus requirements, this is one of the areas of flexibility that we give ourselves by doing this way. And one of the things you all as a group had told us is that you want to incorporate current standards for things and allow that to continue uh, to be used as opposed to being locked in to you know version G and, and not being able to update it, right? And so this is one of the ways, this is one of the areas I guess that we did that or, or uh, the folks working on this did that. And that's the flexibility you get with the requirements being able to be more readily updated uh, and reflect new standards and new technology uh, in that way. So I, I wanted to highlight it because it's a good example of that. Quick question, Chair. Uh, at your last point, uh, wide range of representative voters and poll workers, at this point the accessibility options for poll workers has been more limited um, than what we do for voters. Is the intent on this that the poll workers will, the poll worker interfaces will have the same level of interface and accessibility as the voter? That's, uh, according to HAVA, poll workers are not included. It's, it's the voter. Um, I think we need to recognize that the, the poll working poll worker population is an aging population, so you want good contrast, just like, you know, for everyone, a large enough font, et cetera. But there's, we don't envision writing requirements for the kind of accessibility, for accessibility, only, you know. So use, um, so universal design. So for example, if there's an error message that comes up that the poll worker needs to read, it needs to be readable by typical poll workers. Right, but it doesn't need to be audible, for example. No. Or audible. That's that's not okay. the view, I, and I don't believe, but I'm not, I don't have legal expertise that there's any legal requirement to provide that. Be a, it would be an ADA issue on the uh, election official side, since they're all going to be public. It would be a, a question of a reasonable accommodation. Can the poll worker do the essential functions of the job of poll worker? Anyway, you know, yeah. So, so there are provisions for that, and the expectation would be that 
if there's a way to make an accommodation and or add on assistive technology to do that then you know yeah but that would be taken care of outside of these standards that's going to be an ADA implementation issue on the election official side I, I simply bring it up because it is set up in that doc in that statement as equivalent and can be taken as such uh, yeah so it's it's just a uh, measurement so I guess we weren't clear most of this is for the voter do we need to make this clear that also for anything the poll worker sees it's got to be use, usable uh, you know we didn't make this distinction in the guidelines um, I, you know I'm okay with that but it's going to be how the requirements are written and yeah. This is going to inform the requirements, and so depending on how people want to interpret what we write here. Yeah, we didn't specifically say which part, it, everything should be usable, which parts are accessible. Right, because so, for, for the voter, we have to change for every voter, and we have to reset for every voter. Are we resetting for every poll worker? What do we, the, the, it can, it can get, uh, if they, if one poll worker needs high contrast, but the other one doesn't, how do we create the, uh, easy and, and, and there's a and, lot and that could go sideways and and then and then it's getting in my opinion way too complex to get a good system right put together uh, we uh, we could add to the wording representative voters I, for both usable usability and accessibility I, and yeah, poll workers yeah, for usability I I'm on the fly I hate to Smith so but that might be one way to make that clear so make what, what, what I'm hearing is that maybe maybe we should break it out and or no yeah. I think that might be a, a wise decision mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I will yeah. so it, it could be done and, yeah it could be well we'll come back and revisit these yeah. at, you know at, at the end but uh, I've, I've noted it and you know mm -hmm. certainly it could be solved in a number of ways either by wordsmithing that that current guideline or or creating two separate guidelines or whatever makes the most I, sense I, I would recommend this is Laurie Gino I would recommend that we strike point taken that we strike poll workers in that third bullet because we do address the ease of use in principle one high quality design yeah, we don't call out poll workers specifically so uh, well in the third bullet we're tr we want to test and we actually have a protocol for for poll worker usability testing and those there is specific requirements covering this in the VVSG 1.1 so I have to think where would we put those requirements for poll workers then? So Lori, just for yeah. reference, Lori's referencing principle number two, high quality implementation. The voting system is implemented using high quality best practices. 2.2, the voting system is implemented using best practice user-centered design methods for a wide re range of representative voters and poll workers, including those with and without disabilities. Okay. So I think Lori's suggestion correct me if I'm wrong is 2.2 .2 covers it doesn't cover the um, so this last bullet was the summative usability test it only covers the user-centered design process although if you do a good user-centered design process you will in principle be usable for poll workers so I, I see that this adds a little extra in terms of an, an end user test for poll workers measuring effectiveness efficiency and satisfaction so, so I'm just thinking yeah. in terms of, uh, this is Lori Agino, in the um, desire to keep these reduced rather than create more principles and to con ensure that we're um, mm -hmm. somewhat concise, are we being redundant by having it in the robust, safe, usable, and accessible as well as the high quality implementation? And is there a way that we can pull in that yeah, component? Yeah, it's, it's getting at two, two. two slightly different ways of testing. One is in your design process, you count for poll workers. In this particular guideline, it's calling out doing this test at the end. So I, I, I think um, this is Mary Brady. Uh, why don't we table it until after we mm -hmm. discuss the high quality implementation? Mm -hmm. And then yep. you know, and then we can revisit. It, uh. Okay, so that actually goes to my my next point to transition to the next slide. This last test is this last guideline that we've been discussing is actually based on what's currently in VVSG 1.1. 1. 1. 
However, um, if you haven't designed with your users in mind from the beginning, doing a test at the end is like forgetting the flour in your cake and trying to add it in when the cake's already baked. Um, so that's why under high quality implementation, which uh, uh, Ben will be talking about, um, we added a guideline that says that best practice user-centered design methods for a wide range of representative vo vo voters and poll workers in, um, um, is implemented, in, including those with and without disabilities. Um, and since we first wrote these requirements, actually starting in 1.1 for the, the, the ones you just saw, there's now a whole family of um, reporting formats, um, not just the one for summative usability testing, but for user-centered design methods. Um, um, and reflecting best practice, so there's a lot of tools and guidance out there now for this. Um, and really, if you do your user-centered design properly in your development, um, everything should fall out uh, at the end. And it's not a full-blown lots of different representative users in a user-centered design methodology. You typically start off with um, checklists perhaps. You may start out with um, expert users uh, who know a lot about accessibility. You might add a few people who are expert with a disability looking for problems so you can fix them in your design. Presumably you're iterating through your design. So a lot of these user-centered design methods are relatively low, low cost and part of best practice across the, the IT industry. I, I think that's a great point, Chair, and I, I think, uh, you know, maybe there, there are some resources that we should make available, you know, as uh, immediately to the implementation and testing group so, so you, you have uh, ready access uh, to, uh, to these resources. Right, and I think it also needs to be, the labs need to be part of that discussion because it is entirely possible that the experts and these user testing designs will come up with a recommendation that is then somehow in conflict with the judgment of the labs as how they interpret the standard. Um, so making sure that that does not occur is a very important because I don't want to get feedback from one side and then say you don't pass the requirement on the other. Judd. And, and that, oh, sorry. that could happen. Judd. Would you mind going back to the last slide? So one issue, and I know it's an, a term of art, but the use of the word users in the principle, are you, do you mean voters? Or should we be using the word voters instead of users? So accessible experience for all voters instead of users? We, 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 could, we could edit that. Um, <coughs> was covering, you know, poll workers and mm -hmm. voters. Seems um, like that would be a harder thing to test to if we were that broad. We were tr principles were kind of more generic, so that's why we use the word, but I mean, I, I don't think it necessarily hurts to, to be a little more specific. I'm trying to think, are there other, well, election officials, I suppose, could be other users, and if, if you're, uh, if you're going to look at uh, software for setting up the ballot, et cetera, you'd want those aren't poll workers. Those are there are other users. I'll I'll let uh, some of our election officials uh, chime in, perhaps, on this. Depends on the scope of what you're applying some of these to. But um, this is Lori Agino. I think the intent of this was to roll up robust, safe, usable, and accessible to capture all of those people that uh, all of us that might be using the system yeah and I think we've identified that challenge is some of those principles will apply to voters some will apply to election officials some could apply to a poll worker um, could apply to the public in general so therein lies I think the challenge yeah I think mm -hmm. I think that's right I, I think uh, we don't want a system uh, that is harmful to election officials, although some may want a system that is harmful to election officials, right? Uh, and so that's why it says users, right? Uh, 
Uh, but your point's well taken, so we can we can cover that. But I think that was the point of the higher level yeah. uh, principle saying all users that way, including the poll workers too. You want it safe for poll workers too, uh, which would call into question how heavy the systems are, I think. But go ahead. Yeah, and, and I've been doing the same thing. I've been trying to figure out, okay, is this is a merge it over here or split it apart? And, and the challenge, quite frankly, is the accessible piece. The robust, safe, and usable, I think, you're okay at a user level and whether that's election officials or poll workers or whomever the problem is there's a different legal standard for accessibility when you're talking about a, a voter directly interacting with and marking verifying and casting a ballot than everybody else interacting and there's a different level of access different tip, different, actually yeah. a different legal requirement period and that's where the challenge is trying to and I was thinking okay do you pull accessible out of the stem and I, I don't but there's that's the challenge is it implying that then the VVSG is going to have a whole set of accessibility standards for people beyond voters which it's not so and I yeah. think this is Bob Jones. I think my concern with that is because in 8.2 you say the voting system meets currently acceptable federal standards for accessibility. And if we're going to try to apply that, apply that to board workers and election officials, I think that's where, that's where it starts. You know, somebody could make that leap and say, well, you said the federal standards, so that means everybody who touches the system. I think that's where we need to be clear. Yeah, and, and that's af actually referencing, you know, general web accessibility standards or general document accessibility, not the actual voting system. So, yeah, somehow there's some clarification we got to work on. But anyway. Yeah, I, I, I hate to pull out accessible completely, right, because you want it can be accessible, not usable by people that need the accessibility. So it's it's hard to pull apart. And it's... Uh, we, we can revisit it this afternoon. Yeah. We'll take a look. All of us can take a look yeah. uh, at, at a proposed uh, change uh, if necessary. M Go might ahead. be able to do it by rejiggering the guidelines underneath it to, to be more specific. Yep. That, that might be the most elegant way to do it. Okay. Uh, before I talk about uh, privacy, um, when we pull these together, the, the, our security folks and the human factors folks said, well, if we, we've, we've got overlap with ballot secrecy and privacy and we really need, and we don't, so I said, well, okay, what's our definition? And we didn't even have a working definition of what we mean by privacy and ballot secrecy. So in order to, to pull these, uh, these notions apart and really understand them, to understand, to make sure we don't have redundancy, but we're covering everything we need to cover, we have a working definition of uh, privacy and ballot secrecy. So we make a distinction between the privacy of the interaction between the voter, that is if you're at the voting system as uh, you want a privacy screen, you don't want um, uh, mm -hmm. your vote announced, your choices announced out loud, um, um, you want to be able to, 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 to mark it independently so you have your privacy. Um, <laughs> But there's also the secrecy once the ballot has been marked to keep that ballot and secret from who, so that no one can determine how a, vo a specific voter marked their ballot. So voter, so our working definition is that voter privacy is primarily concerned with what happens while a voter is marking and casting their ballot, right? So so they can mark it without revealing their ballot selections. Um, and also, a voting system should not record how a specific voter interacted with the ballot. So often we don't have too many folks using the accessible system, so you don't want to mark, oh, audio was used, so it's clear that audio was used, we only had one blind voter uh, this morning, so you can reveal their vote. Um, ballot secrecy is primarily concerned with what happens after a voter casts their ballot. So the voting system must not create or store any link between a specific voter's identity and a set of specific ballot selections. Um, so with that intro, I'm going to talk about privacy, uh, pri the privacy principle, and then our security folks, I believe Josh and Gemma, are, will talk about the ballot secrecy principle. So voter privacy is that voters can mark their ballot and verify and cast their vote selections privately and independently. 
So that means that the voting process preserves that privacy of the voters' interaction with the ballot, the modes of voting, and the vote selections. And the voter can mark their ballot and verify and cast their vote selections and other associated cast vote record without assistance from others. That's this whole independence uh, criteria as called out in HAVA. So are there any questions uh, about this? So we, we found that de the definition useful in, in making these distinctions and where to place the different uh, uh, requirements underneath it. Lori. I, on our copy that we have in front of us, I think this one was the one that was in the packet, there's a punctuation, some funky punctuation happening. Um, we didn't hire yeah. you to be a proofreader, the, Lori. There, uh -huh. there, there were two sets of typos. There's, okay. uh, so the, 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 the comma situation, so what I put down here was my correction of the typo. Right, punctuation, not proofing, but punctuation could lead to a difference. Yes, gotcha. Yeah. Go yeah. for it. Principle. Go for it. <laughs> it was corrected on my uh, my slide. If you're if you're happy with that the correction. So so we need to update the document to reflect Sharon's slide. Got it. Done. Uh, Thank you, Lori. This is uh, Greg Riddlemoser. The um, first bullet, third word. Uh, very seldom in here do we talk about anything other than voting systems, um, and not to quibble, but voting process obviously uh, can be argued to be everything from voter registration all the way through to the sticker lady um, and the 364 days that happened in between. So uh, my recommendation, and not to wordsmith this because building PowerPoints by committee or speech writing or this with lots of people involved gets real cumbersome real quick, but I think that this is a distinction that needs to be made. I, 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 I do think that the, princ the principle limits it to the, the, the marking, verify, and casting. So the sub-bullet guideline, I think, inherits um, that, but it's, it's the, the, the process of, of how the, the voting system is, can be set up to preserve the privacy. So I, I, that's my view of how it's scoped. Good. Anyone else? Okay, I've al and so I've already um, talked about uh, a little bit about transparency and the user-centered design uh, process that you'll hear in, in other talks. So that concludes the human factors portion. Uh, any final questions? And I, I do really have to give big kudos to the public working group. They really have been amazing. Uh, quick question: Why did we you choose the words voter secret or? Vote ballot secrecy rather than ballot anonymity because the contents of the ballot are actually not secret once they have left the voters hands as long as it's not traced back to the okay voter. so I, I was searching for definitions and it seems that voter privacy and ballot secrecy are kind of used interchangeably and those seem to be what the terms are and and there's various definitions floating around um, and I didn't see nor did our security people, you know, folks uh, uh, see that term specifically at the high definitional level. So, uh, I think I read this applies to ballot secrecy. Yes. And we'll yeah. come back to it after lunch. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, I'll make note of it in the notes for uh, the ballot secrecy yeah. principle. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I could see that going into uh, uh, that anonymity being used at the requirements level for sure, for certain. I, I think part of it was to, not to take Sharon's words, but uh, a, a use of plain language to try to make it understandable and consistent with, with other language out there, but we'll explore it with the uh, security folks uh, this afternoon. Good. Sharon, I want to thank you, uh, and I know I've done this at a prior meeting. You uh, and Diane and your working group led this charge uh, on this VVSG 2.0. You all kind of set the pace out in front. Uh, with the amount of work and you continue to with your requirements work and it's very much appreciated uh, you all have been leaders 
uh, in, in setting the pace and, and work. And, and I so, have to recognize the team behind us. It, though. Well, it's been yeah, phenomenal. Yeah, the entire team uh, and, and the, the work from Center for Civic Design, obviously, uh, helping drive this as well. But you all did yeoman's work and really uh, kind of shamed the other working groups into pushing forward. So, uh, no, you, we inspired them. <laughs> yeah, inspired. That's what it is, inspired. <laughs> Uh, okay, Sharon, thank you. Uh, again, the process so that we understand it, we'll go through the, the other ones. We'll continue to take notes on your suggested, and then we'll revisit them all uh, this afternoon. Uh, so anyone that thought this meeting wouldn't be a grind uh, is kidding themselves, but that's exactly what we're here to do. Uh, it is lunchtime, uh, so we will break for an hour, which will bring us back uh, at 1.15, 1 1.20. 1 uh, there are a variety of restaurants all around here. Uh, so it's kind of choose your own adventure uh, as far as everything from Chinese to pizza to McDonald's, uh, you name it. Uh, so just be back in an hour so we can continue. One fifteen.
Attention. That we can hook you up on. Because uh, Nepalese go, is Indian food, as far as I'm concerned. Right. That's and, and it's broadly amazing. Nepalese. You and I should go like, for lunch. You're here for the DHS meeting. I'm here for the DHS meeting. We We're going to find time to go. Sold. It's, it's delicious. It's First of all, <laughs> vegetarian. Second of all, Indian Nepalese. Sold, sold. I know. Fantastic. Oh. All right, we're going to uh, go ahead and get started. I know uh, Bob will be with us in a minute. <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, thank you for a good, productive morning. Uh, I think uh, we moved forward and did what we needed to do with the human factors. I appreciated uh, the, the NIST uh, staff and their work. Next, we're going to do uh, the cybersecurity principles and guidelines. Uh, and before we get into that, I do want to remind myself and you all, as we look at these, just remember that these are meant to be high-level principles and guidelines. So to the extent that there is a lack of precision in certain language, it's in part intentional because these are principles and guidelines. Uh, so just keeping that in mind, not you should still offer your comments, uh, and but remember what the, the goal here is on these. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over first. Uh, Josh Franklin, 
uh, from uh, NIST Cybersecurity Division uh, and Gemma Howell are here. Uh, we appreciate you both being here. Josh has been through this ringer on both the EAC side and the NIST side. Gemma, this is your first time, and so I wish you the best of luck with whatever's <laughs> about to happen uh, with this. So with that, I'll turn it over to you all, and welcome. Thank you for being here and your work on these. Thank you. Um, yeah, this, my name is Gemma Howell, and I'm new to the NIST voting team. Um, and yeah, this is my first time here at a TGDC meeting. Um, I'm excited, and it's really nice to put some names um, to faces. Um, but yeah, look forward to this experience. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah, and uh, and uh, my name is Joshua Franklin, and I lead the uh, the NIST voting project. Uh, sorry, the NIST uh, Voting Security <laughs> Project. Mary Brady, my boss, <laughs> leads the voting project. A little bit of nerves. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Makes her real. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so we have seven cyber su security uh, voting system principles here um, ballot, secrecy, auditability, access, control, physical. Su Security, data protection system, integrity, and detection and monitoring. Um, we we arrived at this um, uh, at this list by you know basically looking at the previous uh, you know sections within the 2015 BVSG and then the 2007 recommendations to the TGDC. Um, and I'm gonna uh, basically go over uh, each of these with with uh, Gemma and so please ask any and all questions so ballot secrecy um, as as Sharon previously stated um, voter privacy and ballot secrecy were were basically split in in previous iterations of the BVSG they were uh, they were basically all uh, you know all of the ballot secrecy re requirements and all of the voter privacy requirements were all basically within section three. Um, and so this is a whole new area essentially. And so this is, you know, these are the, you know, first dedicated, um, you know, principles and guidelines and will be, you know, the first re, the first requirements as well, uh, uh, dedicated to ballot secrecy. Um, there is a question earlier you know, uh, about ballot, uh, what was it? Anonymity. There we go, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that was that was definitely brought up uh, within the Cybersecurity uh, Working Group. Um, and that was, you know, uh, essentially thought to be, you know, a, a, a very low level concept um, that we could basically uh, enumerate within the, you know, um, re, re, requirements uh, ballot secrecy would be something that you know everyone would be more f f familiar with I mean I'd be interested to know you know if you have any misgivings there and uh, McDermott go, go ahead yeah, yeah. I, I do have a penchant for uh, specificity in language sure, sure and because the ballots are not secret once they leave the voters hands they are public domain at that point um, once they as long as they cannot be tied back to a specific voter they their contents are are open and so that's why the concept of anonymity I thought was more specific but if the consensus is that the the concept of secrecy is more effective and and plain language as Whitney would say um, I'm perfectly willing to accept that I'm just I'm just worried about the other things that can be lumped into the secrecy word. Okay, okay. I mean, and so what we mean, you know, by that secrecy word is is encapsulated here w within this principle and can, guideline. Can you make I sure mean, you use the mic? I'm sorry, just oh, so everyone can hear you. Sure, definitely. Uh, yeah. So what we what we mean by the you know by the term secrecy here is is encapsulated within this principle. Um, uh, and so, you know, it, it really seems to be uh, about, um, you know, making sure that, you know, there is no linkage be between a, a, a individual voter and then 
uh, you know, their, their, their ballot after it was cast. Okay. Does, right. Yeah, go ahead, Neil. Sorry, and I, and I know Sharon earlier defined that first bullet as being primarily when after the ballot has been cast is, is what primarily that bullet encapsulates, Ballots. right? Yeah. Ballots. Um, but the reality is that a voter, let's say they're casting a paper ballot in a polling place, the moment that they are turning that, that chain of custody over to the poll worker, that starts that process, right? So it's, it's right. actually in the voting process. So my question is, is that defined later in definitions or, for instance, from the moment you hand over your ballot until it's destroyed 22 months later and it's shredded, hmm. that that is maintained throughout that process? I think it's a great concept that we should capture within our ballot secrecy definition. Okay, so at the, in, in the definition portion. Yes, yeah. sir. Okay. That, that's actually a really good concept. Um, one other comment about the bottom bullet. I mean, that, that is not an absolute. There are state statutes that do require a ID to be attached to the ballot record such that it can be retracted in certain specific situations. That is also a great point. And this is something that the, that the Cyber Security Working Group list sort of lit up over, I would say. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. And there was, um, honestly, there was, uh, you know, this was, this was, you know, one of those areas where there was not necessarily a, a, a clean meeting of the, uh, you know, of the uh, minds, um, uh, and what the actual working group, you know, thought was that we will, um, you know, we will put this into the requirements, sorry, into the, uh, you know, principles and guidelines, and if it needs to be modified later by, you know, groups such as this and, you know, other, you know, boards, then, you know, that can be, you know, modified as such, but this, you know, this was basically thought to be, um, you know, really, uh, you know, stringent towards removing that, you know, linkage be, be between an, an, an individual voter's identity and their ballot. Um, the way this is typically handled is that while there is a linkage between the actual ballot and the, um, and the voter for the purposes of retraction, there is no interface whereby they can actually view the contents of the ballot. But okay. that's splitting a fairly fine hair in this particular regard. regard. Sure. I mean, uh, do you have any mod uh, modifications that you would that you would like to see? Again, the off-the-cuff wordsmithing is probably not a good idea right here. I think it should just be noted that this is a potential area where state rules will conflict with the VVSG and its testing. Could conflict, right. Anything else on that? Go ahead, Dave. Uh, Dave Wagner. Josh, you could probably comment on this better than I can, but I, I believe there was a comment from the working group that it, that at least some people wanted to see that, say, instead of produce, um, say, produce or contain. That so I just wanted to flag that as one that came up, I guess, maybe late two weeks ago. So that might have been fairly late in the game. Uh, Gary Brady, yes, I, that, that did come up. Uh, we uh, we hopped on the phone with uh, a member of the working group to fully understand, you know, where. Uh, what the comment was about, and we, we have it noted for it to hopefully be resolved as part of the, the comment process. Yeah, so there were a variety, not just from the, the cybersecurity working group, but a number of comments, because the working group's work continued in each one uh, that we can use to inform both in the, the Standards Board Board of Advisors process as well as the open public comment process. So that will be captured and reflected in public comments so that everyone uh, has that as we look at the document. Uh, and it, you, you're welcome to raise it as a TGD. If you feel that's a change you'd like to see, you can raise that here now uh, as well. And if you could, you just repeat the words that it was contained. Uh, it was, I, I those, believe those the those suggestion not, was to replace produce with produce or contain. I think that's right. Yes, Is that correct? Yeah. Indeed. Go ahead, Josh. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. This this basically shows what the 
ballot secrecy requirements looked at in the 2015 BVSG 1.1. Really, they were inside of the the voter privacy section, but they were also sort of splintered about um, through other parts of the 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 BVSG as well. And so the 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 hope going forward is that there will be a dedicated section to ballot secrecy. Moving on to audit auditability. Um, auditability, the voting system is auditable and enables evidence-based elections. Uh, that is the overarching principle here. The first guideline here is uh, essentially software inde independence. Um, the you know which is the concept that was discussed earlier uh, between uh, David and Diane uh, the the second guideline here is basically making sure um, that there is uh, that basically records a, a exist to identify any any root cause of of any irregularities that that basically happen with the voting system. The, the third bullet is basically making sure that uh, voting system records can basically uh, you know, maintain in, 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 in integrity, they can be re, re, resilient in you know, f you know, forms of uh, uh, tampering. And then the fourth guideline here is basically so, supporting e e efficient audits and uh, here e e efficient audits means e essentially usable audits uh, you know post po uh, post election audits that are you know basically built into the voting system by by default that are very very easy for for uh, election officials to actually run um, I might suggest that in that case you you, you say usable audits. Oh, okay, yeah, we, that's that's definitely a fair comment. We were we were trying to you know not uh, not step on the uh, human factors group mm. toes, but uh, I could definitely see that being uh, a more plain language way of, no, of I'd, going there. I'd hate to have the have somebody come and judge efficiency. Um, and, and I realize this is probably getting at a lower level than we want to get to here, but could you just give me a brief use case on your first point? On? An undetected error or fault in the voting system cannot cause an undetectable change in election results. While I completely agree with that, I'm trying to figure out how we would test it. I realize, And I realize this is a sure. much higher level, but that one that one concerns me. <laughs> or, <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's that's a that's a very uh, a very reasonable point there. Um, yeah, so you know, testing s software in in independence is definitely going to be interesting, and it's basically going to be entirely new new ground. Um, uh, the actual software in independence uh, paper basically gives different classes of of voting systems that would be uh, software ind independent and then classes of, of uh, voting systems that would be software dependent. Um, I think writing requirements for that is going to be difficult. Sorry. You gave me an eyebrow. Sorry. Oh. Oh, oh. Dave. No, I, I agree. It's, uh, I'm trying to, trying to parse that one. Okay. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's basically if the if the actual voting system it is is hacked into uh, that that you know there will be some you know sort of record that will be auditable in in the end. Yeah. Did you have something to add, Dave? Yeah, David Wagner. I can I can add to the the path we in, we envision to how to make that testable. Okay. Um, as you say, it sounds hard to test because it's a high level technology neutral requirement. And so this ties into the discussion I raised this morning about we envision there's two paths to achieving that. One path is through the paper-based systems, and then we can write some set of requirements for that. That's one way to meet the requirement. Another path is the cryptographic end-to-end -end systems. That provides an alternate path, which we will 
be working on writing requirements for. Mm -hmm. So I understand it looks very abstract, but I think that when we start to look at ways to meet it, then we can provide multiple ways and provide requirements for each of those ways. Okay. Good. Thank you. I have, uh, Lori Agino, I have two comments. One is um, when I'm reading through the titles of the principles, perhaps we might, might want to consider changing this to auditable instead of auditability. Okay. Uh, I've got it, found a couple other uh, principles where we might want to make those tense adjustments. Okay. And then also in your first, in 9.1, that first bullet, it's like we say undetected, cannot, and then undetectable. I, is there a maybe more in, can we f uh, maybe that's just the the right way or the correct way in the industry that software independence is um, identified in a bullet but it feels like we could maybe flip that and phrase it in the positive and I don't have a recommendation I, I don't want to shoot from the hip and and goof that up but if there is something that we can do to phrase that more in the positive it feels like we could it's just a little bit confusing to oh, to sick. read from a plain talked perspective I think that's a great comment. Um, so we essentially lifted this definition from the you know, software ind independence paper and then modified it a little bit based on um, basically input from the working group. But I think re rewriting it in a in a in a positive manner can definitely be done. Um, yeah. Would it be good enough to just uh, say, well, it, maybe we shouldn't wordsmith right here on, on the fly, but. I like to make things happen. <laughs> An undetected error or fault in the voting system, software or hardware will be detectable. Will or is will or is or generates a detectable change in election results? No, some, I mean, that's something what like you're that, thinking. Right? Something like that. Okay. Well, why don't we, Diana? I'm going to get to you, but mm -hmm. we'll take a look at that with the the idea uh, of seeing if there's a way to what phrase it more positively uh, or out of the negative the double negative uh, zone uh, with the understanding of what what the goal was and, and keeping in mind also uh, of the ones to update or change this may be the hardest because it's an understood definition that's existed for a little while that doesn't mean we shouldn't try uh, but just just with that understanding Diane go ahead yeah and I was just gonna echo it's there's a whole lot of negatives it's undetected error and cannot and undetectable I mean, it's like yeah. y you know it's almost like okay well that negated that well now that negated it again it's it's a very um, awkward wording and and I know you took it from someplace else um, and I and my statement here is is kind of back to the you know these are high-level principles and we don't have the requirements but I think the differences in interpretation, in addition to the multiple negatives making it complex, I think the differences in what this means are uh, vast. Okay. In, in what this means to you versus what it means to someone else versus what it means, and, and just because I've been around so long, I mean, there are people who, yeah, on from from my world, that means for verification, you can't use the same software and the same machine to verify as you use to generate because it has to be software independent, so you've got to go hustle a paper ballot to a separate piece of equipment. I mean, if we get into that kind of, you know, accessibility has gone down the toilet again. Sure. And, and that's the, the, yeah, the concern with this has been around a while and has been e e either just interpreted in so many different ways to different people or it's um, yeah I, so I guess that's the and and I realize this will come down to the requirements and dealing with the specifics but I it, to if there's any way to clean up the wording here so it's less uh, ambiguous that would be really good so. Yeah, maybe we should run all the software independence re requirements by the human factors group to basically make sure that a situation like that doesn't, you know, doesn't arise. Um, well, let's not go too far down that road too fast. Uh, Greg okay. Riddlemulzer here. <laughs> if, if you change the negatives to a positive, here's what you get. An undetected error fault in the voting system must cause a detectable change in results. That is not the outcome any of us are looking for. Okay? <laughs> So this, this speaks perfectly plainly to me because if it was a detected fault, 
that caused a detectable change in results, then we have the obvious duh. We don't even need to write specs uh, to find those kind of things because that's the kind of stuff that election systems are supposed to prevent. So let's not spend any time rewordsmithing something that is an industry standard uh, sentence, if you will, because we can't make it sound positive. It's a very negative thing. And we undetected, 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 that's the thing that we're trying to accomplish is the whole undetectable stuff. I mean, that's why it's in the audit section. Maybe, uh, maybe a way of, of uh, addressing this is to simply say the voting system is software, indi indi you know, software independent, um, and then we just define software independence later. It definitely would, would make it, I think, more plain language. Um, this is just a, de a decision that the cyber security working group made to, you know, put the actual de uh, definition here versus just saying thou shalt have this capability. Neil, Mr. Chairman, you might already you might know this, but that second bullet there is that language from 1.0, or is there similar language in 1.0? The from the first bullet, yeah, the from the second, second bullet. I'm sorry, uh, let me read it. I do not believe that is in VVSG. It, it, is that in 1.0? It might be. The answer is I don't know. Okay, fair enough. Well, the reason <laughs> we can look. The, the reason I'm asking is because the way that that's worded right now is you, you could have a manufacturer, in essence, that would have the data that would have to be extracted by the manufacturer for the election official, right? Yeah. And and that exists today in in some systems. So that that's my only concern with with bullet number two. Yeah, thinking thinking back to the to the VBSG, I'm not sure if it's if it's actually in the the actual VBSG 2015 1.1 right right now. Uh, do you do you have any thoughts on how we should change it? I think that's a that's well, I don't a want to words very reasonable words comment. Uh, no, I I, I, was, I was just gonna say I, I mean in, in, in short, I mean if you okay. still have an issue uh, after my comments, then please uh, mm -hmm. chime in. But um, I wonder if when we get to interoperability. That uh, some of um, some of the principles and guidelines associated with interoperability might address your concern, where the the data has to be available for reporting. Okay. It, to, it, you know, and it, through the use of the common data format. If, if that takes it's, care of that, then yes, yeah. it would. Yeah. So let's so let's, okay. let's uh, we'll mark that, and, and then we'll, we'll revisit it with the, com uh, the interoperability uh, conversation. The other thing I would propose or suggest. Uh, to tease out this conversation around software independence, definitionally, some of the challenges is that in the requirements development process that the Human Factors Working Group and the Cybersecurity Working Group, you're welcome, uh, write a joint white paper defining it. So work together to, to co-define uh, the requirements around this and, and uh, what it means. Uh, this is uh, well. This is Bob Giles. I, Bob Giles. I do have one concern. We're, we're we're kind of throwing out a couple times now, where we'll define things or clarify things in the definitions, but we're going to be asked to vote on something before the definitions are out there. And I do have a concern that we won't be voting on the requirements. We're not required to vote on the requirements later, and and so there there is that concern that we're going to be punting some of this to to a, a time that we're not voting on it. So I do have that concern. Okay. Uh, quick question, Justice. Is, is that first undetected actually required? At this point, the real key on this one is to make sure that there is no undetectable change in election results, regardless of, co of cause. Uh, you know, wordsmithing on the fly. I <laughs> right back at you. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, that, that's a uh, well, Does that help? Does it make it clear? An error or fault in the voting system software or hardware cannot cause an undetectable change in election results. David. Laurie. Sorry. I mean, you brought it up. It, so the the proposed or suggested language, uh, an error or fault in the voting system software or hardware cannot cause an undetectable change in election results. So we remove one of the negatives. We'll take it down and we'll reflect on it. We'll muse, <laughs> as it were, and come back to it. And so you know, I, I was going to wait on this. I, I hate to ruin my teaser, 
Uh, I know you all are on the edge of your seat. But when we come back to revisit these, I propose we, t we look at them in three categories, essentially. Accept it, say, yeah, that, that change makes sense to us. Let's go ahead and do it. Reject it, no thank you. Uh, we think we can move forward. And then put it in the bucket of for public comment. So there's an option to say, we're not sure what we want to do with this yet. Let's put it in the public comments bucket uh, so that it's reflected. So it's a comment that someone in this group, so if this group couldn't reach a consensus, but someone feels it's important, it's reflected in the public comments as part of the public comment period, both for the Board of Advisors Standards Board and the 90-day public comment that Brian Hancock you know, shared, so that someone, an individual TGDC member's views are reflected as part of the public comment if, they can't, if we, you, the group can't reach agreement on that particular change. Does that make sense? So ensuring that someone's comment is captured uh, in that way. So something to think about, pondering faces on that too. Josh, just go. Excellent. Uh, this is what the state of auditability uh, is in, in VVSG 1.1. .1. Uh, this was basically not an area, and so this is a whole new section. It's a, it's a, sig, it, it's a significant update. Um, there are some auditability re, requirements sort of strewn about uh, VVSG 1.1, .1, but this would sort of be a... Um, you know, a, a whole new section, if you, if you will. Onward, access con control. Um, I'm gonna start with this slide because I think it's a better way to, to, to go now. Um, so access control, uh, this is, uh, there were some access control re re requirements in the VVSG 1.1. I would say overall, we were just mostly simplifying uh, the actual concepts uh, taken here, um, the 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 big update is basically the need for multi-factor authentic authentication for critical elections operations. Um, that could that could definitely be something that you know ruffles feathers. Um, as for the requirements themselves, um, the the. The principal states, the voting system authenticates administrators, users, devices, and services before granting access to sensitive functions. Um, I would say that uh, bullet three um, and bullet four are the only new areas here. Most of this is contained within previous versions of the, the, uh, the uh, VVSG. Other, other, other than that one multi-factor multi concept, I don't think there's 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 much new here. Comments on that? Go. <laughs> Talk to me. <laughs> McDermott Coots again, sorry. Um, so again, it, it comes down to uh, ease of use. Uh, especially in as the thing that the uh, election officials will talk to you is about the poll workers. And if we have to do multi-factor authentication on the devices in the poll location that is anything more complex than a simple password, we're going to have pushback um, from the users. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm simply saying there will be pushback. Uh, this is Judd from Colorado. You won't get pushback from Colorado election officials because we use it currently for all of our systems. Uh, you won't get pushback from Washington State election officials. <laughs> Boop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting bold. At, at least some sector of your uh, customer base is telling you it looks good, uh, but uh, we'll see what the rest say. That's why we have a standards board. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, I've. I've, you know, definitely seen uh, for myself how, you know, new auth uh, authentication re requirements can basically cause problems for for uh, uh, users. So, um, I guess the big thing here would be defining what a critical election operation would would uh, uh, be, and that's not that's not listed here. Go ahead. Excellent. So f physical security, I'm going to pass that one over. All right, physical. 
physical security, um, we didn't find uh, any large changes here. Physical security was pretty well covered um, in 1.1. Um, these are just a few of the sections that we uh, found notes on physical security. And then the principle uh, for physical security is the voting system prevents or detects attempts to tamper with voting system hardware. Uh, and the two, we have our two guidelines uh, that any unauthorized physical access to the voting system, ballot box ballots or other hardware leaves physical evidence of some sort. And the voting system only exposes physical ports and access points that are essential to voting operations testing or auditing. Any thoughts? Um, it's vague, bullet number one. I'm just curious, how would you define physical evidence? I mean, what, it, it, the ballot box, hmm. uh, a seal being broken, uh, or if you're looking at ballots, how are you detecting physical evidence that a ballot's been tampered with if it's paper? Um, I think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Josh respond as well, but I, I'm thinking that that would be something we'd maybe define a little more in the requirements, but I'll yeah. just give his, his thoughts. Uh, I mean, I mean, seals were, you know, definitely something that, that, uh, that, the, that the working group was thinking about when writing that you know that that guideline um, you know basically putting uh, you know seals on uh, uh, ballot bags making sure that you know a voting systems chassis is actually made to have a seal put on it or you know some sort of tamper de detection mechanism just to follow up on that Bob Giles are you saying you it just has to have the ability to receive a seal and you're not going to get into the actual types of seals that that may be on a system uh, yes to your first to your first point I'm not sure on your second point um, I wouldn't I wouldn't think that we would actually be be talking about types of seals though um, that would be that would uh, surprise me if the if the working group really wanted to get into that. It's never been done be before, to my knowledge. Uh, I have a question. The definition that you have on this screen is different from our draft. Um, are we proposing the definition on the screen, or the bullet, not de definition, but bullet on the screen, um, unless I missed something, 12.1 um, is different than what you have. Yes, 12.1 mm -hmm. is different than the um, bullet that you have on the screen. The one that you have on the screen is more robust. Okay. Interesting. Uh, sorry for that error. Uh, so this is what the, uh, the uh, oh, sorry, what's on the screen currently is what the cyber working group uh, uh, came up with. And I'm sorry for any omissions there. Um, I, I think uh, there was some dis some discussion that the, that the ballot box ballots or other hardware might be outside the the uh, scope of the the uh, the uh, certification process. Um, previously, there has been at least one or two physical uh, security re re uh, requirements on on the actual ballot box. Um, ballots would definitely be a new a new uh, area there. I'm curious just to that point. So let me read just for the audience, 12.1 as read in the document that the members have. Any unauthorized physical access to the voting system or other hardware leaves physical evidence. Uh, so that it's, a, it's a more generalized definition as you were referencing. And I'm curious as to what the discussion in the cybersecurity working group was to change it to include ballots, specifically ballots, I guess, uh, in there uh, versus just leaving it at a uh, voting system or other hardware. I'm sorry, I was uh, receiving you make information. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't listen to me either. Uh, <laughs> so, so the 12.1 definition in, in the packet says, any authorized physical access to the voting system or other hardware leaves physical evidence. So it limits it to the voting system or the you know corresponding hardware with the, the voting system, whereas the definition on the screen uh, brings into play uh, ballots, specifically ballot boxes. You said we have uh, now some physical security requirements around ballot box. That's not uh, groundbreaking. So what was the discussion within the working group to pull ballots in, uh, which is a much harder thing for us to test as part of the voting system? Uh, yeah, um, some, 
I would say that uh, sometimes the working group is a little over over uh, zealous, um, and so uh, <laughs> you just threw the working group under the bus. No, uh, I'm part of that working group, right? I yeah. mean, um, and so so I guess my question was: Go ahead, David. Go ahead. Yeah, just looking through my notes. Yeah, since I don't trust my memory, <laughs> um, and I have some reference that what that was getting at was um, detecting um, tampering with the ballot box so that if there's tampering with a ballot box, then um, that should leave some evidence? I, I think, this is Lori Edgino, I think that's outside of the scope. Uh, I have ballot boxes that have absolutely nothing to do with the tabulation equipment, and I think that, that those would be outside of the scope of the VVSG. And to, and to my earlier point, when, when you're saying that, that it's going to leave physical evidence, if you're, I guess it, it, we would be asking for them to have the ability to have seals because the way I read it, the, it Good says point. you have to have a seal. So you you would be testing the seals that they're going to put on there is the way I'm reading that because if I don't use the seal, then there's no there's no tamper evident uh, tape or seal on there. Indeed, yeah, I, I like your way of uh, of saying that 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 you know ballot box should have the uh, ability to actually have a, a seal on it yeah I, I if I'm just trying to coordinate what what you all are saying so we can pull it up later is you'd like to see a reflection of the the system's ability to support proper sealing mm -hmm. whatever else uh, not necessarily that the voting system itself pr does that right yeah, right right yeah. right uh, okay we'll, we'll see what we can come up with to, re to reflect that I'm, I'm still back to, though, the ballots themselves. But and I'm, I'm the, still, you're putting yeah. seals on ballots? <laughs> I mean, what, what, yep. what exactly? So the, the, other thing, the other thing for us to look at in the same vein is whether or not, as reflected in the draft you have, whether you prefer the draft you have versus what's up on the screen. And so we can, we can look at that, uh, given the draft that you have. So, and I guess to, to, the, to Lori's point, in the, that then would that cover ballot transport boxes at the end of the night? Because now you're, if you're transporting ballots, you know, that, that I think we're getting very broad right. with we're, this. I mean, the, the key here, and, and we'll see if we can reflect it in the comment and make the change. The key here is that we want the voting system to be able to support proper physical security uh, protocols, right, including you know, seals, and, and tell me both David and, and Josh if I'm wrong, uh, and we're not looking to dictate best practices via the VVSG. That's not the Definitely appropriate not. place to dictate best practices on seal protocols, for instance, in that regard. Go ahead. Dave Wagner, I don't know how much you want to get into this now um, versus us taking it home and thinking about it and coming back to you. Um, uh, two questions for you to think about. Um, one is if the some I believe that manufacturers sometimes supply ballot boxes with the voting system. It's part of the voting system. So you said it's out of scope, but I wonder whether you might want those ballot boxes to be in scope when they're supplied as part of the voting system. That's that's one thought. The other is I was just looking through right now, looking at uh, what's in VVSG 1.1 1 .1, uh, about this, and so I can read you the language. I think I have. I think I have the right document in front of me, so I'll read what's on the document. I think it's, I've got it right. It says two things. One is, any unauthorized physical access shall leave physical evidence that an unauthorized event has taken place. Um, there's another uh, part a little bit further down that says, ballot boxes shall be designed such that any unauthorized physical access results in physical evidence that an unauthorized event has taken place. So just providing some context, we, can, we should still get it right and figure out what, what the right thing to do is for the 2.0. The other thing to keep in mind here, too, is that uh, the VVSG itself is limited to just the, the voting system, uh, just in, by nature. But I think we should take a look at, at the wording of this to reflect that. And, and that's helpful. As we do it, let's look at 1.1 and see if we either need to uh, modify that language or, or be educated by the language already in 1.1. All right, on to data protection. <laughs> um, for uh, the data protection principle, the principle, oh, <laughs> the main takeaways for 
um, from VVSG 1.1 is that we're gonna, there's gonna be some simplification and then a, just a few moderate updates. Um, these are a list of a few uh, relevant requirements that we found. And then the key factor uh, that we wanted to mention is that crypto cryptographic protection of various election artifacts um, is necessary and that digital, digital, digitally signing tabulation reports is also necessary. Um, so the, for the principle, we have the voting system protects sensitive data from unauthorized access, modification, or deletion. And then for our four requirements, we have that the voting system uh, prevents the unauthorized access or manipulation of configuration data, cast vote records, transmitted data, or audit records. Uh, the second guideline is that the source and integrity of electronic tabulation reports are verifiable. Third, we cover the cryptographic algorithms um, that are public, well vetted, and standardized. And finally, the voting system protects the integrity, authenticity, and confidentiality of sensitive data transmitted over all networks. <laughs> Thoughts, <laughs> comments, questions? McDermott, I, I'm sure you have one here. <laughs> Since you insist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> define for me, please, that the algorithm be standardized. Uh, I mean, so that you know, NIST has a a uh, a uh, cryptographic tech 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 uh, knowledge division. Uh, you know, NIST standardizes many different al 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 you know cryptographic algorithms. Um, things like a a a e s. Um, you know, I mean, SHA. Uh, you know, any of that series. This is this is basically uh, to ensure that you know voting system vendors are not rolling their own crypto. Um. All right. So, so you, at this point, you are not mandating a specific standard. No, not within this this guideline. Um, I would say that there are uh, very few you know games in town when it you know when it comes to you know cryptographic. Standards um, and FIPS 140-2 uh, would, you know, definitely be a, a spot there for uh, a requirement that would be very, very reasonable. Um, it, yeah, right. Because uh, as we brought up the concern earlier, some of the solutions that we're looking for, looking at to handle the auditability, require a type of encryption that is not currently standardized or, in fact, testable underneath a FIPS 140. So suddenly we are now completely removing an entire level of, of exploration by requiring a FIPS 140-2 standard for all encryption. Um, so I would caution the language there. I think that's a great point. The working group has been uh, has not quite I, I identified a solution about how to uh, how to make re uh, requirements for you know basically voting specific crypto versus just you know normal cryptographic primitives that you know everyone you know uses every single day. Um, I would say that. Uh, under the you know under the actual future re requirements, there would basically be a you know a bifurcation uh, that that said if you're using EDE, your you know crypto has to, to go through this process. If you're not if you're not using e, uh, uh, EDE, it would probably be FIPS one one forty dash two validated cryptographic modules. Judd, it's Judd from Colorado. Is uh, well vetted a term of art? Is that like is there a definition for well vetted? I see that term often. I'm not sure if it's defined, um, and this is meant to be high level. Um, uh, if you have any thoughts on that, love to get it. <laughs> Neil, I think it's important for an election system to be updated. You know, for security fixes, um, patches, etc. And 14.1 or 14.4 states, software updates are authorized by an administrator prior to installation. Is that meant to cover also the same issue related to data protection 
in security fixes and patches? Uh, so, yeah, so we'll get to that. Hold that question. Fair enough. Right, because we haven't done system integrity yet. But that that we need to answer that question when we get there. They'll walk through that. That is a really good question. Other, other on data protection? Okay, go ahead. I guess back to me, uh, system integrity. Uh, this is a new area of the of the VVSG. This is a uh, this is a fairly large and significant update. It would be. Um, there are some re requirements in the VVSG 1.1 about this, but um, uh, there uh, there are only tan tan tangentially related. Um, for the actual um, re you know, uh, sorry, principles and and uh, guidelines here. The the definition of system in in integrity is taken from the committee for uh, national security systems. The voting system performs its intended function in an unimpaired manner, free from unauthorized manipulation of the system, whether intentional or accidental. The first. Uh, guideline basically uh, uh, addresses defense in depth, making sure that there are multiple layers of technical uh, security controls in place on the voting system. The second guideline is basically uh, attack surface reduction, making sure that software on the voting system needs to actually be there, that there aren't uh, superfluous ports and network services running, uh, that there aren't actual physical ports on there as well, um, you know, essentially things that need to be there to make the voting system run, that should be the only things that are there. Um, the third guideline um, is uh, basically runtime integrity, making sure that different, app, 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 uh, different applications on the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, voting system uh, are supposed to be there. Uh, and that they are not um, interacting with with each other, basically that there is a sandbox on the voting system. And then the fourth one uh, is is essentially uh, you know authorized updates by 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 an admin. So to to get to Neil's question, if we can, yeah. uh, if I'm hearing you from what you just said, the idea is that there's no automatic updates that's going to break something that someone's going to need to authorize the updates before before loaded is that right indeed and uh, to your to your point sir uh, I mean I I definitely think software updates and patching of voting systems is a real serious issue we just need, uh, we just want to make sure that that the right people are uh, you know patching and that you know someone else who's not supposed to be patching the voting system is is uh, uh, doing so Lori uh, I have in our copy of 14.2, and I think on yours as well, we need to add a comma okay. after ports. So like physical one. ports, comma, and by using other technical controls. Isn't that the Oxford comma? Well, to be consistent, <laughs> the legal comma. <laughs> uh, <is it laughs> um, and to be consistent. Uh, and then in, on your version, we've got the unnecessary oh. comma in that last bullet, but that's not on our copy. Interesting. Okay. So thank you. Keep thank it you. as contained on our draft. Thank Love you. It. Yep. Anything else on system integrity? Okay. We have our last principle detection and monitoring. Um, here we just have a few moderate updates in this section. Uh, again, these are the relevant requirements that we found in VVSG 1.1. And then one of the key notes that we wanted to make here is that malware, um, it's malware detection focusing on back-end PCs um, is necessary, um, not on voting systems. So for the principle, we have the voting system provides mechanisms to detect and remediate anomalous or malicious behavior. Um, our first uh, guideline covers uh, logging, so a uh, voting system equipment rec records important activities through event logging, which are stored in a format suitable for automated processing. 
And then the second one covers uh, the logging of error messages. So it generates and stores and reports to the user or election officials all error messages. And then the last two are the voting system employs mechanisms to protect against malware. And finally, um, that the voting system, uh, a voting system with network capabilities employs appropriate, well vetted um, modern defenses against network based attacks um, and commensurate with current best practices. Comments. Comments or questions there? I'll just add that for what it's worth, uh, the uh, event logging uh, and system logging, uh, common data format work that's being done uh, will help uh, create, bring these to fruition or, or help uh, make these so uh, because of the work of, of the folks in the common data format and interoperability working group. So that's, that's helpful uh, as far as the, the way that they're reported out and making them automated and, and whatnot. Uh, just one comment, Lori Agino. In 15.2, uh, perhaps we could consider striking to the user or election official comma and just saying the voting system generates stores and reports all error messages as they occur. Uh, but curious if there would be any reason to keep that other language. Off the top of my head, I can't think of another, yeah. Will we, we say that again, Lori, just so we got it? The voting system generates, stores, and reports all error messages as they occur. I see. So you want to strike to, to the, the user, user or, or election, election official, of. comma. I don't take umbrage. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, McDermott. Um, the, 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 the top one is, uh, is remediate. Um, there, there's, and generally speaking, we don't remediate if there is a intrusion into the system. The system stops and no, and notifies, but it does not attempt to correct. Generally speaking, and that's generally bad practice. So the question is, do we want the word remediate in there, or do we want detect and notification? That's a good question. I want to think on that one, to be honest with you. I just want to make sure that there's nothing I'm missing. But uh, that's, that's, do you have any thoughts, David? Not. If, if one <laughs> wanted to play, if one wanted to play devil's advocate, which I do not ever, uh, and, and this is not a good argument either, but at the high level principle stage, one could argue that just stopping is a form of remediation in and of itself. It's not a, a good argument, but it would meet within here if we needed to get there. So just something to consider. I'll allow it if my, <laughs> if my allowing was actually necessary, which is not. I, I just said maybe a, another word like address, and maybe that's not the best one. But it, w w yeah, you want to notify them that commercial about you know your yeah ID protection. Well, I just notify. You know, oh, great. Well, I, I mean, it's notify, and you're able to do something, even if that's just stop. Or, but it, the word remediate says you can actually fix it, and and you may get an error that you can't do anything but stop and start over. You can't fix it, so I think you need a word other than remediate. It's detect and you know do something. The, yeah. the, the other point I'd make there, again, just for what it's worth, is that it, the the voting system's providing the mechanisms. It's not telling you how to remedi remediate, right? And so that, that feeds into it too, but we'll, we'll take a look at that and see if there's a change that we can, we can make without undermining the, the overall, because I don't think there's disagreement in the purpose of the principle, right? It's just getting the, the word correct. Yeah, maybe respond to. Maybe that might make a little sense. Not bad. Yeah, respond I think mean, that, that's a great okay. point, folks. Can I just say, I, I may agree with McDermott and what, he's, what you're saying, but at some point you have to remediate something down down downstream, right? So yeah. Yeah. Okay. We got it. Um, so thank you very, very much, everyone. These were excellent comments. And I want to say thank you to the Cybersecurity uh, Working Group for all yeah. their time Th and expertise. Thank you both. You uh you both had a unique challenge. Uh, yours was the most active uh, of the working groups, which was yes, great. It was. No, that's it's awesome. It had the most involvement. 
Uh, and so you all did a great job parsing through a lot of noise uh, to get to the point where we had a core set of principles and guidelines, and you should be commended for that, that work. I know it wasn't easy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I think we'll have both John and Ben come up at the same time. So they, they're partners in crime, so you don't have to go it alone. Actually, what time is it? You know what? We'll save you. Let's take a break first. We all, we all, after going through cybersecurity, who doesn't need a break? Um, so we're going to take a 15-minute break, so 2.35, uh, 2.35, uh, right? Did I get that right? Yeah, 2.35 to, re, uh, to come back and, and start over again, and, and Ben and John will be ready. Thank you.
All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, many have made a joke about the, the setup in the room, and I'll just tell you, uh, in the federal government, uh, to use my grandma's phrase, you play the hand you're dealt. Uh, and so this is the hand we're dealt, and you all have been good sports about uh, the makeup and setup in this room. Uh, and it's cozy. We're building team. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll turn it over to, to John Wack uh, and Ben Long, neither of whom need any introduction to this crowd. Uh, John has been working on this, uh, I think, since the mid-1950s, 1960s. Uh, ben, ben, obviously, a much shorter amount of time. No, John, John's work uh, in interoperability, uh, as many have heard me say, uh, is, to me, the most important work happening uh, in election technology. Without a uh, common data format and interoperable systems, I think many of what we want to achieve as an elections community to better serve voters, to provide better accessibility and better security uh, cannot take place. And so, John, uh, you've done yeoman's work over the years, not just on VVSG 2.0, getting the interoperability uh, to where it is. I know John Gerlai will come uh, speak tomorrow, but we uh, we ride on your coattails on this work and we appreciate it. Uh, and then Ben Ben got the, the other stuff category of VVSG 2.0, and so he'll talk about uh, those areas, and I appreciate both of you being here. So, John, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for those kind words. I, I had a, I was just going to say, hi, I'm John Wack. I'm the hand you've been dealt. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I take it all back. Uh, so uh, I didn't ex actually expect to be on today. I, I figured you all would be uh, still talking with Josh and Gemma for a good bit longer. So I'm impressed with how efficient you all are. Uh, the two principles I have here are I want to emphasize high level and goal oriented. Uh, they aren't requirements. Uh, they are things that um, you'll, you kind of know it when you see it. You know when something's interoperable, when something's transparent, and you know when they're not. Um, but I don't expect that we're going to have specific requirements you know, where this can be positively, uh, precisely engineered. Uh, but the, the requirements ought to be removing barriers to interoperability and barriers to transparency. So with that, interoperability. So that is the, um, the principle followed by the guidelines. And I, I won't read them off the slide, but um, Instead, I'll go to the second one and talk about how it's a goal. Now, interoper interoperability really could be, in my, in my mind, renamed uh, something along the lines of um, uh, it should be easy for election officials to purchase devices from different manufacturers and build the voting system that they want as opposed to, you know, just strictly from one one manufacturer. Now that, that's something that's not going to happen uh, immediately. Uh, it, it, you know, the voting industry is not a huge industry that can afford to change things. And there are good reasons why you still might want to have a voting system from one vendor that, that works in a unified way. But if you want to be able to purchase the latest and greatest um, uh, interoperability, uh, or I'm sorry, um, accessible voting device, for example, um, it ought to be easier and cheaper to do that. Uh, the TGDC recommendations of 2007 had some requirements along these lines, and there the term was used, integratability. Uh, it ought to be easy to integrate uh, with glue code or, you know, whatever integrate devices together without requiring major changes, uh, hardware changes, so on and so forth. These are goals, again. It's not going to happen overnight. It might be subsequent revisions of requirements that push this along. But going back to the principle, the guidelines there are really kind of removing barriers to interoperability, so uh, making, uh, making data be in an interoperable format removes a number of barriers to interoperability. Uh, COTS ought to be easier to use, not that COTS is a panacea for, for things, widely used hardware interfaces and communications protocols. That's currently done already. But anyway, we, we should just be making it easier for this to happen down the road. 
So before I move on, any, any questions about that or comments? John, I, um, first of all, thank you for the work you've done on data standardization already. I really enjoyed working thank with you. you on that. I appreciate it. And my question is related to this 4.2 in interoperability, uh, which is the standard publicly available formats for other types of data are used. You and I chatted briefly about this beforehand, but the, the reference there is to items that are currently being used as opposed to a future standard. Is that right? Um, well, I, I guess an example I can think of is that uh, uh, a manufacturer may use a QR code to uh, pack together voter choices on a ballot marking device. So the, you know, the, the QR code, I'm not sure what to call it, but algorithm uh, should be one that's publicly documented. Uh, and, you know, so in other words, remove as much as is possible proprietary ways of doing things. Uh, so it ought to be possible. Furthermore, I'm sure the data within a QR code is, is highly packed. It ought to be possible to unpack that without going to, you know, to great lengths. Got it. Uh, does that answer? It does. Yeah, okay, thanks. great. Thank you. Diane? I know we've talked about this before, but I'm revisiting it given the um, principle over under accessibility about conforming with federal accessibility guidelines standards. And that was specifically in reference to web accessibility standards. However, um, going back to that same standard where it says publicly available formats for other types of data, there are um, file formats for digital records um, that are files and for remote voting for those folks jurisdictions who are sending a file to a voter and the voters using their own technology that's another um, <clears throat> standard and I'm just wondering so does that fit here or does that fit over under accessibility under other federal you know yeah. you know what I'm saying right. But someplace there are so many jurisdictions doing that now, sending a file to a voter, either sending an electronic or mailing them a hard copy, you know, a, right. something with a file on it. That would seem to fit in one place or the other, and I don't know where or if anybody's even talked about that. So does this relate to this? The, the other issue I've heard is that... Uh, uh, input devices for an accessible voting system often tend to have proprietary hardware plugs. Uh, you know, it's not a standard USB, uh, you know, or audio jack or whatever. And does this sort of, excuse me, relate to that question where, you know, how do you make that situation better? Yeah, and I wasn't even thinking about hardware. That's a whole nother ports, and that's just a whole nother thing. All those, those have become more standardized. I was thinking more of, yeah, yeah. So, digital standards, whether it's for, you know, um, HTML web or it's an actual, you know, rich text format in a file that, you know, there's, all of those are pretty, um, the EPUB standards are all kind, but they're pretty standard so that, again, in my world, assistive technology has a pretty a robust set of standards if I want to use voice recognition software I use a screen reader as long as the file format or the the web content conforms to a set of standards and I'm pretty good to go and like I said I, I I think our intention over on accessibility we said that but I don't think we were thinking so much about static files yeah. so anyway just a thought to make sure somebody thinks about it in your camp or in ours okay yeah, okay, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, the last thing I'll say about interoperability is that um, for years, uh, I think we've heard from election officials that uh, interoperability is something they want. You know, interoperability will make it easier to use systems, to purchase systems, uh, to analyze election data, uh, has many, many, many benefits. Uh, but over and over again, from election officials it's you know can you make systems easier to use for us so I think that's one of the big goals about interoperability there so uh, 
that segues into. Hold on one oh, second. Lori, sure. Lori has a comment or question. I have um, just in the in the um, interest of the consistent titles, this is one where we could look at calling it interoperable um, instead of interoperability. And then um, just kudos to you guys for the work that you're doing on the um, work to promote interoperability. Oh. Thank you. Um, it's huge and means a lot to us as election officials. So I, we appreciate that you keep plowing forward and making it happen. I, I meant to mention that uh, up on our website we have a paper, I think it's from 2009, by Paul Miller of Washington who wrote you know, a great article about why this is important and you know, the benefits of doing it. So, Judd? Hey, John. This is Judd Schiff from Colorado. Um, I'm worried about the final phrase of 4.4. Um, the when their usage meets applicable requirements. Um, I don't like the idea that that could sort of be used to create a circumstance where there, where a commercial off-the-shelf piece of equipment wouldn't be um, allowed to be used for a particular election function. Is there, <coughs> is there a reason why that phrase was added? to it or what was the thinking behind that? Yeah, the thinking behind that was uh, to make sure, for example, that the COTS device meets accessibility requirements, things of that sort. That's, that's really, you know, does it fully live up to other requirements in the VVSG? Um, yeah, I think, I think that the purpose of that is so that you can introduce a COTS device that violates several right. of the other principles or guidelines or corresponding requirements and def, you know defeat the purpose of those by saying what it's cots yeah you know yeah. we're good to go so I think that was the purpose can can we then maybe play with the word applicable maybe use previously mentioned or some some other phrase which alludes to the meets other VVSG yeah, requirements. Meet other you know, something VVSG like that yeah. requirements right yeah yep yeah. okay great go ahead John Transparency, again, uh, this is a goal-oriented requirement. Let me start with, I thought it was useful to look up what transparency actually means. I would uh, note NIST is using Wikipedia for definitional purposes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking about not putting Wikipedia on there, but I didn't think that would be right. Uh, but I like the first bullet, as used in science, engineering, business implies openness, communication, and accountability. So we want to, we want to trust vote, we want voting systems that are trustworthy, that are open. And so transparency is a quality uh, that as it increases, I think, uh, offers the opportunity to put more trust in a voting system. Uh, a, a design that is simple, a design that is uh, uh, well documented, uh, again, referring to the 2007 uh, TGDC recommendations, there were requirements in there uh, that promoted uh, more extensive, more usable documentation with the idea being that if you want to make systems uh, of higher quality, higher security, integrity, uh, make them well documented. And I think there's some truth behind that. Uh, so. I, I will mention also uh, that this came from California, or from LA County's VSAP principles, uh, and it it came across as a a good thing to aim for in the way the system works. Uh, it ought to be relatively easy to demonstrate a system and have the public understand it. Uh, I was thinking about this, and I don't want somebody who's you know making end-to-end -end voting systems think that this disqualifies E to E systems. I'm not saying that, uh, but I, I believe as a design goal, uh, a system ought to be easily explained and very importantly, it ought to be easy to understand how to audit it and to perform that audit. So this kind of overlaps somewhat with the security principles. And so uh, I think the actual, I think I lost the. Uh, it happened. So I turned the lights out, John Wack. Did I? Well, there's a lot of drama associated with the, the these requirements there. here. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, hurtful. There we go. Are there any questions I could answer on transparency before Ben takes it away? It's 
probably already documented, but our favorite word easy and easily is heavily used. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of easies in there, so we'll take a look at, at the easies. Uh, I, I do have one, uh, and I, I know the answer to this, but the, the middle, so the second bullet uh, in the list of three, the processes and transactions, both physical and digital, associated with the v voting system are readily available for inspection. Inspection by whom, for whom, and how are we going to test that? I think part of the thinking behind that was that uh, a voting system uh, shouldn't be too complicated for the labs to test. Um, this kind of gets into other areas. Uh, a good glossary, uh, very well written requirements without ambiguity are going to also assist in, in that realm as well. Um, uh, exports and imports and reports in a common format that can be read. Um, any, any voter out there could understand it, you know, so along those lines. Judd? Uh, would that include ballots? Ballots themselves. I guess could you elaborate a little bit? I'm not sure what you mean. Would ballots be accessible, available for public inspection under that definition? A ballot that you would vote on prior to the election? Yeah, a cast ballot. I, I, I'm talking about a cast ballot. A cast ballot. Oh, should the cast ballots, should the record cast ballots? Well, I know there are people who would like that. I know a number of state laws prohibit that. I think that's, we're getting into that legal area and that's probably out of scope. Yeah, I, I think for the purposes of this discussion, it would be that if a state were to allow for that, right, that that be part of the voting system, al allowing that to be readily yeah, right. available should a state want to make it available, right? So it's still incumbent on the state laws uh, to do so. So my only concern was that we were writing a requirement that forced a bunch of states to change their state law which is, but you're not suggesting that the requirement will lead us that direction. I understand that this is a guideline, but hopefully the requirement won't lead us there, even though under Colorado law they're open. Mm. David, did you have something? Dave Wagner, on the first bullet, um, when I think of transparency, I think of um, open to all, open to the public, um, available for view by the public. And I can't help but notice that the first one, the public is not included among those who are supposed to be able to read the documentation. Unless you want to define them as that. independent auditors. But I agree. Yeah. Vote, you know, voters, it's a good, good so addition. My, my suggestion, I think it's a really good point. Uh, my suggestion would just simply uh, to be to end at easily read and understood. The, the by whom? can include all of those people if it's easily read and understood. So defining who is easily reading and understanding isn't our job. Ours is just to make sure the system supports that. Seems reasonable. I'll ask a follow-up. Um, is the intent here to make sure that that documentation is public? In other words, that um, that is allowed to be read by the public? as opposed to I think some past practice has been that often this documentation is considered confidential or proprietary or not released to the public. So is this intended to require that or take a stand on that? Well, the first answer is no. I mean, the, the thinking was not, you know, along those lines necessarily. Uh, but the devil is in the details and I, you know, for the, in the event logging cast, um, or um, common data format event logging, uh, there was this issue of event codes that manufacturers use to describe an event, you know, like hexadecimal 31 would mean ballot cast. And some people wanted all manufacturers to standardize on using the, the same hex code. And ultimately, we agreed that instead of that, uh, let's propose a requirement that manufacturers make available in a standard format what their codes mean. So they use whatever code they want, but by making that documentation easily available, it's possible to read the event log. So yeah. there's but an example of where 
where something being public would be beneficial. Right, and and uh, I think to answer your question, this would apply with, for a state just as much, but I'll, I'll use the EAC program. If the EAC program were as part of its programmatic requirements to say that, uh, you know, all system documentation is is, to, is going to be made public by the EAC, right? We're, we're going to make it public. We want that information to be easily read and understood. And so that the point, a state can make that decision, a local can make that decision, right? Uh, but making clear that should that be made public by whoever decides to do that, that it not be gobbledygook, right, so that the public can, can read and understand it. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity that's all you to present got? this. That's it. Man. I would like the other presenters, I'd very much like to yeah. thank people in the interoperability working groups who have uh, worked hard for little pay and done a great job. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. I want to switch places. Oh, sure. Thank you. No, you can make it at okay, the beginning so of Ben's. Go ahead. Just for, for Mary on that. Well, Ben gets set up. Principle three, transparency in talking about keeping the headings consistent. Maybe we could call that transparent. Laura, you could just submit your edits to the <laughs> secretariat. <laughs> All right, Ben Long uh, gets the uh, bucket of other stuff, uh, as it were. Uh, and Ben, uh, to your credit, you took on this challenge, uh, did a really excellent job trying to capture a lot of the other stuff in the VVSG that ensures the uh, functioning of the systems and the sustainability of the, the systems. So uh, go forth and conquer here and, and bring us home on the review of the principles and guidelines. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. Um, I, I think we're just bringing up this slide one second here. I'm, I'm uh, almost ready. Thank you so much. Um, I'll go do this. There's one here. It's in the top one there. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Chairman Masterson, and uh, everybody here. Um, so, um, as has been mentioned, I get uh, I get to address uh, essentially everything else um, that does not fall into um, the system attributes that have been discussed so far: um, human factors, security, interoperability, and so forth. Um, as has been the case uh, with the others, um, these principles have been arrived at from uh, a review and a, and a thoughtful consideration of how to concisely encapsulate um, what has existed in previous standards, um, including the 2007 TGDC recommendations. Um, I have two primary principles here. One is high quality design and high quality implementation. Um, and it, it should be noted up front that um, to think about the differences between these, there's, there's a couple of essential differences to keep in mind as we step through. Um, high quality design is essentially domain specific. Um, so it's, it's essentially oriented around um, it's, organi it's organized around ele accurate election process specifications. So it is specific to the election domain. And it focuses on preserving correct election processes in implementations. And then it ensures that designs can support clear evaluations in general. High quality implementation is essentially um, applying best practices in high quality engineering to actually make such systems. Um, to create election technology. And it's organized around construction and reliability of election technology implementations themselves. Um, you've generally seen folks um, list a principle and guidelines all on one slide. I'm going to do that, um, but then I'm also going to zoom in one guideline at a time with a little bit of example material so that you can we can discuss in context. Um, so, the first principle, high quality design, 
Um, the voting system is designed to accurately, completely, and robustly carry out election processes. Um, so this seemed to be uh, the overriding goal that all technology is going to be implementing um, these processes. And so in order to do that, um, that implementation is going to need uh, a commonly accepted election process specification. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the voting system will be designed to function correctly under all realistic operating conditions. And um, it should support evaluation methods so that testers can clearly distinguish um, systems that correctly implement election processes from those that do not. So on that first guideline then, um, the voting system is, is designed using commonly accepted election process specifications. Um, essentially, uh, the meaning behind this, um, there's, there's been uh, a number of work in the election process area already um, from, from the election groups. Um, the use case is now in the CDF area and, and this will continue to mature uh, to the point where it can um, form a commonly accepted basis uh, for implementing those processes. Um, examples where this uh, shows up, um, functionality wise, uh, a system should support the, and, and these are just example bullets at the bottom to contextualize. Um, it should support the entire voting process and appropriate voting variations. Um, it should support the integrity and maintainability of election processes and data, and it should reliably and accurately transfer voting related information um, when it does transfer it. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop and perhaps uh, open it up for any, any dialogue on that first guideline. Lori. Um, have we, uh, just on the under high quality implementation, um, 2.6, you use the word gracefully? Yes, ma'am. Have you, are we there yet, or am I? No, no, we're, so we are, we're still on high quality design, okay. and we're stepping through. I will hold my comments until we get there. Not a problem whatsoever. So we're on 1.1 1 .1, uh, for those who are following along. <laughs> She's ahead of the game. I know. Right, hard charger. Go ahead. Other questions for Ben? Right. So Go ahead. I'm assuming this might be the most straightforward one here, but um, if, if you have any clarification. Assume nothing, Ben. Assume yes, nothing. yes, uh, assuming nothing. Go ahead, McDermott, see? <laughs> yes. Uh, perhaps a bit more of a side note, uh, how is the EAC's uh, mapping of state-specific requirements coming together, and how can that be interchanged or interleaved into this process? Because ultimately that's where all of our commonly accepted election processes and context comes together. There are certain things that never get used together, whereas certain things always get used together. Uh, straight ticket is, of course, one of the biggest hot tickets, uh, though thankfully Iowa has decided not to do it anymore. So uh, we can, two things. One is uh, tomorrow uh, with the EAC staff lobby, we can give a quick update on that. Uh, it's progressing to the extent that states are sending us the information and mapping. I know Ryan's uh, worked on it. Uh, but secondly, uh, there are other sources of processes, including uh, the ones we identified as part of this work, right? And as uh, part of uh, the common data format work, election process modeling has gone on that can help us identify some of that as well. And so uh, to your point, I think we will in evaluating this principle and guideline in order to write requirements, we will take all of that information, including the mapping uh, and other, uh, in order to write some requirements that'll recognize, again, the commonly accepted election, not the outlier election practices, process specific specifications. So I, hopefully that answers it. Any other questions on this guideline and this principle so far? Never ask twice, Ben, just go. Okay. <laughs> Moving on to 1.2, um, the voting system is designed to function correctly under all realistic operating conditions. Um, so in this case, um, this particular guideline was um, 
constructed with respect to um, in previous VVSGs, there's been a concept of volume testing and ensuring that uh, voting systems that are built and deployed can support realistic election sizes and complexities and workloads. And this was the intent behind this one. Um, Including temp power, stuff like that. Um, now that actually is That's in later. implementation. Okay, yes. great. Okay, so this is process specific. John? Um, instead of realistic, how about anticipated? Anticipated? Ant anticipated. Um, Realistic seems, I mean, yeah, unrealistic <laughs> seems like an unrealistic <laughs> word, but uh, I don't know. Right, Maybe so I, I, I guess the main point is that it reflects um, the conditions one would expect in, in a real election. In, in real so life. However that can be stated best, yeah. This so. is uh, Greg Riddlemulger. One of, this is one of my favorite ones because if you have a specification, and granted that's down in the weeds, but um, high-speed ballot scanners do not need to operate at 140 degrees with 100% humidity. They would never encounter that. So that's an unrealistic operating have, environment. Have so you been to New Orleans in August? It's <laughs> no. Point well taken. It's also unanticipated. So it's, I guess that's where I was going. So uh, certainly we can, we can take wording into account yeah. for sure. The, the only issue I would raise, it, and this is for thought as we move towards reviewing these, is anticipated, uh, your, I mean, realistic would fall into this, I guess, too, but your version of what you anticipate and what I would anticipate, um, two very different yeah. things. But this is meant to be high level, so that's, that's okay. Both words struggle with the right. same problem. Yep, so. yep. So we'll look at that. We can talk about it. Okay. Um, 1.3, um, so the intent behind this one is that um, this is essentially guidance on specification of tests, that a good test can help you tell the difference between a process that is correct and one that is not. And in this case, um, at no matter what level um, an election process touches in the implementation, that there should be a way for an evaluator to tell whether or not an election process has been preserved or violated. So I list the different levels here just for, as examples. Um, but um, essentially election processes shall not be violated and that those who are testing it should be able to tell that. Um, and by following this guideline, they design their tests so that that difference is clear. So this is guidance for clear testing. Any questions? Okay. Just to jump back, would under real world conditions be better, the prior one instead of real unrealistic or? Does New Jersey count as real world? <laughs> we, we like to believe so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, or maybe our own little world. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Real world. Real world yeah. seems better to me than realistic. Okay. We'll take that down. Yeah. Okay. Uh, principle two, high quality implementation. Um, following the same format here, um, I'll list everything on one slide and then we'll just jump through each one at a time. Um, the principle, the voting system is implemented using high quality best practices. Um, and <laughs> as we dive through here, I. Um, you know, I want to emphasize that, it, that essentially we've extracted the essence of, so this is the piece where you go and you make the system that implements that election process. Um, it, this is extracted from a review of, of previous guidance. Um, and for example, um, and so in the first case, uh, voting system is implemented using trustworthy materials and methods. Um, whether you're talking about software or hardware, whether you're talking about quality assurance, um, you're following best practices there, and we'll look at that. Um, the, se the second one um, is essentially best practice for um, user-centered design. Um, when you implement that, um, this is back to Sharon, Sharon's human factors uh, talk earlier. Um, 
Third, the voting system logic is clear, meaningful, and well-structured. So uh, this encapsulates the idea of logic, whether it resides in software, hardware, firmware, et cetera. Um, that, that that logic um, is clear, meaningful, and, and well-structured according to best practices in software. Uh, voting system structure is modular, scala uh, scalable, and robust. Um, it supports the processes and data with integrity. Uh, this is Lori's handles errors robustly and gracefully recovers from failure. We'll get there in just a minute. And then uh, the last one performs reliably in intended environments. This is Greg's. Um, let me let me hold you there and see yes. if we can create a little efficiency. And that is, uh, are there any specific questions on any one of these that Ben can skip ahead to the slide and walk through? Because um, each each of the next slides is going to cover each one of these bullets. So are Precisely. There, are, is that right? Yes. Yeah. So are there any questions on specific? So let's go to Lori's to start. So if you could skip ahead to the handles, arrows robustly and gracefully recovers from failure first. Okay. Go ahead, Lori. So my point on that was um, gracefully seems to be, it seems, feels like odd wording here. And I just wanted to know a little bit more about where you were going um, with that. Like, were you, are you thinking um, quickly? Um, if you could just expand on that a little bit, and then I might be able to come up with a word that I like better. Sure, no problem. Um, uh, this is sometimes language that's uh, used to describe this process, say in reliability engineering. Um, but essentially, uh, in the first case, um, so there's, there's kind of two pieces to this. The first is if you can avoid an error and get back to a place before the error happened, that's handling it robustly. The second case is if, if an error is, is unavoidable, that you don't fail catastrophically. You don't have a hard stop where you have no information about what happened um, or what to do or what it means, and, um, and that you actually fail um, to a point where you have some information about what to do about it to, to correct the situation. So um, gracefully, um, is that you're organizing the way you make the system uh, so that when it fails, um, that it also does not damage any data. And it, doesn't, it doesn't damage any other critical part or process of the system. Mary. So uh, like normally if you're programming, it, you know, there's a couple ways to go about this. Uh, sometimes um, uh, early programmers that, you know, maybe not, may not know so much about uh, programming, might just go about and, and try an operation and if it fails, then you know it may be something at a lower level will throw an error, or maybe maybe we'll get a blue screen of death, or <laughs> who knows what you'll get. But uh, it, normally, it, it, the the right way to, to go about programming would be to try something and have a catchphrase, for instance. So if an error gets thrown, you catch that error, and then you know uh, then you take the necessary steps. That's what that's what we refer to as as failing gracefully, and and being able to recover. So I am to understand then gracefully recovering is industry standard. People other than me understand that and yes. know exactly what that means. Yes, okay. and, and it's it's also part of the current uh, testing, uh, either in 1.1 uh, or in an in interpretation as well. So that gracefully graceful recovery is is a known term of art. I would say that that doesn't make it good. By the way, it just makes it a thing. <laughs> is it the same for robustly? Is ro robust a term of art? It is. Yeah. It is actually, yeah. Because it usually means strong or forcefully. And yeah, and handles errors strongly, forcefully. And gracefully is attractive and elegant way. There you go. <laughs> yeah. This is this is what you get for using Wikipedia to define things. <laughs> yeah, we obviously yeah. didn't use Wikipedia in this case. Yeah. Yeah. In uh, this particular case, robustly is meaning that it's covering a broad spectrum right. of yeah, uh, thoroughly. Fair, that you basically, what, it, what it's saying with robustly is that you have anticipated a large number of problems and have handled them effectively. Um, in the case of gracefully, there are certain things that you are expecting to happen and you handle it correctly. A perfect example of this is somebody putting a black piece of paper into your scanner instead of a ballot. Generally, what's happened, it could be that the scanner will just throw, it will throw an error saying, I don't understand what I've seen here. But the effect of that, to handle it gracefully, is to return it back out and say, we've had a problem, we're now reset, let's move on. 
Okay, if you could go back to your first slide and then we'll, we'll see if people have questions on the other ones. So questions on the remaining bullets or changes. David. Uh, Dave Wagner, um, I want to discuss something that's not exactly on any of these bullets, sure. if that's appropriate. Um, source code review. Um, my understanding, I have a hard time getting hard numbers on this, but we're talking about something that might be in the range of 10, 20, even 30% of the cost of certification and testing, if I understand right. And from what I understand of the source code review that's being done, I'm not sure that it's providing value that's proportionate to that cost. So this is one that's been on my mind as it looks like an opportunity for us to do some cost reduction, uh, facilitate innovation. And I haven't heard anything about that, and I don't see anything about that here. So can you talk a little bit about that? Is that something that is getting punted to requirements? Is there um, been discussion of, of looking again at, at the source code review that's done and the requirements that have necessitated source code review? Do you have thoughts on where you plan to go with that? Can you, can you just talk about that subject at all? Um, so, to, so to date, um, we no, we haven't had extensive conversations on that in specific so far. It's the principle, the guideline of voting system logic is clear, meaningful, and well structured. is is more at the what level? It's and so th this is something you would expect to be able to verify as a result of doing a comprehensive source code review. Um, and so, it's a valid point, though. Does in your feeling, do you feel that that, that belongs in, in this list? So Dave Wagner, um, my impression is that this came around as a result of, of good intentions, where there were requirements that required that the source code be modular and maintainable, because that's a good practice, which then led to some specific requirements that are about the, the syntax and the structure, which were then testable only by having a person read through the source code, which then led to the source code being reviewed at a rather superficial level, but because there's a person doing it, it's very expensive. It'd be like having someone review your essay, because I'm a teacher, I like these teaching analogies. Review your essay and they're like checking the fonts you used and the spelling of the words, not whether the essay was actually any fun to read or whether I learned anything from it. Um, and spending a lot of money on that. Um, so it feels like this is an issue we ought to confront. And um, I just uh, would like to see us tackle this one rather than let it you know, kind of sail by because it hasn't come up in any of these guidelines here specifically. I think we might be able to save some cost by eliminating some requirements there. Yeah, so I, I think you know, Ben correctly points out that it's, you know, th there's a placeholder here to ensure that you're, you're using you know, best practices in terms of the way you develop your source code. So the question is, how should that actually be implemented? How can we, be, uh, how can we ensure that it's been implemented the way that, that we think? And, and that's part of the reason that I, wa I want to move some of the requirements development for implementation and uh, to the testing group. So this can be discussed between it, it, where the manufacturers and voting system test labs and uh, you know, are, are participating. Yeah, I, I would add, it, you've correctly identified exactly where this would be and the reason that it doesn't specify is because I think both NIST and the EAC, because we've had the same conversations, uh, identified this as that opportunity, that, that if we can have, uh, you know, trustworthy materials and methods, whatever it may be, that there are, uh, more efficient ways of reviewing to ensure that via testing than, than a line-by-line -line code review by a human being, and that cost savings can be found there, as well as, by the way, writing documentation in a way that is understandable and clear can say, because the two areas that cost the most in testing, and McDermott, correct me if I'm wrong, is source code review and documentation review. They take a long time. There's a lot of documentation. Uh, and so I think via th these kind of high-level principles and guidelines, absolutely we see an opportunity to identify uh, some efficiencies and cost savings. And you're exactly right. I mean, the history there is back when the 2005 were written, um, the focus on manual source code review was a lot higher than it is now, right? There's, there's other ways, including looking at software independence and other things that we could save money on one end uh, with the other. So I, I think 
uh, absolutely this guideline's intended to tackle that, and now it's the time to do that, uh, both programmatically from an EAC standpoint and requirements-wise as we build out. I have uh, two areas. So in uh, 2.2, where you talk about a wide range of representative voters and poll workers, including those with and without disabilities, should we make that whatever language we decide for 8.3? So just so we're clear on that, so they yes. match. And then yes. the same, and then maybe in 2.7, the voting system performs reliably, reliably in intended environments. Maybe that's what we use in 1.2. Pull that up and use it up in there. So you would propose in 1.2 that it read, the voting system is designed to function correctly under all intended operating conditions? Yeah, well, I mean, I said intended environment, so there's oh, similar yeah. language. Whatever language we end up with. Environments, intended operating environments. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure we get it as we review it. Go ahead, Diane. Yeah. Uh-oh. Oh, I was just going to say, I don't think you want to. The, the issue between 2.2 um, which is the upfront design um, using best practices, user centered design. 8.3 is the actual summative user testing. And I think, it, and the problem was having poll workers in that statement. The poll workers in 2.2 is fine because it's user centered design. The hitch was putting the poll workers under eight. Um, created issues because then that's under a principle that ensures accessibility and we have the whole issue of different accessibility standards. I, I think the resolution is to take poll workers out of 8.3. And I guess yeah. my concern then in 2.2 is are we building it to meet ADA requirements for poll workers, not just voters? If I well, it's user-centered design. It's a whole, we're not really talking about accessibility requirements per se. It's user-centered design conceptually which is very different from 8.3, which is, yeah, is summative usability testing that includes accessibility. <laughs> it's two different issues, I think. So I'm lumping them together, because you're, you're saying poll workers, including those with and without disabilities. So if you're saying you gotta design a machine for a poll worker with a disability. Usable, not meeting an accessibility requirement. And if it was an accessibility <coughs> requirement here under design, it would not be the ones that are in the VVSG for the voting system for the voter. Mm -hmm. That's where the difference is. There's a different accessibility legal requirement for a poll worker than there is for the voter themselves. Should we just move the, the last phrase behind, after voters and leave poll and poll workers at the end? A wide range of representative voters, including those with and without disabilities, and poll workers. I mean, if, if you're if, if so, you're saying it doesn't, I, I'm just concerned somebody reads this just in general sense and says, well, it says right here it has to be designed for poll workers with disabilities, and and yeah. just because if we're staying at that high level, that's my concern. Somebody reads it that way, yeah, and so. I'm, it's, it's fine editing that one. And then, like I said, I think the fix over in 8.3 is to take poll workers out of that one and go to voters. The summative usability testing is about voters. And if you have a wide range of voters with functional limitations, you're gonna cover poll workers with functional limitations. I mean, in the quote, if that poll worker is voting, you know, so. So anyway. what, here's what I recommend. Uh, with this one specifically and, and uh, eight dot, what is it, eight dot three. Two, three. Uh, when we take the break to prepare, uh, you and Diane can kind of talk through the differences and then when we pull it up, we can talk through it some more. But uh, I, I see the difference between when we're talking, a summative usability test is, is an actual test that's gonna have to be administered, <coughs> right? And this is just talking about designing it with user-centered design methods uh, as part of the design principles behind the, the system. Uh, but but let's we can have that conversation. But uh, why don't you let Diane educate you a little further before we have that? Oh, we got it. Wow! Okay. <laughs> I thought that's why you set me next to Cliff, and he gave up. <laughs> he and did left. Give up. So that's not a so, coincidence. So you won't see Diane after the break, apparently. <laughs> I'm not trainable. Judd. 
so, and I readily admit that, that, that this is, it's certainly possible that there is, but I don't see a difference between 1.2 and 2.7. What, 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 are, what are we seeking in those two right. things which are different? Um, so as, as I mentioned in my opening slide, um, the, the way to think about the differences in, in intent between these two principles is high quality design is organized around that, the accuracy of that process. And so the intent was that 1.2 had to do with, I have, a re I have a, what was the term, intended realistic election workload. It's of an expected or anticipated complexity. It handles anticipated voting variations, all process centric. Um, the one in 2.7 is specific to the physical environment that it's in, the temperature, the humidity, the shock, the electromagnetics. And so that is very tech technology specific where the other is process specific. Does that make sense? Let me just say, I mean, internally we've had a, a fair amount of discussion on should we just combine these two and, and would it make it a, a, a bit clearer if we did? And if that's desired, we can definitely do that, no problem. I actually think that the distinction is important and because the first one is more about your limits and your logical definitions. How many voters? How many precincts? How many contests? How many languages? The lower part is truly about the physical locations and can it function underwater or... Right. or is that an option? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, 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 the intended environment, that, that, that is possibly a, uh, a distinction that you want to look at. Because um, my intended environment is really San Diego, where it's 72 and sunny all the time with low humidity. But I have to really force the other stuff. It, but, let, me, let me add from a programmatic standpoint, it matters, uh, I think, to the EAC as well in that we publish uh, with certified systems, system limit documentation. How many precincts or, or ballot styles or uh, whatnot that the system can support. Uh, and so it's important to have that clear delineation so that we can tell the consumer, this is exactly what this system can do. How many languages, whatever the case may be. Whereas the environmental testing as we're talking about in ESD testing uh, is separate from that limits document. Ben had me at high quality design. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to uh, keep going. Seven minutes ago. <laughs> McDermott, did you? The, the, there, there's a question. So it, it, I guess the question at this point is can we, how, how are we going to uh, define intended environment? And are we going to change where we currently sit? Like with temp power, et cetera. I, I think we can look at that, certainly, uh, and, and part of that, and Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, examining where the current uh, set of common standards and, and mill specs and, and other things sit, uh, depending, uh, and evaluating what's appropriate for the, the voting environment, right? Uh, so this is a chance, just as it's a chance to review source code review, this is a chance to look at that, but I, I also think uh, odds are good that we're going to try to follow already existing specs as best we can because they're existing for a reason rather than making up our own. So we're not going to put in a San Diego environmental spec, for instance. That's too, that's too easy and the folks in Louisiana or the folks in Arizona aren't going to appreciate the San Diego environmental spec, right? Uh, so that's, I think this is an opportunity to look at that in the requirements development stage. Mark? Yeah, Matt, I just want to make sure that I, I fully understand this. This 2.2. It could be referring to poll workers with disabilities, correct? So it's referring to a range of representative voters and poll workers, including those with and without disabilities. So, so this could be referring to poll workers with disabilities? Well, that was the discussion. It's, it, the way it's currently written, it could, and that was the question Bob raised then about, well, there's a different accessibility standard that's going to apply to a voting system as it relates to voters versus a voting system as it relates to poll workers um, because the, the accessibility standards in the VVSG apply to voters, not poll workers. So that was his point. It's, um, 
confusing at best, and that needs to be cleaned up along with 8.3 that has the same confusing wording about voters and poll workers. Right. So, Thank yeah. You. So we'll, we'll come back with a, a way to either clarify that or, or answer that question better, I think. And thanks for vindicating me, Mark. Mark, you're now in, in the camp with Bob. Good luck. Uh, anything else with, with, go ahead, David. I thought I'd note that I, I believe there was a request from the cybersecurity working group, from some of the people on the working group, that um, secure software development be included among the high quality implementation principles. Um, and so I, I don't see it there, so I thought I would call that out as, as something that at least some members of the, the working group thought should be there. Sure. Um, I, I think we did have uh, some discussion internally, and um, per, perhaps Josh could correct me, or Gemma could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was covered in system integrity um, under software assurance practices. So it, yeah, it doesn't. It do, no. So under principle 14, which is I think what you're referencing, Ben, yes. uh, there isn't a specific reference to secure software development. What would you call it? Procedures, techniques, skill sets. So, so, so I guess um, I would come back to um, the other the other part where I I may have been this actually was actually in 2.1, and so I guess and that is trustworthy materials and methods and I guess the question is is um, if what you're saying is is you know Ben I'm not sure that's strong enough then if you think you need more strength in that then we should think about strengthening that piece right here yeah so so David I guess my request to you we'll, we're gonna we'll put it in the notes as a comment and my request to you is when we take the break identify whether it, it, it best belongs in the implementation portion or in the system integrity portion, but we could look at w an appropriate place that where we might be able to add that and what that means as well. So you may be asked to explain what the heck that might mean. So I'm sure McDermott will ask that. Thank other, you very much. Other questions? Okay, so here's the plan. Uh, we have, uh, what, about two pages? We'll call it two pages. Uh, worth of notes on your comments, some of them easy, some of them not as easy. Uh, and so we'll take a 20 minute break. So that'll put us back just after four. We have about an hour when we come back, uh, unless you guys wanna work late, totally your call. Uh, and then we have about two hours tomorrow morning as well uh, to work through it. And in the end, this is what we're here to do. And so if we need to shuffle around presentations or whatnot, that's what we need to do in order to work through uh, your comments and, and identify. The goal would be whatever changes we make today will be reflected in a document you see tomorrow. We'll continue to work through them tomorrow and then present to you a document that reflects those agreed upon changes as we work through it, hopefully reflecting a document that you all can, can agree on uh, being the goal. So we'll take a 20 minute break, uh, 4.05 or so, uh, and then we'll uh, come back uh, ready to roll at looking at your comments.
All right, we'll go ahead and get started uh, right on time. So we have about an hour uh, to go through your comments. Uh, so I kind of want to talk about process very briefly on how we're going to go through this and uh, open to suggestions if there's a more efficient way. But what Ryan has done is, as you all were going through and offering your comments, uh, Ryan documented them and we'll be able to pull them up uh, to show what the options are or what the suggested change was. Uh, several of these will be easy. Uh, they were, you know, for instance, some of Lori's uh, correction on commas or titles uh, to accurately reflect that. Uh, Mary also took notes during it so we can make sure we sync if there's disagreement on exactly uh, what was suggested. Uh, and again, what I would propose for us to at least consider as a construct so that we're not spending our time on each one forever is having four categories of, or buckets to put these into. One is accept them. If, if everyone's like, yep, let's roll, uh, good to go, we can accept it, make the change. Uh, reject it. If, if everyone kind of says, you know what, we think it looks good, uh, we'll go ahead and just keep it the way it is, uh, that's fine. The third option is to document it as something that needs to be included as part of the public comments. So that, it, it, ooh, so that it's out there. I mean, literally, the camera guy almost passed out. That noise. Woo. It's Ryan plugging. It's about to happen again. Well, that's how you wake up. That's how you wake up, folks, uh, at 4 o'clock on a TGDC meeting. Uh, the, the third to consider is, is, again, documenting that this was a comment, but there was an agreement reached. Uh, but the ability to move forward and, and keeping that as a public comment, which would need to be resolved by the EAC and NIST uh, before adoption of the final document, uh, so that it's documented and shown and we can make sure whoever raised it or whoever agrees with it is, is shown. It's also a place that the Standards Board and Board of Advisors could look at those comments and say, okay, we can weigh in uh, on that as well. And then um, the fourth is just grammatical, where it's, it's grammatical fixes. We, we move through them uh, and, and go forward. So does that construct go ahead, Greg? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Greg Riddlemulzer, in the interest of uh, time, both today and tomorrow morning, I'm assuming that there will be a preamble or a cover sheet or a something to the VVSG, what it is, what it is not, why it's high level, and, and that it's not meant to uh, circumvent in any way, shape, or form uh, one or more state laws in the 50 states, you know, that kind of stuff. So if there's something like that on top of it, what, what we are, what we have and have not done, you know, that kind of a thing. So absolutely, yes. There is, there is an introductory document that wouldn't be part of the, the, the principles and guidelines per se, but would accompany it explaining what the VVSG is, why it exists, uh, what the purpose is uh, or isn't, as the case may be. And in addition, as I said before, uh, there will be a corresponding education effort on behalf of the AC and NIST on, on this VVSG, uh, and that education effort will be both to the election community, but also the general public at large to explain those types of things that we, you know, for instance, the scope is voting systems only. It's not voter reg systems, things like that. So we have a clear uh, understanding of uh, what it is and isn't in that regard. So it would be twofold. Yes, we're going to have a document like that, but also there's going to be corresponding educational efforts on it. Anything else on process or strategy? Great. So Ryan and Mary and uh, Sharon or Brian, uh, and we can call up any one of. Uh, I think we're going to start from one. So Ben would be the best person to have up here uh, to, to start. And we'll just roll through each one in your comments. Uh, if anyone has anything to add, hopefully it'll, several of them will be, you know, sort of without objection or conversation. And we'll move on again. We have about an hour and then two hours or so uh, tomorrow morning. And when we come back tomorrow, the changes we make here in this next hour will be reflected in the document so that we keep a working document uh, in that way. Uh, and we're working off of the document that you have in front of you. So to the extent there were discrepancies between slides and the document in front of you, we are working off the document in front of you. Uh, right. At, at Brian Hancock from the AC just said that a, a new working version of this document will be provided to you in the morning to reflect whatever changes we make here this afternoon. Good. Can you email one tonight? Sure, McDermott, we can email one tonight. Yeah, you're welcome. Or early tomorrow morning. Uh, <laughs> we don't want you editing after dinner is the key. Uh, so Ryan and Ben, uh, with that, let's, let's walk through. So Ryan, you walk us through the proposed change. 
uh, and then we can address them as we go. So. All right, so it looks like here the first question came up on the word realistic in 1.2. And there was three suggested edits. Um, the first was anticipated, the second was real world, and then the third came in after for intended operating environments. So currently it reads all realistic operating conditions, and it sounded like uh, all intended operating environments was the agreed upon language, but we'll open that up. So thoughts on all intended operating environments for 1.2? Any objection? So you just, this is Judd, um, you explained, no, Ben explained, that these, that 1.2 and 2.7 are very different things. So maybe they shouldn't use the same language. Um, I really like when Bob brought up real world, I think real okay. world is what we're trying to say. So I would propose that we use real world. So, we, so Judd's proposed change would read, uh, the voting system is designed to function correctly under real world operating conditions. So now the suggestion is real world operating conditions. Does anyone object to that? Starting the word all. And realistic and inserting real world. Correct. Hearing no objection, we will make that change. Next. <laughs> um, all of the easy and easilies um, have been highlighted because we said we were going to table them. Um, so they're highlighted in red, but 1.3 shows the first easily. Voting systems design supports, uh, excuse me, design supports evaluation methods enabling testers to clearly and easily distinguish systems that correctly implement specified properties from those that do not. So the proposed change in this one, but to be reflected in other ones, is to remove easily from here uh, as unclear. Uh, and so it would read, testers to clearly distinguish systems that correctly implement specified properties. So taking out easily in this case and other cases. Any thoughts or objections on that? That was easy. <laughs> terrible. That's terrible. Uh, next, yeah, that's too easy. <laughs> so bad. Go ahead, 2.1. 2.1. Um, Matt, Ryan, yes. just, Matt, just a housekeeping thing for tomorrow. If we are hopeful that eventually this is going to read, uh, result in a motion to adopt and move forward, may I suggest, sir, that we adopt them one at a time today, and then again when we're done done, adopt the writ all. So, so you may suggest that, uh, and I am open to whatever the committee would like to do, uh, my, our thought was that instead of doing that, you are presented with a new full document tomorrow after edits that you have one vote on everything that reflects those changes. But we could go one by one uh, and sort of by consensus agree on each change if, if that is important to the committee. I just don't want to relitigate any of this stuff again tomorrow. You and me both. Uh, does anyone have thoughts on that? No, if we do it today, I'm fine with getting the one document tomorrow. If we go through and we all agree, if we all agree on each thing. Okay. And to the, Greg, to your point, if there are any that need to be quote unquote litigated, so there isn't agreement, someone has a concern and, and just can't, and, and our threshold uh, measurement, and you all will have to decide for yourselves, are, are any of these an item that you won't be able to vote in favor of the, the proposed VVSG unless a change is made? And to the extent there is one of those or two or however many, those are the ones that we can have an actual voice vote on uh, tomorrow if necessary uh, in order to, to, to document that. But to the extent that the rest are just by consensus agreement, uh, we can do that. Okay. Go ahead, Ryan. All right, so under 2.1. The voting system is implemented using trustworthy materials and methods. Um, this is the one that came up from David Wagner about um, the cybersecurity working group. Um, and we pulled the language from um, David's email. And so it, the new proposed language from the email was the voting system and its software are implemented using trustworthy materials and best practices in software development. Comments, objections, or thoughts on that? David, did you have anything or good? 
and that reflects the cybersecurity working group's recommendation on that one. Okay, love it. Next. <coughs> Two point two. We scroll over it so we could see the comment with it. Sorry, yep. that's it's helpful. Um, the voting system is implemented using best practices, user-centered design methods for a wide range of representatives, voters, and poll workers, including those with and without disabilities. Um, Bob had suggested to use the same language that was used in 8.3, whatever that is when we get to it. Um, and McDermott had suggested moving and poll workers um, after uh, including those with and without disabilities so that it would read for a wide range of representative voters, including those with and without disabilities and poll workers. That's the, the latter is the recommended change, I believe. The voting system is implemented using best practice user center design methods for a wide range of representative voters, including those with and without disabilities and poll workers. So it's separate from, yep, I think that's the agreed upon fix. Any, any discussion or uh, disagreement with that? Awesome. Okay. And Bob, I'd like to note for the record, both Cliff has returned and and you got what you wanted out of this. So congratulations. Two and Diane's chair. still here. Yes. And Mr. I got schooled. Mr. Chair, if I may, I was dealing with an elections issue in New Jersey. <laughs> in New Jersey. <laughs> That's because I wasn't there. Yeah. <laughs> Next one, Ryan. One second. No problem. Ryan's making changes as he's walking us through these. Ben, you're done. <laughs> Ben's the first one to happy hour. <laughs> Linda? Uh, the re-attack on 2.7 with um, intended environments, intended operating environments. So there was, a, do you have that one, 2.7? So the, the question from Linda is, uh, the voting system performs reliably in intended operating environments. You'd like the use? Uh, I thought that was somebody that suggested it, I wrote it down. So I thought somebody suggested it because I wrote it down. So I think that was in the discussion between 1.2 and 2.7, having similar language. Um, but that is up for discussion right now. I'm going to minimize it a little bit so you can see both. Um, because here in 1.2, it had r realistic um, operating conditions, and then down here it had intended environments. And to make them similar in nature, um, the discussion was to make both of them intended operating environments. Uh, however, um, as the discussion was that they are two distinctly different things, um, the change was made to 1.2, but it's open for discussion. Yeah, so 1.2 became real world as we just discussed. So the question is, is there a need to either make them match, so 1.2 and 2.7 match, or is anyone interested or feel strongly about adding operating to intended operating environments? Go ahead, Ben. Um, it was suggested that if we added physical environment here, that that would drive home the distinction. So it would be uh, in intended physical environments. Okay, so the new proposal is to say an in intended physical environments. Or anticipated physical environments. Or anticipated physical environments. Discussion? So McDermott's suggestion is the voting system performs reliably in anticipated physical environments. Anyone at plus? Any objection? Okay. Okay, we even got an eye like that. This time you're really done, Ben. Run. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up I think is John Wack. Is John still here? Go ahead, Ryan, while we, we get John. So this one, I mean, this is uh, the removal of uh, of easily first 
So again, to make it uh, more readable and, and understandable, uh, and other aspects of the voting system could be read and understood, period. But so start with the easily first, and then we'll get to the strike through. Does everyone agree to remove easily? Any objection to that? Okay. Hello, John. Uh, so then the next change was a recommended strike through. Uh, so the, as you can see on the screen, it would read, and other aspects of the voting system could be read and understood, period. So we would take out by election officials, testing labs, and independent auditors. And this, I believe, was raised uh, in order to address David Wagner's concern that it should include voters, the general public, whoever else that understand instead of uh, limiting it just to election officials, test lab, and independent auditors. So any thoughts on the strike through? Uh, Mr. Chairman, only if that caveating stuff that's on the first page um, addresses things that the states can kind of do what they need to do, S like security measures in Virginia are not subject to FOIA. So if I put my security measures in something that has to be readable by everybody, that's not going to work. So I, I can't say that an introductory document would, would speak to state FOIA regs. But it certainly would speak to the scope and limit of scope of the VVSG, right? We can't we can't force any state or local election official to disclose anything under their own public records laws, right? They, they're going to follow their own laws. Any other discussion on that? Okay. Next. This is awesome, by the way. I'm, I'm waiting for the. That yes, I'm nervous. I. I I did miss one. Um, we had the uh, discussion of changing the word transparency to transparent. Um, and so that was not highlighted here and I skipped over that. And okay. luck luckily Good. Lori gave me her notes. Mm -hmm. So any objection to changing this to transparent? Okay. Next. The process and transactions, both physical and digital, associated with the voting system are readily available for inspection. So there was a discussion of by whom, for whom, and when and where. Um, and somehow I caught the transparent language there. Um, I do believe, let's see. Well, I don't know that there was a suggested edit, was there? I think the question was just raised probably by me. I was, I was concerned about uh, that, including ballots. Were you, were you satisfied with the discussion or, or is there a proposed change you would like to make? I have no proposed change. Does anyone have a proposed change given the, the discussion around readily? And again, as a reminder, the, the idea is that the system supports, you know, these items being readily available, uh, not whether or not a state or locality has to make them readily available under their laws, just that the system would support that. Any discussion on that? Okay, no change. Another easy. The operation of the voting. <laughs> huh? He will. He's got it. <laughs> the operation of the voting system are easy for the public to understand and verify during pre election setup and post election audits. So it would just read the operations of the voting system uh, are pub. Are, are pub are f well, we got to think about how to write that one. That's what I'm yeah. Are understandable to the Go public. Go ahead, David. Please use the mic. I'm sorry. Dave Wagner. How about the operations of the voting system can be understood and verified by the public during pre-election setup and post-election audits? Any objection to that? Will you read that again, Ryan? Yeah. So I got the operations of the voting system can be understood during pre-election setup and post-election audits. Can However, I didn't hear anything about the verify. Uh, understood by the public. Dave Wagner, I think I said understood and verified by the public. Go ahead, Lori. I like that less. Okay. Uh, I would propose in this case that we keep easy. Okay, so we have one proposal 
uh, with David's language, and Lori would propose that in this case we keep easy, that it, it is a word uh, to keep. And so I guess my question to David is, are, are you comfortable with keeping easy it, it captured? Okay. Is anyone uncomfortable with keeping easy in this case? Go ahead, Neil. I'm not uncomfortable. I actually like the suggestion, but I just would like clarification on the comment made earlier about how do you test easy? Can Easily. You, can you not revise the sentence to start with the public is able to understand and verify the operations of the voting system during pre-election setup and post-election audits? The problem is you're trying to it's rephrase this as a passive so tense. So say that for that Ryan's purposes, can you say that slowly? Uh, the public can understand and verify the operations of the voting system during pre-election setup and post-election audits. Just turn it into a declarative sentence. David's nodding his head. Any John, go ahead. Well, when you say are easy, it's sending a signal um, that this has to be easy. And so I'm, I'm not sure that it comes through if you, if you say, you know, can be understood. I, you know. Is there any term of art that easy, that easy word, or is there a replacement that would be considered a term of art we could use? Well, the sentence above it used readily. So you yes. can say the public can readily understand and verify and I would second that, the, um, or I would go further and say that, you, again, these are the principles and guidelines to keep that in mind, that there will be requirements that are going to get down to the nitty-gritty of how you must meet them. So we have in front of us a proposed rewording that would say the public can understand and verify uh, the operations of the voting system during pre-election setup and post-election audits, there was a suggestion that we could add readily understand. The public can readily understand if that helps clarify. I see some head nodding, some not. Readily is a synonym for easy, so there you go. <laughs> so or we could just say, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to add a comma if I'm Sure. I think just saying can understand implies it's easy, otherwise they would not be able to understand it. I think just it's sufficient. The usability expert has spoke. Mm -hmm. Spoken. Spoken. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's late in the day. <laughs> My mom's an English teacher. <laughs> Mo well, she didn't teach Montessori, but yes, right. Uh, so the suggestion from Sharon is to keep it at the public can understand and verify the operations of the voting system during pre-election setup and post-election audits. Does anyone object to that language? None. Okay, go. Interoperable instead of interoperability. Good. Next. Commercial off-the-shelf devices can be used when their usage meets applicable requirements. Um, Judd had mentioned other VVSG requirements, and that was the only one I had. Yeah, so the idea here was that uh, defining what requirements we were talking about, that, that it was the applicable VVSG requirements to hone in exactly what we're talking about, so you couldn't introduce a piece of COTS that blatantly violates some other uh, requirements within the VVSG. So we would add other VVSG requirements to show that, that the COTS has to be consistent with those. We would say uh, the usage meets a, uh, the, the, go yeah, ahead, the, the term was to strike applicable and put other VVSG requirements, but it could be strike other and just have applicable VVSG, VVSG requirements. requirements. That's what I recommend. You, yep. you, you could also say can be used if their usage meets applicable requirements. Oh, just get rid of usage if they meet. If they meet, yeah, if they meet applicable BBSG requirements. Okay, so John's proposal would be commercial off-the-shelf devices can be used 
if their usage meets applicable VVSG requirements. If they. If they. Okay. If they. Thank you. Ryan, if you get us all the way through, there's a bonus. <laughs> Keep going. So are we good? With, is everyone good with that? They can be used if they meet applicable VVSG requirements. Yes. We have the strike of the extraneous comma uh, under principle six. Good. Uh, yes. Yes. So we have the. Can bold. you pull up the comments so that yeah. we can see it? I'm sorry. I know it's a pain, but it's important. Yep. No, you. Um, we have the bolding of the three words: perceivable, operable, understandable. And there was a question as to why these were in bold and whether or not they needed to be. Um, there was a suggestion to move them to the end of each respective sentence and put them in parentheses um, describing uh, what the sentence is, basically describing what the sentence is stating. So this or, was- Or to just remove them. Or, or to remove them. And, and this was Greg's comment um, in which we don't do this anywhere else in the document. Uh, and the thought was the reason it was done is because these terms are familiar uh, to a specific community that they're important to a specific community and so that desire was to call them out uh, But they don't have to be done this way or there may be another way. So are there any thoughts on uh, Ways to do this or are people Greg specifically are you comfortable with doing this way or do you feel strongly about making this change? Uh, I have no objection. I just had a question <laughs> Diane Okay <clears throat> Is there something intrinsically valuable about um, this, this sentence that elaborates on the principle which says ballots and vote selections are presented in a clear understandable way and instead our ballots and vote selections are perceivable operable understandable and can be marked verified and cast by all voters and that way you've got the words there and you take them out below I hear a lot of yes -ing. I hear a lot of yesing. So the suggestion from Diane is to take the words out of the guideline portion, move them up to the uh, principal section, such that it reads, ballots and vote selections are presented in a perceiv perceivable, operable, and understandable way and can be marked, verified, and cast by all voters. So that language is in there and present, which was important, but it's not called out with the bolding uh, that concerned Greg. Any thoughts or objections to that? All right, a great compromise. Well done, Diane. <laughs> That'll be on your performance review for later. You can't put a price on the improvement of democracy. <laughs> Cannot put a price on that. Okay, next. Already on eight. Principle eight. Yeah. The voting system and voting processes provide a robust, safe, usable, and accessible experience for all users. Um, there was some discussion around what, whether this m truly meant all users, everybody who interfaces with the voting system, or whether it was just strictly for the voters. There was a suggestion to strike out users and change it to voters. Diane? Uh, I think the suggestion is to just put a period after experience. So it would read, the voting system and voting process provo provide a robust, safe, usable, and accessible experience, period. Thoughts, comments, concerns on that? All right, good. Next. And then in 8.1, having said that, wouldn't we change voters now to users? because I would like my election officials and election administrators to also be uh, safe in, from harm. So Greg suggested change as a reflection of the change up above. 
in order to ensure that his uh, workers uh, and otherwise are safe would be the voting systems hardware and accessories protect users instead of voters from harmful conditions. No objection. Go ahead, Mark. Microphone, please. Can you use the mic? I'm sorry. I can go along with, with uh, Diane's proposal, but I just wanted to say that I thought it would sound a little more ex inclusive if you said and accessible experience for all, period. So, so the, the proposal would be to strike users up above. So the voting system and voting processes, uh, processes, whatever, provide a robust, safe, usable, and accessible experience for all, period. Is that, is that accept, acceptable to you, Go ahead, Diane? Bob. Well, I guess my concern is we get back to now, are we including poll workers and election officials when we talk about accessible? Are we, we getting back into that ADA world of making certain aspects of it uh, ADA compliant for somebody who's programming the election? That's my concern once you start putting that all in there. All right. I just guess I thought we were talking about voters. I mean, if we, if we need to call out the voters then uh, or, or not, I just, I just get concerned when we say all or users and where somebody can interpret that a different way. Diane? Yeah, and, and for me the challenge is this, the requirements that will fall underneath this and if you put all in in the stem and accessible is in there, then you're almost forcing the requirements to include these are the accessibility requirements for voters versus a, a different set of accessibility requirements for everybody else who is not a voter because it really is different in terms of setup and behind the scenes and blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I just, just from a structural perspective, I, I don't, those aren't currently in the VVSG, and they, I don't know that they should be. And so that's where the problem comes in. So, I, I mean, it's, it's not a problem theoretically in that STEM. It's just when you put requirements underneath this that I'm afraid it's going to get really complicated. Mark. I don't want to grow up and be like Diane someday, so that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> don't we all? Uh, okay, we're, we're good. Uh, keep it uh, where it's at, ending the experience. Uh, back to Greg's, the voting system's hardware and accessories <coughs> protect users from harmful conditions, not just voters, so that uh, Greg's workers uh, don't get electrocuted. <laughs> okay, approved. So <clears throat> this is similar to the one that we addressed earlier. The voting system is measured with a wide range of representative voters and poll workers, including those with and without disabilities for effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction. Um, there's been a couple suggestions. One was to move um, the poll workers to after um, uh, with and without disabilities, comma, um, as we did earlier. Um, and then there are two um, suggestions to just strike out poll workers. Diane has a has a plan. And I, th and I think we have suggestion door number three, which is um, to remove poll workers from this um, guideline because this is the summative usability testing for the voting system itself for voters, and then there needs to be a separate usability summative usability I don't even know if summative is the right word but uh, yeah a usability guideline just for poll workers yeah so just for poll workers because disability. that usability is different it's about setup it's not about voting per se it's a different yeah so, so, so there's two different guidelines there, there should be an 8.4 added this you take and poll workers out and it reads fine and then there's an 8.4 that needs to be added and there is one in the existing so that we Ma can pull. Mary has language, and we'll give you a second here, Ryan, but the, the suggestion is to pull out any reference to poll workers in 8.3 uh, because this is directed at the summative usability test on behalf of voters. To add an 8.4, which Mary has language for, which we'll, we'll say in just a second when you're ready, uh, that would add uh, a usability requirement, not a summative usability test, but a usability requirement for poll workers. And as it was put to me, that usability requirement's intent is just that given the instructions, the poll worker can set the dang thing up, that, that it's not un, 
unimplementable by the poll worker. Uh, and we have similar requirements currently in the VVSG, so this is not outside the box uh, in any way, shape, or form. So let, let's have Mary read the proposed language, and then we can do that. Go ahead, Mary. You ready, Ryan? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's uh, 8.4, the voting system is, me is measured for usability for poll workers. Again, the intent being you can take the documentation corresponding with the voting system, and the poll worker can set it up and implement it, deploy it. Thoughts, comments, concerns? It's on the, sc uh, so on the screen right here. Uh, the voting system is measured. That makes it harder to yeah. read. <laughs> it's measured for usability yeah, for poll yeah, workers. Yeah, that's for usability for poll workers. The voting system is measured for usability for poll workers. So that would be 8.4 instead of falling under 8.3's summative usability test. Can we take out one of those prepositional phrases? Maybe say and I don't microphone. Really like four and four. How about yeah. the voting system is measured for poll worker usability? Okay. I'd like to ask that we refer to them as election workers instead of poll workers. Okay. Oh my God. She went the entire day without even quasi referencing vote by mail. So we'll give her a, we'll give her it a It was pass. only a quasi reference. <laughs> it's a quasi, but if it was. Would like for me to talk about the merits of vote by mail, I would be happy to do so. Yeah. A, a, a small nuance, and I, I'm not sure if it matters or not, but if you say. Will you turn your microphone on? I'm sorry. There we go. Um, a small nuance. I don't, I'm not sure if it matters or not, uh, but when you parse it that way, it, you're not, you don't mean uh, election workers themselves are usable to use as election workers. Well, that would be quite the test. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that matters or not, but it could be parsed that way. Uh, it's an interesting point. Way to go, Sharon. But was the voting system is measured for, so is, is I think, or tested, why don't we just say what we're going to be doing to it, right? You're, you're testing it. That's what we do. For the usability of election Test. workers? <laughs> no. uh, sorry, for, for. I, I, I might use the word evaluated rather than tested to not like, confuse, confuse it with uh, okay. pistols. You want, okay, evaluated. So the proposed language now is the voting system is evaluated for the usability by election workers. Ironically, it sounds like election workers will be evaluating the usability of the system, which they kind of will in their own way. I think for the, can, can we get rid of the, the yeah. for usability? Yep, the, take the the out. The, the voting system is evaluated for usability by election workers. We put an S at the end. Thank you. Any objection to that? So that would be 8.4, so we're clear. We don't use poll worker anywhere else, but do we? we? We can go back and, and look to see if we use uh, poll worker anywhere else. So we'll check for consistency tonight to make sure we use election worker or election workers. 2.2, .2, Ryan has poll workers in it, and we should change it to election workers, which will be at the end of the sentence now. <laughs> 7.2 as well. Yep. 7.2 as well, Ryan, once you get there. Got it. Take your time. You got yep, it? Yep, I got 7.2 as okay. well. <clears throat> so go back to 8.3, if you don't mind. All right, so we have uh, removed any reference to uh, poll workers or election workers in 8.3 to make clear that the usability test is for voters. And then added in 8.4 that will read, the voting system is, uh, is evaluated for usability by election workers. Any objection or comments on that? Okay, cool.
Yeah, yeah. so we need to jump back up to another one of those uh, grammatical um, errors under um, principle six, voter privacy. We don't go back, Ryan. I know. Uh, we have voters can mark their ballot um, the, and verify and cast their vote selections privately and independently. There was a suggestion to put a comma after ballot and strike and. So it'll read, voters can mark their ballot, verify and cast their vote selections privately and independently. Is that correct? Go ahead, Lori. I think, I think it would read a, appropriately if it's voters can mark their ballot, comma, verify, comma, and cast their vote selections privately and independently. So yeah, we'll fix it in 6-2 as well. I, well. I think that we didn't have a comma after, uh, to, you want verify and cast together because they're, no. Yeah, Voters can mark their ballot, comma, verify, comma, and cast their vote selections privately and independently. So what are they verifying? They're verifying their They're vote marked. selections, right? So verifying cast goes together. The, the idea, well, for what it's worth, I, the idea is still the same. They're, they're verifying their marked ballot or wh whatever, and they're, they're cast uh, their vote selections as part of Do you have okay. any All thoughts right. on that? That's fine. No, it's fine. Not, no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I understand that uh, for those people that want to parse out the difference between the ballot, uh, the everything on the ballot and just the ballot selections. That's what this yeah. is getting to for all of those systems that want to verify just the selected parts of the ballot, not the whole ballot. You see what I'm saying? So that's why there the voters can mark their ballot. That's the whole ballot. Verify and cast their vote selections. It's, it's mod the verify and cast goes with the vote selections, which may not be the entire ballot. It's just the vote selections. Now, I mean, technically, I, I think you could probably eliminate mark their ballot. I mean, because they're marking their selections. I mean, when you're marking, you're selecting your selections. I, I don't know that it's all that critical that you couldn't just say voters can mark, comma, verify, comma, and cast their vote selections. That, the simplicity, I mean, let's, let's get that down and make sure that that doesn't change well, anything in your mind. You're not necessarily marking the vote selections. Well, but voters can mark, verify, and, and cast their ballot That's privately and independently. Works for me too. I'm, I, you know, it's just I know I, I know so, people get all hung up about the whole ballot versus just my my selections. <laughs> okay, whatever. Anyway. That's well, and we don't have to define is. what the ballot is because that's going to depend in, yeah. in a variety. But so voters can mark, verify, and cast their ballots privately and independently, period. Yep. Any objection to that? Good work. Good work. Uh, 6.2. Who says you can't wordsmith on the fly? <laughs> and 6.2 has the same. Yep. Verbiage. We need to make 6.2 consistent as well. And this is sort of unrelated, but we did have some discussion, Sharon and I, and internally with, within NIST about 6.2, and <laughs> I mean, it seems clear to me what independent means, but apparently that's not all that clear to everyone so you know without assistance from others I, you know i yeah o or the expectation that you have magic toes or something which seems to be um anyway long story that you know someone without hands well i just assumed you could you know mark your ballot with your feet well no <laughs> that's not exactly what we mean either so i don't know it's very difficult to come up with 
yeah. enough words to, but that's, yeah, the best we can do. I think it's clear. And when, when you're ready, Ryan, we'll go to uh, 8.3.4 and actually to auditability. Auditable, excuse me, we changed that. <laughs> So the first suggestion is to change auditability to auditable. Any objection to that? Okay. All right, this may be our first longer discussion. Uh, so a concern was raised. Uh, well, go ahead, Ryan, walk through it and then uh, see if I can summarize. <clears throat> An undetected error or fault in the voting system software or hardware cannot cause an undetectable change in election results. Um, McDermott raised, is the first undetected necessary? Um, Diane brought up the initial saying the, about a double negative. It is, you know, uh, having cannot and undetected, undetectable, um, and I was trying to word Smith on the fly um, down at the bottom. So there is a suggestion down there, but that is mine. So the, the concern raised was the uh, double negative nature in this, uh, whether it was necessary or not. Uh, Josh raised, I think, during the discussion uh, that this definition is the definition commonly understood as software independence in all, you know, in the original SI document as well as in the proposed, what, 2007 VBSG, I believe the same language was in there uh, that was passed by the TGTC then. Uh, and so the question is, uh, do we want to touch the software independence uh, definition? And if so, how would we clear it up? So Ryan has proposed language in there that we can either entertain or not that says the voting system software and hardware must be able to detect all errors or faults in the voting system that can change the election results. Uh, I don't, it's up to you all to decide whether that captures the same idea as an undetected error or fault in the voting system software or hardware cannot cause an undetectable change in election results. So David, I, th I think I'll kick to you first uh, to see if you have any thoughts on up changing the definition, not changing the definition and, and thoughts on that. Dave Wagner. Um, yeah, the background is this is taken from a, a, a paper that then uh, analyzes in depth and it's been pretty vetted by the security community, so I think there's a lot of comfort with this language. So the more we get into the larger the changes, then the more concern I would have that I think we would probably want to take it back to that group and have given them a chance to find out if we did something dumb. Um, uh, so it's not something to change lightly. I think the suggestion to remove undetected in the second word, that's fine. So that, that reduces some of the double negativeness. Um, I understand the suggestions to change the later part. I think it's a little tricky to figure out how to do that. If we do that, we end up with something that's more wordy and longer because the, the, the kind of what we're trying to convey here is that, that it might not cause any change in, in the election results and that's okay. Or if it does cause a change in the election results, then that has to be detected. So that's what's trying to get conveyed by this. So if we tried to spell that out, we might end up with something wordier. I'm not, enti I'm not, en I'm not entirely sold on Ryan's proposal. It's not, it's not horrible, but it maybe gets it a little bit of slightly different nuance. Wow, that was really faint praise, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry, Ryan. <laughs> no, I actually agree. Um, it, it, it was, a, it was an amalgamation of what a lot of people were throwing out in. Right. trying to right. basically make it a positive and as greg pointed out by making it a yep. positive it actually may hinder so right. yeah it's a plausible attempt the part that i'm not uh, that i have a little bit of hesitation about is that there's a nuance between do we want to detect the original error or fault or do we want to detect the change in the election results and what we're saying for software independence is it's enough to be able to detect the change in the results we don't, don't need to require that you also pinpoint, oh, it was you know, that line of code or exactly what the source of responsibility was. That's not a requirement to meet the software independence. So it kind of maybe changes the meaning a little and potentially could be viewed as making it 
stronger to the point where maybe it's harder to meet? So I, my inclination would be to leave it alone or if you prefer to remove the word undetected, but I'm more hesitant to change the later parts of the sentence. Diane and then Lori. Did you? Oh, I thought I saw you grab Lori. I think you have gracefully recovered from that, I was just going to use the same thing. I was going to say that wasn't very graceful is what he's saying. That's exactly where I was going. So I don't was worry, my code wasn't very robust. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this I would support this is not it good. As is, and I appreciate the background. Yeah. Uh, okay, so there's a proposal to leave it as is. Any, any objection to that? Can you just clarify this is in 1.0? Or it's no, not in one point. It, it is not in 1.0 or 1.1. It was a part of the uh, 2007 TGDC recommended guidelines that went out for public comment uh, back then, uh, but were never implemented. Portions of them were used to make 1.1, but this was not included as part of that. Um, if we are. If we are planning on keeping it as is, it might make sense to reference the source of the statement in the VVSG to provide a larger context to it. Yeah, so I think that's a good suggestion. I think the perhaps the way to handle it to, to go back is in, in, in creating a um, white paper between the security group and the usability accessibility group just on software independence alone will reference that history, which I think will be important, uh, and then we can refer to that. Uh, I, I just hesitate to add a footnote because we have a footnote nowhere else in this entire document uh, on that. Uh, but I think there's, again, through the education and work that the accessibility usability group and the security working group can do in the requirements development and education, that is part of it uh, to understand that history. And I was going to say almost the opposite. Perhaps, <laughs> just uh -oh. because I, uh, for me at least, there is so much baggage, and I'm I'm just being brutally honest. There is so much bag. I would I would prefer this never be associated with the term software independence because there is so much baggage around that term, and it means so many different things to different people. As I, I would say, if you look at the <laughs> folks sitting in this room, it means very. They already have something in their mind about what is they have to stop doing or they have to start doing because of software independence and yet I don't think we have any unanimity on what that actually means or doesn't mean and that's I, I mean that's my biggest concern I would, I would just like I would like to do exactly the opposite say but we don't mean whatever you think software in, independence is for this we're gonna tell you what it means later but don't use your preconceived ideas so anyway, is, is this where the end to end cryptograph comes in? Like, this is where I'm, I'm getting a little confused when you say an undetected error doesn't change the result. So, if you don't have paper, are, is, are you saying that that is possible? So, I think his question, and tell me if you're wrong, I think Bob's question is understanding uh, that end to end encrypted. Uh, voting systems as proposed or thought about uh, would not contain a paper record but would have a way to uh, detect or to uh, what uh, to detect a change in the election results correct that's exactly right yes and, and to be clear and, and we can perhaps discuss this more uh, tomorrow as part of the conversation uh, the, the reason that this is technologically neutral at least as discussed, and, and Josh and David, please weigh in, and the security working group, is to allow for folks to come up with ways to meet it that, that may include paper, right, uh, or, or may not, uh, but not to lock into one, because that was part of the discussion in the security accessibility discussion, is that this, this is not a, a paper mandate per se, that there may be other ways to, to do this. Is that correct? And that, that's exactly what I was getting at, that this doesn't lock us into paper if technology gets us to a point where we don't need paper to do what, what you're asking. Okay, so the proposal on the table is to not touch this definition as it's, as it's understood, although David is open to removing the first undetected uh, if it's important to folks for clarity. 
Okay, so I'm the rookie. As Neil said, I'm ninth inning, uh, but sort of, is it necessary? I'm looking at 9.2, 9.3, 9.4. It seems like covers a lot of the various things which might encompass 9.1. Do we really even need that language? So, and it's so going to give us, it's going to get us into a big quagmire. So, so the question uh, from Judd, uh, which it is not uh, ninth inning, but it was discussed, uh, what, two meetings ago, the importance to the security working group on why this is important. Uh, and essentially, and David and Josh, I'm trying to summarize the thought, the, having this uh, guideline in there uh, allowed the security working group uh, to move forward uh, what, uh, with more flexibility as they viewed other security requirements, that there would have been a need to add quite a bit more security-wise, that, that software independence brought uh, a robust level of auditing and verifiability uh, necessary to do that, that 9.2, 9.3, 9.4. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. 9.1 is essential, I think. And again, if we want to revisit that tomorrow, we can have that discussion uh, as part of it. So you're talking about getting rid of the first undetected, an undetected error the, or fault? That was a proposal is to say an error or fault in the voting system software or hardware cannot cause an undetectable change in the election results. Yeah, because an undetected error means we never found it. So I'm kind of, yeah, like that is, that, it, that's where I'm. Go ahead, David. Uh, David Wagner, I completely agree. It would be fine to remove the word undetected perfectly fine if anybody would prefer to do that. And any objection or, or thought on that? Okay. So we are deleting the first undetected, so it reads an error or fault, dot, and, dot, dot. Yep, an error or fault in the voting system, software or hardware cannot cause an undetectable change in the election results. Okay. Next. Uh, <clears throat> All right. Wait, hold on one second. So it's 5 o'clock. So we could either finish out this section, uh, and I'm not sure what remains, or we can adjourn uh, and take back up at 9.2 uh, tomorrow. And I'm not sure uh, the level. Go I was ahead. just going to add, the only one left, 9.2 was a, a question that was uh, not fully addressed, which was uh, Neil had asked whether 9.2 was in 1.0 or not. Um, we did a search, and it was not in 1.0 or 1.1. Um, it is a new requirement. But there, there was no change to the language or no suggested change at that time. Do you want a discussion on that? Go ahead. Oh. Well, we could do it. Why don't we pick up on 9.2 tomorrow so that we can, we can look at that. So tomorrow. So, uh, so my only concern of waiting till tomorrow is if we only have a half a day and we get hung up for a while, by the time we get a clean copy back to look at. We and can keep going. I'm, I, I'm, open I'm to that fine too. with keep going. I'd rather finish this tonight so we show up tomorrow with a clean copy in front of us, ready to go, okay. and have a two hour discussion so on does, that so we're ready. Does anyone have objection to continuing through? Besides the audience who doesn't get a vote, <laughs> <laughs> but has the option to leave. Yeah. Uh, can, okay. can, can I first and Josh second? What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have the option to leave either. Mark, go ahead. Well, uh, Matt, Mi I microphone, just, please. Oh, you got it. Yeah, yep. I, I just, um, I have a question. Uh, you're going to shoot me for this uh, regarding 3.3. And I can do it in the morning if you want. Um, Let's, so save it, and we'll come back around to it when we finish the other ones, if that's okay. But we'll come back to 3.3. Thank you. So let's do 9.2, and Neil, if you want to engage that discussion. So the concern that I have with that is that there are instances and there are systems currently on the market today where you can definitely detect that or figure those problems out, but sometimes without the, with, you have to have the help of the vendor or you have to be, have assistance in the extract or how you're going to, to get that data. So my concern is that, again, leaves that open to continuing down that path for manufacturing so, those. So if I'm understanding your concern, what you would like to see uh, reflected in here or reflected in a, require, a corresponding requirement, if not in here, is the clear indication that it cannot be dependent, vendor dependent to be able to get that information, that it just needs to be available. Is that correct? Correct. 
And would that be handled in the interoperability section where, um, no? Well, do we know that? Already passed interoperability. Yeah, you just passed it. I think we already did it. All right, let's read. I was thinking the publicly available format. Um, I don't think that does it. Yeah. Okay. Neil, Neil doesn't think it does. So let's scroll back down. Back up. Uh, so you'd like to see, so let's ask ourselves the, the question. So you would like to make sure it's, it's clear that you as an election official can get the data yourself without needing the, the manufacturer to be able to do this step. Is that correct? Correct. By any user, by the user of the system. I'm at, there, there's words I'm sure that. Yeah, sure. so the, the voting system produces records that provide the ability to check whether the election outcome is correct and to the extent possible identify the root cause of any irregularities. Go ahead, Lori. So election officials have access to those records that provide the ability to check whether blah, blah, blah. So you'd say the voting system Start by in start by saying the election official has access. So starting with who who has access to that information. So the election official has access to records that provide the ability to check whether. Or the election official can produce records through the system that provide the ability to check whether the election outcome is correct and to the extent possible identify the root cause of any irregularities. Linda? Uh, Microphone, like please. Um, I don't like the use of election officials because you now amended poll workers to be election officials, and I don't think we want our poll workers to have access to yeah. this. We, we had election worker, election right? Workers. What Personal. if we use, because um, we talk about in 14.4 an administrator, we use language referring to an administrator. I don't know if that's an election administrator versus a worker or official. I, I'm just saying because we use administrator in 14.4. And there's an easier way to put administrator in. The voting system produces records that provide an administrator the ability to check. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at you. Uh, the voting system produces records that provide the ability for an administrator to check whether the election outcome is correct and to the extent possible identify the root cause of any irregularities. Is that what yeah. you're proposing? I like That, that ties right so into 14.4. Because that says software updates are authorized by an administrator prior to installation. So you can put an administrator before the, provide an administrator the. Oh, so that provide. provide yep. Cool. Yeah. Just put the. Yeah. Otherwise, you're again adding more proposition. And that's the audibility. David has a comment to that. What? No. Go ahead, David. I'm thinking aloud. I wonder if we might consider a, a door two, which is instead of trying to say for an administrator, instead insert a clause without vendor assistance. So in other words, maybe it's after is correct uh, without vendor assistance. Okay, so the voting. I think that was the essence of what you're getting at. So the proposal from David, uh, Ryan, will you move the box out of the way just a little bit? The proposal from David, uh, instead of adding an administrator the ability to, uh, is to add uh, without vendor assistance. Where did you say? I'm sorry. Well, put it after records, just as a we could discuss where. Produces records without vendor assistance. Okay, so. Provide the ability to. Yep. The voting system produces records without vendor assistance that provide the ability to. I would probably put it after to check. Okay. Or after is correct. I, I don't know how others feel. So the voting system produces records that provide the ability to check 
without vendor assistance whether the election outcome is correct. Well, then it's, it's modifying the checking, uh. not the records. You know? <laughs> what you want it, the system to produce the records without vendor assistance, not check the you know, results or, yeah. What have we said? Uh, without vendor assistance, the voting system produces records. What have you said? I mean, not not we. Um, speaking as a guy who's going to have to actually build this, <laughs> um, I, I can see providing those records, but there are certain places where state statutes prevent their use. So is that is that a problem? I would leave that question open to others, but th I think the idea is uh, states and locals would still follow their own statutes, but where someone like Neil Kelly would like to be able to get out those, get at those records and it's allowable, uh, he, he is able to do so without vendor assistance. But I guess my concern is how far do you have to take that? Because sometimes you have to look at the back end and, and you, you have to dig way deeper than any of us could possibly do. And I don't think you could generate a report necessarily to find that stuff. So I'm not quite sure now that we're getting deeper into it, what specifically you want it to do. Well, that's a very open-ended question, right? And it's a valid yeah. question. But I mean, there's certain circumstances today in the audit world that I've dealt with where it's been difficult to pull, I think, basic reports. And I don't want to get into the very specifics of that mm -hmm. here, but um, I think that like in the other areas where we've made it a little bit broad, can, can we do that without getting down into the specifics uh, and, and have a broad statement? I think that covers it if you're saying that, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if it's just, I guess, basic auditing type stuff, yeah. Then yeah, I, I, that, yeah. yeah, which is why I, under the auditability, part of it gotcha. gotcha yeah yeah keep in mind we're talking about uh, audible uh, the auditable section yeah. right? We're, right we're not talking about everything and I mean again even though it's not clear in the interoperability section there are system logging uh, data formats now being developed and whatnot that will help support this very notion uh, so that someone like Neil can parse his own logs and and do the kind of uh, auditing that he's looking to do Oh, that's in the current 1.1 where you need to provide analytics against that. Um, I guess the, the point I would make is that hopefully you have the tools already in your system that allows you to detect an irregularity, but there will be situations where the root cause will require vendor assistance. No, I, I recognize that, and, so. and I'm, I'm not trying to get down into those weeds, um, and, and plus I don't want to call out anything very specific here with respect to this. I'm just trying to give something with the very generic language where we don't hit the basic roadblocks. And that's that's what I'm concerned about. And I don't know if this helps or is even worse, but you could fall back on your readily available that's words. The voting system produces readily available records. So that that is similar, my recollection, to what is in the VBSG currently as far as the, the need to have readily available logs or, or whatever else and, and actually came up uh, because at least one older voting system prints on a dot matrix printer the logs and it's hundreds and hundreds of pages um, so that that is another option so let's first entertain this option then we can we can try that one if there's not so right now it would read without manufacturer assistance the voting system produces records that provide the ability to check whether the election outcome is correct and to the extent possible identify the root cause of any irregularities Mr. Chairman, uh, Greg Riddlemulder, I'm having some uh, problems with this uh, from the idea that um, there are localities and indeed states that do almost everything they do through vendor support. And to call out this one point out of all of the 15 and all of the sub bullets to say without vendor support um, is interesting to me and a little bit unnecessary because it's almost uh, smacks of saying that you must buy the management support software that comes with your manufacturer's proprietary equipment. I don't want to buy the election management so, software that comes with my vendor's proprietary equipment. If I find myself in this kind of environment, yes, I want the machines to make those records and have the log files and all of those kind of things, but I want the 
vendor assistance, if you will, to do some of the reports and other things like that. So what reports were in the management package mm -hmm. that I was forced to buy versus what reports were in the management package that is only available at the vendor level, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I, I'm totally opposed to adding vendor uh, at this level. What you're doing is calling out an exclusion for yourself then as well. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to say that it should be one way or the other. I'm just trying to have something that is in, in the middle. And if, if we take out the manufacturer of the vendor piece, um, I want the ability to be able to pull that out as an election official on my own. Do, do we go back to administrator then? Instead of, instead of so calling out vendor, just say an administrator will have the ability. Sure. So, so two things quickly. One is we have a hard stop at 530 uh, because of closed captioning services. Okay. Uh, and so let's keep that in mind, which doesn't mean we need to rush through, but let's keep that in mind, 15 minutes. Uh, and two, uh, perhaps the way to solve that so you're not calling out any one individual, because to Neil's point, uh, it's not a requirement that you not use the vendor. You could certainly choose to use the vendor if you wanted to, uh, but you could choose not to, is just to make them readily available. And whether you choose to use the vendor or not, they're readily available to you. Is that is that something that this group would entertain. So we're not calling out a specific group of people, but instead just saying the voting system produces readily available records that provide. And, and that's similar to language that exists now in the BBSG. Any objection, Neil? No, I'm good. Good. So not to go back to 10 minutes ago, but I, but I think the voting system produces records that provide the administrator the ability to check blah, blah, blah. Gets you exactly where Greg wants to go and where Neil wants to go. Okay, so Judd's proposal is the voting system produces records that provide the administrator the ability. Any objection to, to that? Is there a preference, one being readily available, one being the administrator? We can make it both. Well, I'd like, uh, because if you don't put administrator, they could say it's available, but you have to get it through me. Oh, okay, so this would read, yeah. uh, the voting system produces readily available records that provide the administrator the ability to check. So we're doing both. Any objection to that? No. Okay, Ryan, does it, you got that, pal? <laughs> readily available records. Records that provide the administrator yep, the, ability the ability to check or an, or an administrator if there's multiple. All right, let me. David has his. Yep, David. David Wagner. I feel like I'm being problematic here, so no. I, uh, you are welcome to, to tell me to set this aside. No. Um, there's a little there's a little bit of hesitancy that I want to air and uh, uh, may may not be valid, um, which is by adding for the administrator, it adds an implication that it's only for the administrator, which could then lead to systems that prevent you from. We one of the goals is we would like to enable y the election administrators to hold a public audit, to convince people the election result was correct. And so by adding the foreign administrator, it, I'm wondering if it could lead to a situation where the voting system, we're not highlighting that we want the voting system to be able to support that. That the voting system might only allow an administrator, but, but it's not something that anyone else could observe that you could show to anyone else. I, I think the point was that you don't have to go to the vendor to say, hey, can you generate these reports for me? I want to, as an administrator, I want to do it so if I want to have a, a public meeting or a public hearing on it, I can do it without, without relying on a vendor. I think that's where this is coming from. Right. I understand the yeah. goal. And, yeah. and the, the goal yeah. is not a problem. It's the unintended consequences of the language might end up meaning that the records now have information in them that can only be, sh that can't be shared with the public. It doesn't <laughs> highlight that. Uh, I mean, I, I, it just gives a different emphasis that now suggests that it's only for the administrator's consumption, and so therefore it might limit your ability to then take that and, and go. Well, I, I guess right now it's still, it's, it, I guess to Neil's point, I don't want to speak for him, but it, it, 
it only exists now if you ask a vendor for it. So this at least a, a gets it to the level of the administrator. Um, so I'm not sure that we have to say it's for election workers. I don't know that we – I would want to give those rights out below an administrator level. And I'm not, Is that what you're getting at? I'm not quite sure. Uh, David Wagner, what I'm getting at is that I think that part of the purpose of auditability is transparency to enable not only you as an election officials to know that the election results were correct, but to be able to convince the public of that fact. And so the for administrators maybe tilts the seesaw a little bit towards only the end point of allowing election officials to verify without allowing any kind of transparency or for the public could lead to records that can't be consumed by the public because Maybe they have uh, information that would violate b b ballot secrecy or something like that. It, it's maybe a nuance. This yeah. shift in emphasis. So yeah. let me let me see if I can um, offer it at least a different way. But I, I I think your suggestion is valid. But what what this allows or would allow is to empower the election official to support that level of transparency that you're looking for that currently isn't as supportable as it should be. And so uh, there isn't a scenario in which, I don't think, but may, please tell me if I'm wrong, in which you would want the voting system to produce these records without an administrator deciding to produce them. So you like just pumping them out, right? And so the idea here is it's empowering the administrator to produce this evidence-based elections to show the public what's there instead of having to rely on a third party uh, to do so. And so I, I see what you're saying, and I'm trying to think of a way to capture what you're saying, because I understand by putting administrator, it seems like it's limiting, but it, what it's actually doing is empowering the kind of thing that you'd like to see, as opposed to uh, what, what may or may not go on now. Does that make sense? Mr. Tatum. But I think, I think whether, I can't determine whether he's asking if the, the data that's being displayed is proprietary so so he's asking about the data that's being displayed versus the function are you asking about the functionality of the system uh, David Wagner um, I wasn't actually asking I was more um, saying that this change while accomplishing one good thing may have an unintended side effect of, of, of maybe losing something having having a downside to it Diane yeah. so I I'm going back now to the statement as it reads, and I think what I'm hearing David Wagner say is that perhaps the interpretation of the original statement is the voting system produces publicly available records but that provide the ability to check whether blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm not saying, but I'm just saying with it not specifying any of that, I think what he's saying is there may be some people who were assuming that and we're going in a completely different direction. I mean, when you read it, the voting system produces records. It doesn't say for whom or how. So on one end, that could be records that are publicly posted. Um, on the other end, it could be records that you can only get to with a special run by the vendor. So. I think that's where all of this confusion is coming from because it just says it produces records, not for who or how or when or why. So, and I think the reason for that, right, wrong, or indifferent, again, not arguing one way or the other, is because that's largely dependent on state laws and otherwise whether or not that data is or is not public. And so the VBSG cannot dictate what is or isn't publicly available because that is going to depend largely on state laws. But the idea is to the extent it's allowable under those laws, an administrator should have the ability to get that data and share it with the public if, if that's uh, what's allowed. But David, I, don't, I, w I want to not put the focus on the administrator because I hear your point as well that you don't want to exclude the public uh, from, from that data if it's allowed to be made available. So, so David, you and I are actually on the exact same page. And give me a way to do that without being locked out in any way, shape, or form. That's what I'm asking. And and if there's a way to make that language different, I'm all for it. So, can I suggest we go back and look at the original way that well, one of the original ways in which we phrase that by keeping it readily available, taking out administrator. I think by making it readily available gets you to where you want to go, and ultimately could get um, more publicly available 
audit information available as well. So the suggestion on the table is to uh, remove the administrator part that we had proposed before and simply read, uh, the voting system produces readily available records that provide the ability to check whether and removes the administrator function. It, one, are people okay with that? And David, does that address your concern by not identifying specifically who those records would be for? Yes, it absolutely addresses my concern. Does it address your concern, Neil? I, I think so, because I think the language readily helps to provide a different set of documents that we might not have access to today, or records, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. And it's broad enough, like everything else in this document, that it can be interpreted in different ways. Right. <laughs> so, so as currently written, uh, it would read, the voting system produces readily available records that provide the ability to check whether the election outcome is correct and to the extent possible identify the root cause of any irregularities. Okay. Next, and I'll say we got a reprieve from the 530 number, but that doesn't mean we should take till eight. Uh, so the, the more efficiently, but I mean, the discussion's important. Uh, that one was, was very important, so. Next one, Ryan. The voting system supports efficient audits. Um, the suggestion from uh, McDermott was to change the word efficient to usable. So it would read the voting system supports usable audits instead of efficient. Thoughts or objections? Um, I, I feel that that's more than a wordsmithing change. That's a substantive change about what this is actually saying. Um, and this is an interesting principle that so I, maybe this is a longer discussion if we need to um, leave at 5.30. Maybe it would make sense to go through the other things where we can make progress. Um, I think that the working group was, for, with Efficient, they were in, envisioning that the audit process, they're talking about cost that, or time. That, that, the, that in other words, that it's not a, an incredible burden to construct the audit. So rather than what I would normally think of as like usability, like good usability practices, per se, of course, cost or time could be considered an element of usability. But. So I don't know whether you want to have a discussion so, on this now or you want to move on to the other ones. That well, let's, let's give it a run and we'll see how strong the, the objection is. But I think what I hear you saying is within the, the working group, and, and both Josh and David weigh in, there was a discussion around supporting essentially more efficient auditing, risk limiting audits, other techniques, that the system could help support those. Is that correct? And that's a different than usable. Certainly. So, McDermott, I don't know if you want to respond to that as you're the one that raised it. Um, I don't have an objection of it as long as we can come up with a method by which we can measure. test and measure efficiency. Yeah. And that's ultimately my Josh. concern. I mean, yeah, uh, audits that can be performed in a you know, timely manner, I don't know, something like that. What if uh, we went to something like various types of audits? Too loose. Uh, David Wagner, I think that gets at something different. Um, um, uh, I and I and I agree with McDermott. It's it's we do need a way to, to measure. measure that. Yeah. So um, and this is one of the challenges of doing this without the requirements in front of you. Um, so I think that that's something that has to, that, to the extent that's backed up by requirements, they have to be measurable. It's just not negotiable. They have to be measurable. Yeah, my thought on that, just thinking, is as the, the requirements are written, there's a certain understanding uh, about what efficient audits would look like, per se. So an inefficient audit would involve pulling every single ballot in the entire jurisdiction one by one, right? That would be pretty inefficient versus finding statistical ways to pull certain numbers of ballots. That's just an example of, of a way to conduct it. So I think that can be handled in the requirements development process as you look at uh, efficient auditing practices that, quite frankly, some are still in development and you don't want to box out newer ones that may come about. I mean, we may reach a level of efficiency with auditing where, where only a handful have to have to be viewed or, or pulled. I, I, I think, you know, an, an important point here is, is it's not the audit itself, but being able to produce the data that's going to be used in, in the audit. That's a good point, to support the audit. I mean, if you wanted a modifier, McDermott, to help 
rein in where the requirements would go. You could, in theory, don't type this yet because I'm off the top of my head. Who knows where it'll go? Uh, the voting system supports efficient and something to the effect of and time and cost audits or something like that to, to capture what we mean by efficiency, to narrow in what we mean by efficiency. I don't know that that brings anything to the table. Uh, we've never measured cost as part of the VVSG. That would be an interesting new one uh, and kind of ugly, but yeah. Oh, or just time. time because time, time. you can kind yeah. of say, all right, if it's 30 hours times X number of dollars, you can figure that out later. If it's so you could say the voting system supports time efficient audits. David or Josh, do you have thoughts, concerns about that? That just sounds weird to my yeah. ear. Uh, That's fair enough. The, uh, the uh, you know, voting system supports efficient audits that can be performed in a timely, timely manner. manner. That's great. Okay. So, just so it would read, ear. the voting system supports efficient audits that can be performed in, performed a, timely in a timely manner. So it doesn't so we can support re remove inefficient audits <laughs> yeah. that are yeah. slow and cumbersome. <laughs> what was the proposal? Sorry. I was being flipped. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone's noticed, by the way, but being a federal building, the uh, air conditioner goes off at 5 o'clock. So we're also, <laughs> this is quickly becoming some sort of torture. Uh, <laughs> That, that is being conducted. It but us to agree. Yeah. <laughs> this was not a technique by me. This was Are not. We let's eat, just uh, rem fried cheese and yeah. next. Yeah, let's just remove the word e e efficient. So it's the voting system supports uh, audits that can be performed in a timely manner. It's, I'm in a jacket here, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. So it would read: the voting system supports audits that can be performed in a timely manner. David, does that? I, I want to make sure we capture what, what the working group was attempting to do. Yes, that sounds good. As it, but it's really the case that efficient, isn't efficient code word for risk limiting audit? Not, not necessarily. It's not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want to... I. I don't think so, no. I, I think there are various types of audits, including risk limiting audits that this envisioned, but I don't think it, I mean, you all were part of the larger discussions, so please speak in. I don't think it envisioned just one auditing type. I do not. Is that correct? I, I would agree with that. That's how I would, that's how I would interpret it, what I think would be reasonable. Um, I can't tell you that all members of the security community sure. feel that way. There are some members of the working group who would like to see a requirement that says that has to be risk limiting, but I view efficient as, um, yeah, in a timely manner. For instance, an example of inefficient would be a complete recount. So I, I don't read it. I, I read it as a, your system has to produce the data necessary for somebody to do a risk limiting audit. It doesn't foreclose doing other kinds of audits because that those other kinds of audits largely don't need data to complete. So that's why the uh, that's why its current language with efficient was fine with me, but Lori, whatever. I'm good with the efficient language and the time saving language. I would hate to call out risk limiting audits specifically because I don't want to limit any future <coughs> capability that hasn't been um, discovered yet, no and I think that can be addressed in the. Um, I'm losing it. It's late in the requirements um, as we get into that development I mean my only my only concern with the word efficient was again how do I measure it yeah so how do I test it what is a pass fail on efficient right um, David David Wagner maybe I can make one comment on that maybe I can make a comment that will make us feel comfortable with efficient be great we do need to get to testable requirements yeah. but the premise behind these high-level principles and guidelines is that they were not necessarily testable. Mm -hmm. So I agree we need to get there, and that'll have to happen when we get to the requirements, yeah. but maybe we're comfortable with the efficient language right now because the testable comes so, when we write Yeah, it. so what I would propose is we, we keep efficient, uh, and we revisit it tomorrow as part of our review, uh, and if you want to muse on 
uh, your concerns and others' concerns. Uh, I don't know. There's an elegance in the word efficient, I think, that, that allows for it, but I understand your concern about testable. I don't know if it's graceful. No. The word graceful and me are never used in the same sentence, so I don't know. All right, next. And thank you for opening the doors in the back. The voting system protects the secrecy of voters' ballot selections. Um, the suggestion was to change to anonymity instead of secrecy. So the voting system protects the anonymity of voters' ballot selections. Thoughts, comments, concerns? I think you can leave the overarching uh, and then change 10.1 and actually use uh, McDermott's word there if I could speak for him. So Greg's proposal is to leave the higher level uh, principle, go down to the guideline and say ballot anonymity is maintained throughout the voting process, to so to change 10.1. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, excuse me. So it would be, so it would be voter anonymity is maintained throughout the voting process. McDermott. Okay. Yes. And you can remove the comment on secrecy above as well. I don't believe we've ever gone to overtime at the TGDC, so kudos to you. Oh, this was the discussion about adding produce and contain, um, but that was tabled for uh, public comment, was my understanding. So the, the comment, uh, and Josh and David may be able to, the comment was made uh, after these were sent to you all, uh, that the, the uh, security working group some at least some portion of the security working group made a comment uh, that and please open it again yeah over here. Uh, that to to update 10.2 to read the voting system does not produce and contain records notifications information uh, that was a comment by some at least right in the in the security working group indeed uh, that can be made now if if there's no objection or we can uh save it is the right word contain or retain the voting system does not produce nor retain notifications is that correct was it contain ahead, or produce there. uh the the language that was discussed at the working group meeting and that was proposed was does not contain or produce records contain or produce so the voting system does not contain contain or produce records notifications information okay the voting system does not contain nor produce records thoughts on that and the implications of that um, just going back there the, as we talked about there are exceptions to this so McDermott raised during the conversation, thanks McDermott, uh, and I think this was raised at least as part of the cybersecurity working group discussion that there are state laws and regulations uh, that are impacted by this, this may conflict. And so uh, the question is to add this now, uh, knowing that or to explore that. Go ahead, Ryan. And uh, not just state laws, but uh, provisional ballot, um, the implementation in systems currently today um, in order to be able to identify whether or not a voter who had voted a provisional ballot, whether or not to submit that ballot on past the casting into tabulation, um, you have to be able to tie that to a voter through a third party system or through a, a, another process in order to release um, that ballot into tabulation. And so one of the discussions that I know that was taking place um, and has not made it back to the cybersecurity working group yet, but uh, was uh, being discussed amongst some members, um, including myself, was if it is going to have the contain nor produce would be after tabulation, because at no point do you pull it back after it has been tabulated versus when it is sitting in storage before after being cast. Go ahead, David. <coughs> 
I can provide some background about what I think was the concern or what this is getting at. Um, one of the things that we're doing with this new standard is trying to ensure that we can support um, requirements for some new kinds of voting, including, for instance, um, online, online ballot, ballot marking and voting systems and remote voting systems that we anticipate might come up in the future. And with those, there's a concern that you might start to see a situation where, if we're not careful, we might have a voting system that, that's recording on the server the identity of each voter and their selections stored in some file there for all the voters. And now that would be a concern that you've got a big database that if it got hacked, like might reveal how everyone voted. And we probably don't want to leave that laying around because that's a pretty high risk thing to have laying around. And so that's why this container produce was to make clearer that it's not just like producing, not just what the reports are at the end, but that we don't want to have that sitting around there as a risk factor. So that's the concern that it's trying to get at, and I understand the points you're raising as, as valid as well. Could you put some kind of language that it supports that method? Be, then that would, to McDermott's, where you have states that don't want that. So is there some language that would say that it has to have that ability, but it's not a requirement because you may have to build it both ways, is what you're saying? Uh, yeah, you well, just a question for the group. When, when there are, are states and or systems that do that, and to me the word in this sentence that's appropriate here is associate. Are there any states that actually associate the transaction with the voter's intent? Yes. So we know how he voted and then we pull that vote out of the hopper because he wasn't allowed to vote. And we know specifically it was that voter. Yes, because of both what Ryan raised with provisional voting and then David raised a, a sort of unintended consequence if a system is not designed uh, or is designed in a way that the, the selections are stored on a server unintentionally or, or otherwise uh, that, that you may be able to associate it back specifically with ballot marking. Mr. Chairman, ballot Greg Riddlemoser, so having asked the question that should not have been asked, um, it makes 10.1 uh, non sequitur and ought to be dropped entirely from this discussion, or, regardless of how we've worded it or reworded it. Uh, so it's a fair point. Uh, I think 10.1 still applies depending on as when you view the, the ballot secrecy, which is why 10.2 uh, was written. At the, the other thing um, to notate, at least systems currently do not directly do that association that it was that you were talking about. It does not have the voter's name in it. It is rather an ID that would then be ID'd in a separate process, such as your poll book um, or somewhere else. And so there is no direct association. So, so if, you, if you think about it outside of a voting system context, at least with provisional ballots, if, if a voter votes provisionally and puts it in the envelope, you have that ballot sitting in the envelope, but you're also able to associate that full packet of information back to that voter because if they are not what allowed, you know, if the provisional isn't approved, right, you, you can, you know, get rid of it. But for that time being, that ballot is still sitting within that provisional envelope until such time as it's allowed, then they're separated and disassociated, right? And so there's a system process that allows for that too outside of an, an envelope and paper process. And that's, that's the concern is that there are some systems that, that need to or some states that need the support to, to be able to do that. And there are certain situations where the retraction occurs after tabulation. There are certain areas where a retraction is allowed after a tabulate because of something that has come up in certain states, such as death before election day if they voted early. Per state law. Per state law. Gotcha. That is something. Wow. <laughs> uh, let's come back to that one. <laughs> if we have one hanging out there, we'll, we'll come, we can revisit that one specifically tomorrow. Oh, this was just a typographical error. Perfect. That's a good one. <laughs> so just to make just to make sure the, it should state the voting system or 
other hardware has the ability to detect any unauthorized physical access. The word okay. or is missing. Good. Next. Hmm? So I'm getting an and back here. The and I think Bob's comment earlier was that we should add the word um, access to a sealed voting system or associated hardware because prior to its sealing, in other words, that would that that's what well, would imply the need the, to be able yeah, to the seal it. The idea is to support the sealing or or whatever else, not that the system itself does the sealing itself, right? So please read the sentence as you as you think it microphone. Um, it needs to be or any unauthorized physical access to the voting system or other hardware unless you mean if it's an and then it has to be both of them at the same time. At the same time, and if if that's what you mean, okay. then it's an and. But if you don't mean if you're saying there's hardware other than the voting system, then it's an or. So. I, I don't know who wrote whose this is, but yeah, so if, it's, if it's not an or, then it just should be the voting system and get rid of the rest of it. But if you're saying there's hardware that's not part of the voting system that you also want secured, then it's an or. So it would read any authorized, unauthorized physical access to the voting system or other hardware leaves physical evidence. And that's what I was bringing up. Are we saying that the system has to do it, or because now you're bringing in seals? Like, so are, are we saying we're going to test the system that it shows that it it can it can demonstrate some type of an attempt, or we're we just saying it must have the ability to? Because the way it reads here is the system itself, when they present it to you, has to show. Okay, we can show how it's been tampered. So but that may be a third party you, after. Your kind of your suggestion thing. would be that. Uh, Well, what is your suggestion? You, you'd like to see that the system itself supports or allows for uh, the proper physical protection. Yeah, support something like that. Because otherwise, you're, you're, uh, I'm reading it as you're, te you're actually testing those seals. So it must support a system. Or I'm not quite sure. I'll let Diane right. pick out the words. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I. I'd like to not include other hardware unless it's part of the voting system. I don't think the VVSG should go there. Okay, let's start with that one and then we'll think through Bob. So the suggestion from Lori is to remove the other hardware. So any unauthorized physical access to the voting system leaves physical evidence. We'll deal with Bob's in just a second, but removing other hardware because it would take it outside the realm of the VVSG. Is there any objection to that? What will be an ex an example of, of hardware uh, that we'd want to protect would be the question to ask, I guess. Uh, so if we, so by removing it, what, what are we leaving out? Yeah. That would be outside of the voting system, but still important to include in the VBSG. Yeah. I'm not sure. Is there any? That is up to the state to determine. Yeah. As far as the VBSG is concerned, I think it should be left to the voting system. I have no issue. Okay. So back to Bob. So now we read, any unauthorized physical access to the voting system leaves physical evidence, and we need to capture the idea that the system itself supports the application of some sort of protocols that allow for physical evidence to be left. How about the voting system uh, supports? Um, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, you have something. Okay, cool. So actually, as it was written earlier from Bob's suggestion earlier, um, was any unauthorized physical access to the voting system has the ability to detect, <clears throat> excuse me, any unauthorized physical access? Mm, nope. I think it's the, yeah. Yeah, we need to start with the voting system. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. The voting system has the ability to detect any unauthorized physical access. No. Yeah, I like the word supporting. Uh, yeah. The voting system uh, supports so, tampered de detection mechanisms or 
So what about members. this? The voting system supports uh, mechanisms to detect any authorized physical access, and then those mechanisms are up to the jurisdictions. To detect unauthorized, so take out and well, any can stay. So now it would read: the voting system supports mechanisms to to, to detect unauthorized physical access. Thoughts? David is contemplating. Feel free. Go ahead. It's fine with me. I think it's going to come down to the requirements. Um, the the I, I'll, I'll spell out the nuance, but then I think we can move on, which is. I don't think we need the voting system to proactively detect. The idea is just that it leaves behind some physical evidence that then if the election workers are looking at it, they could, they could detect. So it's not like we're not trying to go so far as to say the voting system is responsible for detecting. Right. Um, if, if you're all comfortable with the language you proposed, I'm, I'm fine. But I think you're also not locking out any future capability that might allow for a technology. Right now, we're relying a lot on physical security, but there could be additional securities in the future. OK, fair Maybe. enough. Maybe. So it's all in the, okay. I see your point, David. I, I think it's all in how we view mechanisms, right, which could be outside seals or, or whatnot, or if there is some technology uh, provided in that way. Can we start the uh, sentence with mechanisms? Mechanisms to detect unauthorized physical access. Finish it off. Go ahead, say it. I have mechanisms to detect unauthorized physical access. Or me how about mechanisms exist to detect unauthorized? Well, but that no. that's not a way to test the voting system, right? The key is that the, the voting system is going to support the ability to use whatever physical security techniques that the jurisdictions want to use. So, I mean, in a really absurd because it's almost six o'clock example, if you if you built the voting system out of Teflon such that the seals won't adhere or whatnot, that is un that is unacceptable. Which it would be fascinating because then you can get an omelet bar out of your voting system, <laughs> which I'm for. <laughs> All right, Ryan, next. Yeah. Uh, 12.2, Mr. Chairman, Greg Riddle Moser. Um, can we put a period after voting operations and drop testing and auditing? And here's why um, ports, accessible ports, I know that there needs to be uh, different kinds of uh, accesses inside the equipment for uh, testing or auditing or what have you, but they ought to be integral inside of the administrative control measures, for lack of a better word. So the accessible ports ought to be limited to election day operations only, is my point. And I'll yield that to David, because they c clearly talked about it. So the uh, question uh, for Josh and David is, uh, Greg's question is, the voting system only exposes physical ports and access points that are essential, essential to the voting operations, period. And his suggestion is the testing or auditing, that, that essentially you shouldn't be exposing the ports for testing or auditing. Yeah, just uh, off the top of my head, there was a VVSG requirement that you know basically needed a uh, a uh, a port exposed purely for uh, external software ver verification, um, and so that would remove that if we wanted to keep that cap that capability within the VVSG. Um, so there's an already existing VVSG requirement that recognizes the need for a port for some sort of third party auditing is that what you're saying there is a vvsg requirement that says that i'm not sure if the security working group found a lot of benefits from you know uh mandating that honestly so i don't know if it would be the biggest thing if we removed that there there ha there are other requirements that require the, f the system to be functioning in a non uh, I guess non-production way. Uh, the fact that we have to, for example, have a reciprocate mode in order to move ballots around when it's going through emissions or through radiation testing. That's not necessarily, you, we're never gonna have a real world example of a not, not a something other than a person putting the ballot in. 
Uh, another example is where we have to verify that the counters are zeroed out other than having the report that says, hey, they're zero. Um, that's another requirement that we have to test to that requires us to move the system out of a normal production mode. And I guess the question is, should we be writing requirements that would require us to move the system out of production as to it is intended to be used? So I guess the question on the table is, does, to McDermott's point, does anyone object to removing testing or auditing with a recognition that um, we're referring to securing, the, that we're only exposing those ports necessary in, in the voting process or in the voting operation and not testing for those other, you know, for what, uh, securing it during uh, uh, lab testing. Is that your point? Uh, the, the point is that we actually kind of have to unsecure it for lab testing and then put right. it back in for production mode um, as it will be used. So the, the question is, should, we, should there, there even be the capability to expose those ports? Is that not a security risk that those ports can be exposed? Besides the ones necessary or essential to voting operations? Exactly. So you'd be in favor of striking this? Uh, as long as we, as long as we can provide uh, alternates for the, uh, or those requirements are no longer in place, to. Well, I mean, to the point of with with Greg, um, what about like pre-election testing and post-election testing? So you're in basically a voting mode, but you're in in pre-lat versus official election mode. So. There may be trap doors inside of the vendor's equipment where you open them with keys as an administrator and do various things for acceptance testing when you first bought it from the factory, LNA testing prior to setting it and locking it uh, for the election with the election media loaded. And then once you've locked all of these compartments, the only peripheral ports that ought to be available directly support something to do with the um, election day operations. That's all I'm saying because it's all these empty ports that people are talking about all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you use that for? What do you use that for? What do you use that for? Now, that's, they're not asking those questions, but those are the kind of, you know, things that we could preclude by simplifying this uh, point. Any objection to it? Okay. Take it out. How many more do we have? We, I can't in good conscience ask the, the camera folks and other folks to stay past six. So how many more do we have? We have <clears throat> three, um, but they look uh, simple. Th they look simple. OK, go. Uh, <laughs> you have five minutes. <laughs> Judd asked if well vetted was a term of art. There was no suggested change, just a question. Yes, uh, next question. <laughs> <laughs> This one was just asked to put a comma after the word ports. Done. Next. I don't know. No, I'm joking. <laughs> not funny. <laughs> now is not the time, my friend. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Ryan. Diane just suggested that remediate was not the correct word here. So the voting system provides mechanisms to detect and remediate anomalous or malicious behavior. And the concern was remediate has an expectation of some sort of uh, act, action or fix uh, immediately where the real point, at least of this principle, is that uh, detect and monitor or, or whatnot, I don't know. <laughs> detect and respond to? Yeah. Well, detect somebody and suggested respond to, take action, address. Right. So let's start with respond to and see if we can get there in three minutes or less. The voting system provides mechanisms to detect and respond to anomalous or malicious behavior. Thoughts on that? And please speak up. And we don't want to, I mean, I yeah. know we got time, but it's important. Does anyone have thoughts on that? I do. Okay, I think go. you could say the voting system provides mechanisms to detect anomalous or malicious behavior so that they may be remediated by election officials. I like just re, re I like the first thing. So that they may be remediated. Uh, no, no. Sorry, just, yeah, just, just the, stop the voting after system. Behavior. 
the voting system provides mechanisms to detect anomalous or malicious behavior. Any objection to that? I see a head nodding. Boom. Okay, Diane. And realistically, that's all the voting system can do. Yeah. I mean, that's all it can do is detect it and let you know. It can't tell you anything you about what to do as a result. So you want to detect and report? Detect or The, the question was, the voting system provides mechanism to detect and indicate or detect and report. Is there any desire to have that? So that it's not just detecting, but it's telling somebody. Well, the, mechanism. the mechanism, you don't need to define it. Okay, yeah, yeah good point that underneath in the, in the guideline section, so you got the principle up above, in the guideline section it lays out what that means. Okay, so we're gonna remove, remediate, and be on our way, okay. Thank you. Thank you for your commitment, for sweating it out in here. I really, really want to thank the staff, the AC staff, the NIST staff, in particular, uh, those folks running the camera. You all have been standing for a very long day. Uh, we will provide to you either tonight or early tomorrow morning a revised copy that reflects these changes that we'll walk through. To my memory, uh, the one major thing to continue to discuss is 10.2. Uh, and what to do with that. Uh, but other than that, we can walk through the changes uh, and see where we're at. So look for a copy. We'll also have physical copies available for everyone and uh, the audience tomorrow. Uh, and until then, we're adjourned till 9 a.m. tomorrow. Adjourned till 9 a.m. tomorrow. I do want to thank, just very quickly, Robin Sargent uh, and Shirley Hines. They have done Woo! yeoman's work. Sarge and Shirley set up the whole room. Uh, did all the work to get us here, uh, and you have no idea how much time and effort they put in, so we greatly appreciate it. All right, adjourn until 9 tomorrow. Awesome. No water, yeah. So it happens, he kept us hydrated.